Chapter 14 I hated all the time Liam and I had wasted apart. The last few months had been the hardest of my life. But in this moment, I realized that we'd needed that time apart to come to this point. Both of us needed to grow, and we did so on our own. Now it was time to grow together. A week ago, I wasn't sure I wanted him back. Now I knew it was the right decision. Nothing had felt as right as it did in this moment, like this was where we were meant to be. Being here with Liam was like returning home after a long, hard journey. He gave me the comfort and stability I needed in this world where nothing was predictable. I felt safe in his arms, like he would protect me from whatever came our way, no matter the cost. I knew that come hell or high water, he would take care of me, and I him. Liam held me tighter as I gently traced the muscles in his arms and torso. I didn't know how long we lay like that. All I knew was that I never wanted this to end. Eventually, it did end, but it must have been at least an hour later. I'd nodded off and woke to Liam stirring beside me. I opened my eyes, feeling refreshed. What is it? I asked as we sat up. His gaze locked on my breasts, but I didn't care. He could look at me all he wanted. I heard someone downstairs. Probably Ezra. We should get dressed. Liam stood, then dug in his dresser for clean clothes. Think your brother heard? I asked as I pulled my pants on. Does it matter? He asked with a smirk. No, I guess not, I admitted. Liam noticed the missing buttons on my shirt and gave me a clean one to wear. It was way too big on me, but it smelled like him. He was never getting it back. After we both were fully dressed, Liam sat beside me on the bed. He gazed into my eyes with such warmth that I felt it spread through me. I ran my hands through the tangles in my hair and blushed under his gaze. What? Liam smiled. You just look radiant. I giggled. Well, yeah, what do you expect after that? He chuckled, and I leaned forward to press my lips to his. Ancestors, I missed the taste of his lips. I love you, Liam, I said as I drew away and took his hands in mine. He rested his forehead against mine and spoke softly. I love you too, Pawi. Kyra Quignity, I blurted. He pulled away and shot me a confused look. It means... Blazing fire spirit, Liam finished for me. I nodded. My spirit name. Liam looked as if his heart was full. It's beautiful. I ran my hand across his cheek just to feel his skin on mine. I thought you should know, now that we're official again. Liam beamed so wide that I snickered at him. What? I asked innocently. He shrugged, still beaming. I just like the sound of it. Official. Sophia Henley's my girlfriend. Liam wiggled his shoulders in a happy dance, and I could hardly contain my heart. He was shining, which made me glow too. I kissed him, and it turned into a full-on makeout session again. I was ready to strip my clothes off again for another go, but Liam pulled away. It took several moments for me to catch my breath. So, when are we going to tell everyone? Whenever you want, Pawi, he said. Monday at school, I answered automatically. I loved him so much, and I wanted everyone else to know. I expected some resistance, but all he said was, Fair enough. I was speechless. Liam Maito really had changed, and I loved him now more than ever. Ezra knew Liam and I had sex. He totally knew. But worse than that, Essis had heard everything. The little perv had been sitting outside Liam's door the whole time eavesdropping. He'd even finished off a bag of microwave popcorn and had butter all over his paws. I had to give him a bath when we returned back to the dorms that night, after spending the day on the beach with Liam. Saturday morning, Essis and I took another Perryton to Liam's house. 
his mom answered and looked delighted to see me. She gave me a hug, then waved me upstairs to Liam's room. Liam was still asleep. The curtains over the balcony doors were closed, and he was nothing more than a lump on the bed. I set Essis at my feet and signaled for him to be quiet. He eyed me curiously as I tiptoed over to Liam's bed and crawled under the sheets beside him. Liam moaned and rolled over. I lightly placed my lips to his, and his eyes shot open. Sophia, what are you- Shh. I placed an index finger to his lips. No questions. Just enjoy it. Liam's eyes closed again, and he wrapped his arms around me, relaxing into my kiss. Is this a dream? He mumbled against me. I chuckled. It's real, I promise. Liam's eyes opened again, and he drew away to look me in the eyes. Then maybe we should stop. My mom's home. I kissed him again and whispered, then we'll just have to find someplace private to finish this. Liam groaned. Can't. I'm on house arrest. Not anymore, I said with a grin. I just talked to your mom. You're mine for the day. He furrowed his brow. As long as you don't leave my sight, she says we can hang out. Go anywhere, I told him. And you know I won't be able to keep my eyes off you. Liam immediately perked up. He rolled out of bed and pulled on jeans and a red t-shirt. He pulled open the curtains to let the sunlight in. You look good today. I lay propped up on one elbow, my eyes roaming his backside. He inhaled a breath of ocean air. I feel good. He took my hand and pulled me to my feet. He wrapped an arm around my waist and pulled me close. Another kiss brushed across my lips. From our feet, Essis jumped and cheered, punching his little fists into the air. He looked happier than I'd ever seen him. I laughed and scooped him into my arms. I know, buddy, you've been rooting for us. You can relax now. Liam and I started for the door. So where are we going? He asked. Back to school, I said. Dance studio. Dancing? Sophia, I- Not us, I said with a laugh. I agreed to meet Jonah and Imogen there this morning. They wanted to show me something. They'll be happy to see you. I miss them, Liam said as we descended the stairs. Have fun, his mom called from the kitchen. We will, I told her. She had no idea how much fun we were going to have. Liam glanced around when we stepped outside. Where's your periton? I kept walking down the beach. One-way ticket. I explained. I thought maybe we could take another way back. Liam caught my meaning the closer we got to the motorboat parked beside the dock next to the house. Ezra went boating this morning, didn't he? Yep. I turned to him and jingled the keys in my hand. I caught him just as he was done. He left us the keys. Liam beamed. How much time do we have before we have to meet Imogen and Jonah? I smirked. Enough. Liam couldn't get on the boat fast enough. It wasn't very big, maybe 20 feet long, with an open top, a couple of leather seats, and a cooler. He sat behind the wheel and had me undo the rope from the dock while he started up the motor. Essis stood at the front, spreading his arms out wide like he was on Titanic. I shot Liam a nervous glance. He's going to go flying into the water. Liam chuckled as we pulled away from the dock. He'll be fine. I won't let him fall off. Essis looked pleased as the wind whipped through his fur. It was cool out here on the water, but I pulled my sweatshirt tighter around me and brought fire to the surface of my skin. The chill left me. I couldn't take my eyes off Liam as he steered the boat out into the middle of the water. His eyes kept flickering over to mine. His features were so soft, and there was a permanent smile on his lips. I'd never seen him look so happy. Liam stopped the boat when we were far enough from shore that no one could see us. This time of day, no one else was out on the water. He cut the engine, and the waves bobbed us up and down. Essis stared over the edge of the boat at the rising sun glittering off the water, totally ignoring us as he watched the fish that swam below the surface with interest. Liam and I didn't have to say anything. It was like we were in tune now. 
to each other's bodies and minds. We connected like magnets. He pulled me onto his lap and we began stripping each other's clothes off. Liam kissed me with so much passion that I thought my heart might beat its way out of my chest. I leaned against Liam in an embrace for a long time, but eventually I climbed off him and started dressing again. I caught Essis looking at us with wide eyes while I was putting my bra back on. Who, Essis? I scolded. A little privacy? Essis quickly turned around and stared back out over the ocean. Liam and I shared a laugh as he started up the boat again. It didn't take long to get back to the docks on the mainland, and it was only a short walk back to the school from there. When we reached the dance studio on the third floor of the castle, Jonah and Imogen were already there. Imogen was fiddling with the music speakers, sassy at her feet. Jonah stood in a blue leotard next to a wall of floor-to-ceiling mirrors. He held onto a railing that wrapped around the room and had one ankle propped up on it, stretching. Squeaks was trying to lift her back leg up to copy him, but she lost her footing and fell on her face. Liam strolled into the room laughing at Squeaks. Imogen squealed when she saw him, and Jonah was so excited his ankle got stuck on the beam and he fell over beside his familiar. The door fell shut behind us. Liam! Imogen squeaked as she ran over to us and threw her arms around his middle. Sassy yipped and jumped up and down at his feet. Essis jumped out of my hands to join Sassy on the ground. I'm so sorry. I never meant it when I said I hated you. I love you. I'm so glad you're okay. Liam laughed and hugged her back. We're good, Em. You okay, bro? Aw, oh, hell. Jonah sat up and rubbed his face. Think I broke a marvelous cheekbone. How's it look? You look beautiful as always, Liam joked. Jonah got to his feet, then froze. Beautiful? Me? Who are you and what did you do with Liam? Liam baby's right here, he teased gesturing up and down his body as he stepped further into the room. I placed my hand over my mouth as I tried not to laugh. The new Liam was seriously impressing me. I loved seeing him so happy. Jonah made a show of inspecting him. He sniffed him, then poked at his face. I'll be damned, it is you. Imogen stood beside me and lowered her voice. Did something happen? Liam seems... Renewed, I finished for her. Yeah, he is. So am I. Imogen inhaled a sharp breath. You guys? I couldn't hide my smile. I nodded eagerly. Imogen swatted me so hard it kind of hurt. Shut up! I won't, I said. Lucky, Imogen said. Cade still won't get in my pants. Loser, I joked. What's his problem? Imogen rolled her eyes. Something stupid about my brother. Ew, I cried. No, not like that, Imogen said. Like, he wants to ask my brother's permission to be with me first or something. But like, I guess he doesn't get that he can't do that. He'll come around, I assured her. Imogen quickly changed the subject. So you guys really did it? You realize I was talking about sex, right? Who's talking about sex? Jonah strolled up to us and didn't mind butting into the middle of the conversation. Squeaks had finally rose to her feet and walked beside him. I blushed bright red and glanced to Liam. He didn't seem bothered at all by the topic. He was probably bursting to tell someone. Typical guy. Um, me and Liam, I admitted. Jonah's jaw dropped so far it was comical. He glanced between Liam and me like he was putting on a theater performance. I'd never seen such a dramatic show of surprise in my life. You and Liam. Liam and you. You guys did it? Liam walked over to me and placed an arm around my shoulder, looking pleased with himself. I couldn't say I blamed him. I felt on top of the world. Liam leaned over to Jonah and whispered, Twice. Jonah squealed, and our three familiars joined in the cheering beside him. O-M-G. I can't believe it. We have to celebrate. Ancestors, Jonah, Imogen complained. They just had sex. It's not like they're getting married. She whirled toward us. Wait, are you? 
No, God, I said, blushing harder than I thought possible. Someday, sure, but not now. I looked to Liam to make sure that was the right answer. He gave me an encouraging nod. A wedding, Jonah cried. He reached for Imogen's tulle skirt and held up the red fabric to my waist. Tulle? No, we'll have to work on it. But you know you can't wear white now. He winked at me. I swatted his hand away and he dropped Imogen's skirt. Shut up or you're not invited. Yeah, Imogen sneered, placing her hands on her hips. And who says you get to design the dress? Slow down, Liam stepped between all of us. No one's designing a dress. Sophia and I just got back together. Yeah, but it won't be long until she starts showing, Jonah joked. I wasn't even mad. I found myself laughing along with him. Imogen quickly came to my defense, but it was all in good fun. Sophia's not pregnant, asshole. Okay, everyone calm down, I quickly said. What did you guys want to show us? We've been working on choreography for our dance routine for class, Jonah said. But we need some feedback before we present it. You know we're probably just going to laugh at you, right? Liam teased. You would never, Jonah teased. Now, sit down and watch the magic happen. Liam and I sat on one end of the room with the familiars, while Jonah and Imogen set up their props and music. Ten bucks says Jonah falls on his face, I whispered. Liam stuck his hand out to me. Deal. I hope you win. I shook his hand, feeling the electricity between us. Okay, lovebirds, Imogen said. Pay attention. The song started, and Imogen and Jonah began to dance. It was a soft, slow melody. It started with Jonah performing a graceful dance across the floor. Imogen came leaping onto the scene and the two moved in harmony as they depicted a scene where Imogen beat Jonah. The music increased in intensity until he was lying on the ground. Imogen twirled and ripped the top layer of her skirt off herself. The red fabric dropped away to reveal a purple skirt beneath. Imogen danced by Jonah's unmoving form, then continued on her way. I suddenly realized what they were depicting. The legend, I whispered under my breath. What? Liam asked. I shook my head. I was too mesmerized by their dance to look away. I'll tell you later. Their dance continued, and Imogen ripped off another layer of skirt until she was in a green one. The two moved in sync again as they depicted Lida Leve Navaris nursing the Toaqua man to health. Imogen performed beautiful twirls and leaps as Jonah went off stage for a moment. He came back wearing a golden cloak with beads all over it. The ancestors. Jonah danced around Imogen, depicting the blessing. The music became very happy and upbeat as Imogen did another solo dance. Jonah returned wearing a red cloak. The music shifted to an angry dogfight as they acted out a grueling fight between Lida Leve Navaris and the Coigny man. The music shifted again until it was almost inaudible. It grew again to a soft, beautiful melody as Jonah went off stage and Imogen was left alone. Jonah used his air magic to make leaves swirl around Imogen as she controlled her body in a way that made her look like a marionette. She rose to her feet gracefully, the leaves still swirling around her. Her hands reached above her head and she stood in a beautiful pose. From somewhere within her skirt, vines grew upward and wrapped around her hands, growing leaves right in front of our eyes. The leaves Jonah was controlling slowed, then fell to the ground softly as the music faded to nothing. I was left speechless. It took me a few seconds to absorb how beautiful and creative the dance was before I rose to my feet and gave the two of them a standing ovation. Liam joined me, as did our familiars. Imogen blushed and curtsied then gestured to Jonah as he bowed. You guys, I cried. That was awesome. It's the Earth legend. I know, right? Imogen bounced on the balls of her feet. We came up with it after we talked about the prophecy. So you liked it? Loved it, I told her. At the same time, Liam said, The prophecy? We think we found the Navita part, Jonah told him. 
Liam glanced between all three of us. Why didn't anyone mention it to me? Imogen bit her lip. We haven't seen you since we figured it out. Liam relaxed. Okay, so what is it? We sat on the floor in the dance studio and told Liam all about the legend, the prophecy wording, and what we thought it meant. I agree, he said thoughtfully. We need to get Navita on our side. It's going to be hard. Coigny has the most power, so they might be more inclined to side with them to save their own house. Right, I agreed. But how do we convince them? I'm working on that, Imogen said. You are? I asked in surprise. She hadn't told me what she'd been up to. Imogen held her head up high. I'm the Navita in this group. This piece of the prophecy is my responsibility, which is why I've decided to meet with the Navita elders myself. Liam and I spent Sunday together on the beach, but Monday came far too soon. I woke up late and skipped a shower, then tossed on a pair of old jeans, a sweatshirt with a hole in the sleeve, and my high-top hiking shoes. I was excited to finally be getting out of the classroom for elementi explorations. We'd spent most of the semester learning about archaeology techniques. Though some of it was hands-on in the classroom, most of it came from our textbook. Bain often told stories of his travels while he worked for the Hawkeye, exploring the world for magical creatures and enchanted artifacts. I'd had no idea there was a whole career based on exploring magical history, myths, and legends. I could totally see Imogen doing it for a living. I hiked my backpack up on my shoulder, and Essis climbed on for a ride. When we got to the classroom, Bain was speaking to a girl up front. He'd given up his usual button-down shirt and slacks for a pair of cargo pants and a long sleeve sweater. The rest of the class sat in their chairs, waiting for everyone else to arrive. Miss Swanson, I'm sorry, but I can't let you go on our spelunking expedition dressed like that, Bain said. The girl was Coigny, a year ahead of me. She was wearing a plaid skirt and high heels with a white button-down top. A large raven sat on her shoulder, and she crossed her arms. What do you mean I can't go like this? Bain pressed his fingers to his eyes, like he couldn't deal with the stupidity today. You do know we're going into a cave, right? She huffed. I don't see why I can't look good anyway. A group of Navita guys up front laughed at her. Bane sighed in exasperation. We'll be crawling through narrow tunnels on our hands and knees. When she didn't respond, he added, In the mud. Yuck! No way am I crawling through the mud, she sneered. Then why did you sign up for this class? He sounded more curious than anything. She shrugged. Someone told me it was an easy A. Not if you can't crawl through the mud, Bane pointed out. If you don't come to the caves with us, you'll fail today's assignment. She rolled her eyes. Whatever, then I'll fail. I'll make it up on the final. She whirled around and stomped out of the room, nearly slamming into Vanessa who'd just rounded the corner. My face fell when I saw her. She looked a little pale, and Aisha wasn't by her side. Are you okay? I asked immediately, rushing to her side. She waved a hand like it was nothing. Morning sickness. Where's Aisha? I glanced out into the hallway, but I didn't see her following nearby. She's back home with Bren. Bane said she was too big to fit in the caves. Are you sure you're well enough to do this? I asked, though I already noticed color returning to her face. Are you kidding? She asked. This is my favorite class. I'm not missing this lesson. Essis held a little paw up and gave her a high five. He seemed excited too. Okay, Bane's voice called from the front of the room. He stepped forward with a big white box in his hands. The class quieted and all eyes turned toward him. It looks like everyone's here. We don't have a lot of time, so let's make the trip to and from the caves as smooth as possible. Everyone follow me. Bane led us outside to a bus-like carriage. It was pulled by two ox-looking creatures that were the size of elephants. Their fur glinted bright blue in the sunlight, and their horns shimmered a metallic silver. Everyone in, Bane said, ushering the class inside the long carriage. 
Our class wasn't very big, about 15 students, but we filled every seat. Vanessa and I took a seat beside each other, and Essis settled in on my lap. Mia sat with her familiar in the back and didn't even look my way. We hadn't talked since she'd insisted her and Liam weren't a thing weeks ago. I knew now I'd been wrong about them being together, but something seemed up with Mia. She usually didn't shut up during class, but this time she stared out the window and kept to herself. Bane gave a signal to the oxen once everyone was seated, and the bus carriage began moving. Bane stood at the front of the carriage in the center of the aisle. He reached into his box and began handing out headlamps. Safety inside the caves is vital. There's a large network of caves all throughout Kinpago, and we don't need anyone to get lost. Bane handed Vanessa and I our headlamps, then reached back into his box and gave a mini headlamp to Essis. Essis smiled and placed it on his head backward, looking proud of himself. I chuckled and readjusted it for him. You're all adults, Bane said as he finished handing out the headlamps. I trust that you'll all stay with the group and won't go wandering off on your own. Can we all agree to that? A collective murmur traveled around the carriage. Good. Now, a few things before we enter the caves, Bane said. Some of the things you see down there will tempt you, but you are not to touch them without my explicit permission. We do not want to disrupt this habitat. An Avita girl in the front seat raised her hand. Yes, Sandy? Bane asked. What kind of things are we going to see? She asked. Bane smirked. If I told you, that would ruin the surprise. We stopped along the road beside a trail marker several minutes later. Bane led us about a hundred yards into the woods, then stopped beside a small cave mouth cut into the earth. The cave opening was nearly flat, so it was almost impossible to see until you were right on top of it. It was only big enough for two people to fit inside at a time. The interesting thing about this particular section of the caves is that it was only discovered a decade ago, Bane explained once we were all gathered around. Essis was already trying to scurry out of my arms and into the cave. I held on to him tightly. Calm down, buddy. There are still undiscovered and unexplored sections of the Kinpago Caves, Bane said. As you will see today, we have very good reason to continue exploring these caves and opening new passageways to see what we find. Sandy shot her hand into the air. Yes? Bane asked. Is that safe? She asked timidly. I mean, what if we uncover creatures that intend to hurt us? Bane raised an eyebrow. What if we uncover those that intend to help us? The forest went silent. Then Bane turned on his heel and said, Everyone follow me. Watch your footing. One by one, we crawled into the cave with our familiars beside us. It seemed bigger when we got up close. I clicked on mine and S's headlamps then lowered myself into the cave, feet first. The cave wall was sloped at an easy angle, so all I had to do was watch my head when I ducked inside the cave. Essis went way ahead of me, scurrying down the rocks before I was even halfway to the bottom. Vanessa came after me, and I offered my hand over the last few rocks to help her stay steady on her feet. The cave opened up wide enough for the whole class to stand comfortably at the bottom. Three tunnels broke off from the main cavern, one crawl space to our right, and an even smaller opening above our heads, then a wide tunnel straight in front of us. This way, Bane said, guiding us down the widest tunnel. It sloped downward, looking like it never ended. I scooped Essis up and followed at the back of the group beside Vanessa. What do you think the surprise is? Vanessa gazed deep into the cave in front of us, looking excited. She leaned over to me and said lowly, Legend says there's an underground river somewhere in these caves. My eyebrows shot up. Really? Is it magical? If it were ordinary, would it be legend? She laughed lightly. The story says that during the last Hawkeye War, a group of Anichi hid down here for months before they were discovered by the Coigny hunting them. Legend has it the ancestors blessed the waters that ran through this cave to nourish any elementi who drank from the river. That's how they survived so long. Wow. Do you think the legend's true? I asked. Vanessa shrugged. Don't know. No one's ever found the river. 
If they have, they haven't told anyone else about it. Mud squished at my feet. Clearly water gets into the cave somehow, I pointed out. Yeah, from the rain, Vanessa said. The river is different. It comes from high up in the mountains and goes through the cave and out into the ocean. Bane stopped ahead of us and the class slowed. The walls had narrowed around us and the ceiling was just a few feet above my head. Before we venture into the next section of the caves, I'd like everyone to turn their headlamps off and just listen. I clicked off mine and Essa's lamps. After several moments, everyone else's lamps went off, and we were enveloped in darkness. I don't hear anything, Mia whispered toward the front. Shh, Bane instructed. Listen closer. Everyone quieted. I paid close attention to the sounds around me, but all I could hear was Vanessa's breathing beside me. Slowly, I began to detect a second sound. I wasn't sure if it was in my head or not until someone said, Are those wings? Bane clicked on his headlamp. Precisely. Shall we go see what those wings belong to? We followed behind Bane, single file, into a narrow tunnel that we had to crawl through. I kept my head low and went on my hands and knees, though the guy in front of me was so big that he had to army crawl on his belly. Essis stayed at my side, though he looked impatient. The tunnel opened up to a huge cavern, half the size of a football field and at least 20 feet high. Tunnels broke off in all different directions. Headlamps scanned the room, but the cavern didn't need it. All along the walls and most of the floor were bright, sparkling crystals, giving off their own luminous glow. They looked electric, fading in and out in mesmerizing shades of blue, purple, and pink. Above us, creatures that could fit in the palm of my hand flew around the cavern. At first, I thought they were bats, but they were completely different. They looked like tiny dragons, with scales that shimmered all colors of the rainbow. But they had insect wings, like dragonflies, that were at least six inches in length. The light from the crystals shimmered through their thin wings and illuminated the ceiling, creating a dancing lights display above our heads. My jaw dropped, and everyone else went silent in awe. Vanessa inhaled a breath of amazement. What are they? she whispered beside me. I don't know, I said. Essis batted at the air like he wanted to play with them. Bane reached his hand into the air, and one of the creatures gently landed in his outstretched palm. They're called Dracovern, or cave dragons. Oh, my friend is bonded to one of these, Sandy exclaimed. Bane petted the Dracovern's tiny head as the class gathered around to hear him teach about them. Yes, they're actually quite common familiars. They're drawn to Navita Elementi and are said to be some of the best emotionally supportive companions. But until this cave was discovered, the bonds they formed were strained. Strained how? a Tawakwa girl asked. Dracovern are cave-dwelling creatures for one reason and one reason only, Bane said, as another Dracovern landed on his shoulder. The unique Draco crystals around you give off an energy signature that calm the Dracovern. Without the crystals, they become very irritable. It was once believed that this was in their nature, but the Elementi who bonded with them didn't understand why this was, as it didn't make for a good companion. A Dracovern landed on Essis' head. He relaxed and began purring. I stroked the Dracovern's scales and found them soft and warm. It took my breath away to be in the presence of such beautiful creatures. Bane continued. At times, Dracovern familiars would wander off and come back with a completely different temperament. No one knew why. It's believed they'd come down to this cave to be rejuvenated with the crystal's energy. Vanessa raised her hand. So if they could run off and get rejuvenated whenever they wanted, why was this discovery so critical? For two reasons, Mrs. Emberley. Bane held up a finger. One, it taught us about these familiars and allowed us to understand their nature. No longer was their irritability a mystery because we were able to treat them. 
to, we've been able to mine a small portion of these crystals specifically for the elementi who bonded with a dracovern. If their elementi carries a piece of draco crystal with them, their familiars remain their good-natured selves. It's like a medication for them? Vanessa asked. Bane thought about it a moment. In a way, this is why elementi explorations is such an important field. The more we know about the world we live in, the better we can serve the creatures who live here. Vanessa held her hand out, and a dracovern with a shimmering purple belly landed in her hand. She giggled and touched its outstretched wings. I want to keep one. Aisha would get jealous, I teased. We have one more cavern to visit before we return to the school, Bane said. If you'll all follow me, we'll meet the bats whose venom can be used in a potion that eliminates the Hectra parasite from bovine familiar intestines. The class followed Bane single file into a narrow tunnel. The dracovern on S's head seemed to have taken a liking to him and was hanging tightly to his fur. I laughed. Let him go, little guy. We're falling behind. Don't hurt him. Vanessa gently helped me pry the dracovern from S's fur, but by the time we got them apart, the rest of the class had already disappeared into the tunnel. Let's go. I cut off as S's ears perked up. He jumped out of my arms and raced toward a tunnel to our left. Essis, I cried. That's not the right way. He didn't listen. Essis scurried down the wide tunnel and I rushed after him. Vanessa hurried closely behind me. I could see Essis' light bobbing up and down along the cave walls in front of me, but he ran so fast that I could hardly keep up. Ancestors, when did he get so fast? I cursed under my breath and called his name again. My voice echoed off the cave walls. Essis chittered back at me like he thought he was hilarious. Essis, I called firmly. No use. He continued down the tunnel, then turned right when the tunnel came to a fork. This tunnel was even muddier than the last, and it was rocky. I ended up using my hands to stay steady on the rocks. I couldn't see Essis' light in front of me anymore. Vanessa was panting by the time we reached another wide cavern filled with boulders and tunnels splitting off in various directions. I didn't know how far we were away from the rest of the group, but it seemed like a mile. I glanced around frantically, but I saw no sign of Essis or his light. Shit! Where did he go? My heart was hammering, and I was beyond worried. It was like losing him all over again. Essis! We can't risk getting lost down here! Shh! Vanessa held a finger to her lips. I held my breath, and suddenly, I heard it. Essis' tiny claws scratched on the cave floor behind a large rock formation. I turned my headlamp off and took a cautious step forward so he couldn't hear me. Then I leaped. Essis squealed when he saw me, but I got a hold of his tail before he could get out of my reach. I curled up beside the rock formation and hugged him tight to my chest. Bad, Essis, I scolded. You can't keep running off like that. I can't lose you. Essis pushed at my arm like I was squeezing him too tightly, but I wasn't going to let go. It's this or you're going in my bag, I threatened. Essis gave up, but he crossed his arms like he wasn't pleased. Vanessa looked down at us with concern written all over her face as I turned my headlight back on. We should get back. Everyone's probably wondering where we went. Agreed. I got to my feet. You think we can find our way back, right? I'm not sure, she started but she cut off and her whole body froze. My head snapped in the direction of her gaze. I noticed a shadow crossing our lights at the other side of the cavern. The figure went still and looked at us. For a second, I was filled with hope. If it was one of our classmates, it meant we weren't far from the bat caves and didn't have to backtrack our way to meet up with the group. But I quickly realized I'd never seen the guy before. He was a few years older than me, with a strong build and blonde hair. His eyes looked familiar, though I was sure I'd never seen him before. I just barely caught the outline of a gray fox with huge ears like Essis standing at his feet, before the guy quickly turned away and disappeared into another tunnel. What the? Hey, 
Hey, I called, starting toward him. What was some rando doing down here in the caves? Was he here to vandalize things? Or could he help us get back to our group? Sophia! Vanessa reached out and grabbed my shoulder before I could make it far. What are you doing? I don't know, I admitted. I'm suspicious. Which is exactly why we shouldn't chase a stranger into caves we're unfamiliar with, she argued. That was creepy. Let's go before he follows us. I hesitated. There was something about the guy, about the mystery, that told me I had to follow. We can get back from here, Vanessa said. But if we go any further, we could get lost. You heard, Bane. These caves go all over Kinpago. It could take days before we find a way out. She made a good point. I gave in. Okay, let's go back. We turned around, but I couldn't shake the irresistible curiosity pulling me back to that cavern. Vanessa and I returned to the crystal cavern just as our group was passing through from the bat cave. Vanessa and I slipped behind them seamlessly, as if we'd never disappeared in the first place. My heart pounded, waiting for someone to yell at us for wandering off, but no one did. We reached the carriage and returned to the castle. My heart finally started to slow. I thought we were off the hook, until Vanessa and I were climbing out of the carriage and placed our headlamps in Bane's box. How did you enjoy the field trip? Bane asked. It was cool, I said. I'm glad we went. Yes, indeed, he replied casually. Next time, try to stay with the group. I've never lost a student before, and I don't intend to lose either of you. My jaw dropped, so he had noticed. Sorry, I stuttered. My familiar ran off. Bane nodded once. See to it that it doesn't happen again. Vanessa took my elbow. She'll make sure to have a leash next time. I snickered at her. It's true, I have one. Essis grunted. He wasn't a fan. You should maybe consider that leash, Vanessa said as we started back toward the castle. Essis could have been lost running off like that. Yeah, I said dryly. The thing was, I was starting to wonder if Essis didn't just run off for kicks. Maybe he was trying to lead me somewhere. Or to someone. I was on my way to lunch later that day when Madame Doya stopped me in the hall. Naomi prowled at her side. Essis shot the lioness a glare. Sophia, Doya called. I turned to find her and was surprised to find that blazing heat that often surfaced when she was around wasn't there. Maybe it had something to do with her pleasant expression. I found it a little strange for a second, but it seemed genuine, so I relaxed. Yeah, I said. Doya strolled up to me. She wore one of her usual velvet dresses and had her red hair piled into a bun at the top of her head. She carried with her a stack of folders. I heard you went through with your naming ceremony, she said. It was almost impossible to read her tone. I held my head up high. I did. How did you know? Your grandparents told me, she said. I'd almost forgotten they were close to her. They seemed so different. I suddenly felt a sting of betrayal. Was it normal to talk about other people's naming ceremonies? And to their professors, no less. She noticed the fallen look on my face. They didn't tell me your name, if that's what you're wondering. The right to tell someone that remains solely with you. I relaxed a little, but I didn't know what to say to her. She wasn't insulting me, so I didn't know how to take her. Um... The reason I mention it is because I wanted to tell you. Doya paused, like she was struggling with her words. It almost looked like she was choking on them. I'm proud of you. Now I was the one choking. Was Doya serious, or was this some sort of a joke? Doya took a deep breath, like saying all this out loud was too hard for her. Elementi often find strength in their spirit name. You've proven yourself to be capable without one. I'm intrigued to see how your magic performs now that you have your spirit name. 
I blinked a few times, waiting for the punchline, but there wasn't one. Doya was being genuine for once. So weird. Um, thank you, I said. I'm excited to see what happens too. When Doya didn't say anything else, I turned back toward the cafeteria. She hesitated, then stopped me again. Sophia. Here it comes. You have what it takes to be the chosen one, she said. But her tone came without feeling. The magic, the power, the courage. Her gaze flickered down to my hands, and I instantly knew she'd seen what I'd done to pass the assignment with Haley. If she knew, why did she pass us? Had I, dare I say it, impressed Madame Doya? Thank you, I said honestly. It means a lot to me. Yes, it should. Doya offered the slightest of smiles, then turned and strolled off in the opposite direction. I stood there speechless as I watched her leave. What? What just happened, buddy? Essis looked up to me and shrugged his shoulders. Sophia! Imogen called behind me. I turned to see her waving me toward the cafeteria. She was wearing a purple polka-dotted dress today, with her hair in a side ponytail that had beads hanging from it. Sassy swished her tail at Imogen's feet. Cade and Arabelle stood next to her, along with Jonah, Squeaks, and Liam. My heart warmed at the sight of Liam. All the things we'd done that past weekend flashed through my mind. Maybe we could sneak away this afternoon. What's happening? Imogen asked when we got close to them. You look shocked. Yeah, I said. Doya was just being nice to me. Jonah scoffed. She would never. Must be a clone. I laughed. It would explain a lot. Shall we? Liam said, turning toward the cafeteria. We all started toward the doors, but I nearly lost my footing when he took my hand in his. I was so surprised, and my stomach did flips in my abdomen. I looked up into his eyes, which were sparkling unlike I'd ever seen them. Are you sure about this? Liam nodded. I've never been more sure about anything in my life. I just got you back, Polly, and I want all of Kinpago to know. Imogen and Jonah heard what Liam said and started whispering excitedly from in front of us. Essis clapped from where he was wrapped in my left arm. Cade gave a knowing smile, like we'd never fooled him in the first place. I beamed and leaned into Liam. They will. We got our food and took a seat at one of the tables in the middle of the dining hall. Liam kept hold of my hand beneath the table. Essis sat on the table beside my plate, scarfing down donut holes like they were candy. Imogen and Cade sat close, and he shared a bite of cake off his plate. Mallory, Cade's ex, shot them daggers from across the room. Jonah leaned forward and looked between us excitedly. So, how are you going to do it? Do what? I asked. Jonah rolled his eyes. Come out, of course. Um, I don't know, I admitted. I'd thought of telling people a million times, but I never pictured how we'd actually do it. I just kind of figured we'd let people assume. And deny us the pleasure of a spectacle? Imogen asked, feigning offense. Liam laughed. It's not like we're going to get up on stage and sing Lady Gaga. Liam shot Jonah an amused glance. It had been how Jonah came out as gay. Jonah huffed. That was beautiful and you know it. It was, Liam admitted reluctantly. So it's true? Kate asked. You two are together, officially. Yes. I couldn't hold back my smile. It felt amazing to finally admit it to someone. Did Imogen tell you? Cade blushed a little, then said, No, I saw you two kissing by the stables last semester. It explains why you four always act so secretive. We all exchanged a look, but I was the first to speak. Um, right. The truth was, our secrets were a lot bigger than Liam and me. 
Ew! A familiar voice sounded behind us. I turned to see Haley and Kelsey breezing by us with their familiars at their sides. It's the loser team! Jonah shot out of his chair. That's the reject team to you, bitch! He shouted it loud enough for the whole room to hear. Eyes began to turn our way. Cade bit his lower lip to keep from laughing. Haley whirled around with her tray in her hand. What did you just call me? Jonah placed a hand on his hip. You heard me, biatch. Call me that one more time, Haley threatened. I was half surprised her hair wasn't smoking yet. I was just sitting back enjoying the show. Imogen gave the same amused look. What are you going to do? Jonah asked. Throw a fireball at my head? Haley formed a fireball in her hand. Kelsey smirked from beside her. If I have to, Haley said. Try me, Jonah replied, gesturing for her to come at him. I was on my feet in a split second, blocking Haley's path to Jonah. Throw that fireball and you'll regret it. The cafeteria had gone silent, and all eyes were on us. Haley didn't seem to notice. She chuckled, but her laughter quickly died down. She scowled at me. I don't know why you hang out with these losers. It's like you're in love with them or something. My glance involuntarily flickered to Liam. I couldn't let Haley threaten my friends. So what if I am? I challenged her with a raised eyebrow. Haley followed my gaze to Liam, then let out a loud, fake laugh. It was the only sound in the entire cafeteria. Ancestors, you have to be kidding me. She clutched her stomach and doubled over in laughter. You and Maito are back together? You fell for a Toaqua? And worse, a cripple? Liam shot to his feet beside me and clenched his fists, but I placed a hand on his chest to stop him. I've got this, I whispered. I turned back to Haley. Better a Toaqua cripple than a heartless bitch like you. A chorus of oohs traveled around the room. One guy even shouted, burn. You want to play that game? Haley shoved her tray at Kelsey, who was already holding her own, but she took it anyway. Haley shot the fireball in her hand at my face. On instinct, I threw my hands up and caught it. It seared my skin, but I held on because I knew Essis would heal me afterward. The pain was worth it for the utter look of shock on her face. I squeezed my hands together, and the fireball shrank to nothing. Haley's face paled, and she looked speechless. But I wasn't done yet. I directed my fire across the space between us, and her hair went up in flames. She started screaming and spinning around in circles, trying to pat it out. Kelsey dropped their trays to the ground and tried to help her, while Anwara flew onto her head. Haley slapped them both away. I let the fire burn enough to freak her out, but not to hurt her. I pulled back on my magic. The whole cafeteria was bursting into a mix of cheers, laughter, and protests. Haley looked relieved when the fire was gone, but her hair was at least half the length. Her hands curled into fists as she screamed at me. Screw you, Sophia Henley! My mother will hear about this! She whirled around and ran from the cafeteria. When I turned back to my friends, their jaws were practically on the floor. Essis's eyes had gone wide. Holy shit, Imogen said. Sophia, the elders are going to be pissed. I shrugged. I didn't hurt her. I think Doya would be proud that we're using our magic in a real life setting. Jonah laughed. Not really what magic is supposed to be used for, but it was badass. Thanks, Sophia. Anytime, I said with a smile. Liam gazed down at me with a smirk. I blushed. What? I asked innocently. I thought you said you'd changed, he teased. You said you let go of your anger. I smiled. We all know Haley's the exception. 
there's no excuse for the way she treats you guys. Liam wrapped an arm around my waist and pulled me close. He whispered so only I could hear. I have to admit, it was kind of hot. Turned me on a little. I laughed. Good to know. There's more where that came from. Liam beamed down at me. Ancestors, Pawi, I love you. I love you too, I whispered. Then I stood on my toes and kissed him for all of Arenda Academy to see. Chapter 15 The dining hall was dead silent. Everyone's eyes were on us, and I mean everyone. No turning back now. Shock was shown on every face. Where there wasn't surprise, there was absolute disgust. Nobody spoke. It was like a murder had been committed right in the middle of the dining hall, and everyone was unsure of what to do about it. I took advantage of the silence and drew myself up. That's right, I announced. Sophia Henley and I are in a relationship. She's Kuigni, I'm Tawakwa, and we're together. Anyone who's got a problem with it should take it up with me. And me, Sophia said afterward, and she slipped her hand into mine, intertwining our fingers. People's eyes latched onto our locked hands. And me, Imogen said. She got up and planted herself in front of us. Cade stood faithfully at her side. Yeah, Jonah said. He cracked his knuckles loudly. Anyone want to argue? Nobody said a damn word. I decided it was time to make our out. Sophia and I left the hall holding hands, with Jonah and Imogen behind us. Squeaks and Sassy walked beside us, as if they were planning to protect us if anyone decided to pull anything. A couple of girls laughed and pointed, and Esses hissed at them from Sophia's arms. One guy we passed called out, Freaks! Fucking degenerates! He went to go toward us, but Jonah raised a fist and Squeaks hissed at him. He sat right the fuck back down. My heart was pounding when the doors to the dining hall closed behind us. I realized I'd been holding my breath and let out a huge sigh. My chest was tight, and my stomach nodded in anxiety. So what now? Sophia asked me breathlessly. Jonah, Cade, and Imogen looked between us, their brave faces falling. They were scared. I don't know, I confessed. We hadn't really come up with a plan. We just winged it. I think we were both afraid if we talked about coming out, it would never happen. Wait for the task force to show up, I guess. Do you really think that they're going to come for us? Sophia snuggled her nose into Essis's fur. I nodded. They're probably already on their way. So if you want to leave now, we need to go. She shook her head. I'm not running. This is what's right. Then neither am I, I vowed. You guys can always hide in the Anichi dorms if you change your mind, Imogen suggested. Jonah and I will be able to sneak you out of town. You guys are probably already being watched since you stood up for us, I pointed out. Doesn't matter, Jonah shook his head. We'll find a way. Come on, let's go wait for the popo. We didn't have any other ideas except to go wait in the commons. We took a couch by the window. People around us in the room whispered and shot us glances full of hatred, but Sophia and I hardly saw them. We were too busy watching the door, expecting the task force to come storming in any minute. Ezra and Wyatt were there playing ping pong. Jonah went forward and whispered something to my brother under his breath. Ezra left the table and stood at the back of the couch along with Jonah, Cade, and Imogen, forming a protective circle. Diami, Squeaks, Sassy, and Arabelle stood guard and the gossip quieted, or at least moved to the other side of the room at the familiar's sharp stares. Minutes passed. It felt agonizing, even worse than it did when we were waiting to begin the Elemental Cup. The school was full of task force members who were here guarding the place due to the missing familiars. They should have found us by now. I can't wait for them to walk in here, Ezra growled under his breath. He played with a ball of water in his hands, freezing it to ice and back to liquid again. Ez, don't fight when they get here. Let them take us, I said. Like hell, Ezra said. 
We have to show our side has reason, Sophia said. If we react with violence, it's only going to end badly. We have to let the elders know that we're doing this peacefully, and our relationship isn't going to hurt the tribe. I'm not going to let you guys become martyrs, Ezra said darkly. I almost lost my brother. I'm not going to risk losing him again. I'm not so sure the tribe has reason, Imogen spoke up. Rationality might not work when there's unfair bias involved. We quieted for a moment, and Jonah said, Well, I hope the sex was worth it. Several of us laughed, including Sophia. Ezra smirked. I'm sure it was. I heard the headboard hit the wall at least five times the other day. Liam was getting it. All right, guys, that's enough, I said, though I couldn't keep the grin off my face. Sophia, don't take this the wrong way, but how big is it? Imogen asked, ignoring me. She held up her hands as if measuring something, and Cade snorted. Nervous snickers broke out around us. Sophia grinned. <laughs> Let's just say it's not little. That big, huh? Jonah teased. It's legendary, Sophia said. Everyone died with laughter, including me. It was nice to be joking around at a time like this. I didn't know how much longer we'd have to laugh together. As sunset fell and the commons grew dark, we started to grow impatient with waiting. We'd even seen a few task force members walk past, but they didn't so much as peek their heads in the window before marching off. What was the deal? Shouldn't we have been arrested by now? Sophia asked worryingly as the third patrol went by and nothing. Yes, we should have, I told her. That's what I'm concerned about. It was weird to be bothered that we weren't yet in jail, but the fact that no legal action had been taken against us by the elders was beyond weird. I thought that this would have been a done deal. They'd take us in immediately after we revealed ourselves, and we'd have a chance to make our case. The fact that we'd revealed our relationship and nothing had happened wasn't comforting. It was like the elders were waiting, biding their time. Hours later, everyone looked exhausted. The commons were empty by now except for us. The other students had gotten bored of staring at Sophia and I like we were in a zoo. Jonah was snoring slightly on an armchair, and Ezra struggled to keep his eyes open as he leaned against Diami. Squeaks and Sassy had curled up on the rug together, and Essis was sleeping inside of Sophia's hoodie. Imogen had cuddled up in Cade's lap and was almost drifting off. He was the only one who didn't seem sleepy. He played with Imogen's hair and stared into the fireplace, his expression haunted as if something was deeply bothering him. Sophia and I were still awake. We were both silently freaking out, but at this point it was like the tension had climbed to an unbearable level. Time kept on going and going, and nothing happened. I kept my arm around her as she nestled up to my side, tucking her legs underneath her. Should we just go to sleep here? Sophia wondered. I don't feel safe going back to my dorm alone. I don't want you to. We shouldn't separate. I was supposed to be home right now. Mom was probably flipping out. But I worried that if Sophia and I parted, that something bad would happen. I'd be safe at home, but there were probably plenty of prejudiced coigni in Sophia's dorm that might try to break into her room and hurt her for being part of an interhouse relationship. But our friends had class tomorrow, and we did too, assuming that we weren't behind bars. Was it too much to hope for that the elders were looking the other way, or simply didn't care about our relationship? Around midnight, the doors opened. Our heads turned. I was shocked to see my dad striding toward us, Tatum following. The grizzly bear had his head low and his teeth bared, eyes scanning the room as if looking out for any attackers that might spring out of the shadows. The rest of you must leave. Sophia and Liam will be coming with me, Dad told the group as he approached. Ezra, get your sister and head home. Ezra nodded and hurried off. Cade stepped in front of Sophia and said, we can't just let you take them in like this. I'm not taking them in. I'm protecting them, Dad said firmly. If the rest of you don't want to be in any more trouble than what's already been started, you need to move. Now. Nobody else questioned him. 
Jonah and Imogen gave us lonely waves as they and their familiars followed Cade and Arabelle out. Once the doors were closed, Dad turned toward us. He was all business. You two will be staying with us until all of this is over. Yes, Sophia, you too, Dad said when he noticed her stunned expression. The dorms at Arenda Academy aren't safe for you presently. We need both of you in a place where we can be certain you won't be attacked. Dad, what do you mean by until all of this is over, I asked. Dad stared at me for a moment. He sighed and reached into his pocket. I was hoping I wouldn't have to give these to you until later. He handed Sophia and I two brown envelopes. We opened them slowly. My insides turned to water with each word I read. Liam Mito, you are hereby summoned by the elders for committing high treason of willfully participating in an intertribal relationship. Such actions are forbidden by tribal law and are especially heinous, punishable by up to life in prison, or, if the elders shall find sufficient concern, the penalty of death. Your trial date is December 23rd. Please arrive to the intertribal court no later than 8 a.m. Sincerely, the Elder Council. My legs were going to collapse from underneath me. A cold, clammy feeling, like one of death, was crawling over me slowly and consuming me whole. I was going to puke. I didn't know how we'd ever get out of this. It felt like a mountain had just crashed on me. Reality came upon me suddenly and quickly. This was real. The elders weren't playing around. I'd known all this already, but this letter made it all too real. We could go to jail for life, not just a few years. Worse, we could be killed. This was a severe crime we were being accused of. The worst part of it all was Sophia and I could be torn away from each other, and we hadn't even done anything wrong. Sophia's letter was identical to mine, except in hers it had a note about Essis being removed from her if we lost. Her face had gone pale white and she was shaking. Essis patted her cheek and had a determined look on his face, like he'd be damned if he allowed anyone to take him away. Our trial date was set for the end of December. That was two months away. We had to sit and wait to know what our fate would be for two whole months? I was able to get you both a trial with Madame Doya's help, Dad said as he glanced to both of our faces. It's more than most interhouse couples receive. The two of you have caused quite a stir with the elders. I swallowed past the lump in my throat. Dad, you can't let anything happen to us. I'll do everything in my power to make sure the two of you win this case, he said firmly. But for now, let's move. It's not safe for us to talk in the open. He waved a hand, and Sophia and I followed. He moved so quickly through the halls that Sophia and I practically had to jog to keep up. The elders need time to deliberate before the case begins. You'll still be allowed to attend classes in the meantime, and Sophia will be able to keep S's for now, Dad said as we walked. I've organized for a flying carriage to take the two of you back and forth to school on weekdays. Task force members have been instructed not to harm you before the trial proceeds. We stopped in front of the Coigny dorms, and Dad looked to Sophia. Grab what you need, Miss Hanley, and quickly. It's going to be a long stay for you. Sophia nodded and headed inside. Dad and I were left waiting outside in the quiet. Dad, why are you doing this? I dared to ask. He made a skeptical noise. You're asking why I need to protect my eldest son? But you don't agree with our relationship, I protested. It doesn't matter if I don't agree. You two have obviously made your decision and I have to stand by you on it, Dad said. That's not where you stood last semester, I said slowly. Last semester was a mistake I fully regret, Dad stated. It was wrong to send you to kill Sophia. I never should have put you up to that. It's on my shoulders that your mother and I nearly lost you. No, Dad, it's not, I said gently. I didn't want him thinking my suicide attempt was on him. Yes, it is. I pushed you too hard. I asked you to do something no father should ever think to ask, he insisted. I knew you loved Sophia from the beginning. I didn't have to guess. He sighed. 
I just wish you two had handled the situation better. We've got a full-scale crisis on our hands. People had to know, Dad. We got tired of hiding, I told him. Sophia and I just got back together, and one of our conditions was going public. We'd been broken up for a long time. I knew that. Something had changed in you after Ancestors Day, Dad said, and Tatum rumbled in agreement. I didn't realize how important she was to you until then, until I saw the hope go out of you. I want to see my son happy again, even if it means sacrificing tradition. A bit of warmth grew inside me, warding off the coldness. I ran a hand over Tatum's head. I forgive you, Dad, I said, for everything. Dad gave me a grim smile. Sophia emerged from the Coigny dorms, carrying a small suitcase and her book bag. Okay, I've got everything I need, she said. Good to go, Polly? I asked. She nodded. Dad noticed I'd called her that, but besides a side glance, he didn't say anything. He just gestured for us to move. We hustled to a carriage outside, one pulled by a Pegasus that flew us all the way back to my house. Mom had been pacing by the door. She looked worried for the first time since I could remember. Mom was usually the rock of the family. If she wavered, it was definitely a sign of a huge issue. When we came through the entryway, she rushed toward us. She gave me a kiss on my cheek and brushed a hand over Sophia's hair. I was so worried about you two. Thin lines had creased around her eyes in concern. Hello, Kay. We need to talk, Dad said. His tone was serious. He took her hand and jerked his head toward his office. Mom nodded then glanced back at us. You can stay in Liam's room, Sophia. Liwanu and I don't mind, Mom said as she followed Dad into the next room. I heard the lock click as the door shut behind them. Ezra and Maddie's low voices came from somewhere down the hall. It sounded like a serious conversation, one we shouldn't interrupt. It's late. We should get some sleep. I told Sophia. She barely reacted to my words. She was still scared. Her letter was crunched up in one hand that wasn't holding the suitcase. I took the letter and the suitcase from her. When we got up to my room, I shoved both of the letters in my dresser, as if putting them away meant that the elders couldn't harm us. Sophia sat on my bed with her head in her hands. Essis rubbed her lower back, trying to get her to calm down. Maybe we should have ran away, Sophia said in a weak voice, the sound muffled. I shook my head and sat beside her. No, I'm tired of running. The tribe has kicked me around for the past two years. It's time I started fighting back. She lifted her gaze. And if we lose? My insides curled inward and I said, we won't. Sophia got up. She opened her suitcase and started pulling clothes out. Where should I put these? I have an empty drawer at the bottom you can use. I pointed and Sophia started putting her things away. When her suitcase was empty, she took off her day clothes and tossed them to the floor. I watched her rummage for pajamas and just her underwear, no bra included, and felt myself getting a hard on. It was weird. Being on the verge of being put to death for loving Sophia just made her ten times hotter to me. If the elders thought making a relationship forbidden would be any deterrent, they were dead wrong. I tossed off my shirt and jeans and climbed into bed in just my boxers. Sophia slipped on a loose, short nightgown, turned off the light, and slid in beside me. Nessus became a ball on the pillow next to her head and put his tail over his nose to sleep. I put an arm around her and she nestled her head up against my chest. Our legs tangled together. We lay there in the dark, just breathing. After a few moments, she giggled unexpectedly. What is it? I asked. She snickered. I have a drawer of things at your place. Gee, we're moving fast, I said sarcastically. I can't believe your parents are letting us room together, she said excitedly. I mean, they know we're going to do stuff, right? I chuckled. We need to be careful. I don't think my parents would be super impressed if they came in here and saw us banging. Then we need to learn how to do ninja sex, she whispered. And maybe get rid of the headboard. I laughed lowly. Yeah, like they wouldn't notice that. She giggled again and let out a deep sigh. 
Soon, Sophia quieted. I heard the sound of her soft breathing, accompanied by Essis's snores. I stroked her hair and let my fingertips roam up and down her body so she could rest peacefully. I couldn't. I was too pent up, too worried about what would happen in December. It felt like I had a ticking time bomb over my head that was about to go off any minute. I'd be freaking out right now if Sophia's body wasn't firmly pressed against mine, acting as an anchor to sanity. The ancestors have a plan. Yeah, well, how was that plan working out now? Well, at least this whole situation had one big perk. I got to fall asleep next to Sophia every evening, and she'd be there in the morning when I woke up. It was like a dream in the middle of one big nightmare. The first thing I'd see was her big brown eyes. I just hoped it wouldn't be ripped away from us. The next morning, Sophia and I were all over the news. Every paper, every Hawkeye news outlet had photos of us. I wasn't sure how they'd gotten them, but it was clear that reporters had pulled an all-nighter digging up any information they could find on Sophia and I, along with our relationship. Some of the shit was insane. Most of it was made up, and the stuff that was accurate was grossly exaggerated. Someone had found an old photo of me riding my bike, and now I was apparently the leader of some underground Tawakwa biker gang who was responsible for half the crimes being committed in Kinpago. Sophia had it worse than I did. The news claimed that she was some outsider temptress who'd seduced me into giving up traditional Hawkeye values so we could perform blood sacrifices in the wilderness together. They made it sound like I was some victim, and she was a wicked witch who'd enchanted me with a love potion to act against my own self-interest. It got worse from there. A couple of reporters accused Sophia and I of trying to overthrow the elders. One paper even reported that Sophia and I had an illegitimate baby that we'd given to wild dragons to raise. It would have been funny if our lives weren't on the line. I hoped the elders weren't stupid enough to be influenced by propagandist garbage, but who knew? Reporters and paparazzi were waiting outside the school when we arrived. They rushed forward with microphones and cameras, trying to get an interview as we stepped out of the carriage. I put my arm around Sophia, and we rushed down the path to the safety of Arenda's campus. We kept our heads down, but they got a few shots of us before we were able to get into the gardens. The reporters couldn't follow us onto school grounds, but what was waiting inside was almost worse. Stairs. Some from strangers, some from people we knew. So many people sneered at us or turned away with revulsion when they saw us coming. They truly thought we were repulsive. My shoulders sank in relief when we saw Jonah and Imogen waiting for us in the Great Hall. Imogen was busy flipping through a magazine, and Jonah eyed it over her shoulder. Sassy wound around Imogen's ankles, while Squeaks looked at the magazine with a careful eye as if she could read it too. Imogen saw us coming and snapped the magazine shut. She quickly stuffed it in her bag. Hey guys, what's going on? I wasn't fooled by her pleasant tone. Neither was Sophia. What does that one say? Sophia asked blandly, pointing to the end of the magazine sticking out of the bag. Imogen's face fell. Nothing. N nothing important. You guys are the story of the century, Jonah said. I'd almost be jealous if it wasn't so serious. Raised voices came from down the hallway. This time of morning, there weren't very many students milling around. Most classes didn't start until nine. It sounded like the voices were coming from the entrance of Head Dean Ulrich's tower. Ulrich came out of the entrance of the tower, holding the door open. I understand your concern, Jacob, but Professor Perot and I have the situation handled. Good day to you, sir. An incredibly deep voice responded. You think you can stop what's coming, Caspian, but I can assure you things are only going to get worse. You know where to find me. A man stepped out from the tower. He was huge, six foot seven with a strong jaw and thick arms corded with muscle. He had long blonde hair that fell across his shoulders and a beard trimmed short around his face. He wore a long black cloak that hung off his broad shoulders. I was surprised the floor didn't shake when he walked. 
He was older than me by at least five years or more. The guy was bigger than Jonah. No, I really mean it. Bigger than Jonah. He had to be the tallest guy I'd ever seen. Following him was a giant hippogriff, his feathers dark gray in color. The hippogriff was huge, 18 hands or more, and towered over Ulrich as he emerged from the tower. Ulrich quickly retreated, and the stranger used air magic to blow the door shut behind him. Oh my gosh, what hot stuff, Imogen squeaked. And he's coming this way? Sophia, Imogen, and I pressed ourselves to the wall to make room, but Squeaks and Jonah stood in the middle of the hall like a couple of deer in headlights. Squeaks' eyes were on the hippogriff. The male glanced her way, and Squeaks fluttered her eyelashes. He observed her for a minute before planting his gaze forward. The stranger seemed to be deep in thought. Jonah was acting too stunned to move, feet glued to the floor. They ended up bumping into each other. Jonah stumbled, but the stranger caught him before he could make a total faceplant on the floor. Whoops, the stranger said. He smiled. Sorry there, little guy. He patted Jonah on the chest, gave him a wink, then walked away. The stranger turned the corner, vanishing with his massive hippogriff. Jonah looked like he'd been hit by a train. His mouth hung open as he stared at the spot where the man had gone, dazed. Earth to Jonah, Imogen yelled, and she snapped her fingers in front of his face. Did you even see that guy flirting with you? He was a total hottie. Huh? Jonah was still dazed. He shook his head as if he was coming out of a dream. It was like he couldn't comprehend English. Go after him and get his number, Imogen insisted. I'm sure he'll call you. He looked like he liked you. What? No, Jonah said, and he blushed. He wouldn't give it to me anyhow. Besides, I have a boyfriend. I'd never seen Jonah get shy about talking to guys before. This was new. Squeaks made a clipping sound with her beak. She'd liked that hippogriff that was on the menu, if her behavior was any indication. Raynar's a shit boyfriend. You need to upgrade, Imogen said. Jonah seemed bothered. His forehead was creased and his eyes were puzzled. I've got to get to psychology, guys. Uh, see ya. Jonah hurried off. Squeaks followed with a bit of a spring in her step. Imogen did a little dance. <laughs> did you guys see that? Jonah has eyes for somebody other than his shithead boyfriend. Yeah, I responded watching as Jonah vanished into Dean Eliza's classroom. We need to go chase that guy down and beg him to take Jonah out on a date. He's a little old, Sophia said disapprovingly. He looks 30. I scoffed. I don't care if the dude is 85 if it gets Jonah away from Raynar. What do you think he and Ulrich were talking about, Imogen asked. Sounded serious. I'm not sure, I mused. Ulrich said he and Perot had it handled, so that must mean it's got something to do with the sick familiars. But if this guy's offering to help, I don't know why Ulrich would be turning him away. He and Perot aren't making any process on finding a cure. Perhaps he's up to no good, Sophia suggested. Ulrich knows where there's trouble, and I've never seen that guy around school before. Me neither, I said. It was weird. Someone like that I'd remember. Imogen shrugged. Well, I hope he shows up again. He and Jonah would be a cute couple. Imogen bounced off the magical plants with Sassy strutting at her heels. It was getting late. I had to get Sophia to class. Sophia and I had resolved to walk to as many classes together as we could, as it would be safer and people would be less likely to confront us if we showed a united front. I didn't have class until that afternoon, but Sophia had Hawkeye Legends right away at eight. We started walking down that way, only to be stopped by none other than Professor Bain. He wore an anxious expression. He glanced down at our joined hands before saying, Sophia, Liam, may I talk to you both for a moment? Great. A lecture. I resisted rolling my eyes as Bain led us behind a sprite statue that was right next to Doya's classroom. He fiddled with his hands nervously before he spat out, you two don't understand what you're getting into. I raised my eyebrow. 
Really? Because we just got a letter yesterday telling us that we're being put on trial for being together. Yeah, and we're still here together, Sophia said firmly. So if you think we don't know the consequences, you're wrong. Bane shook his head. No, you truly don't. As your mentor, I need you both to hear me. This isn't going to work out in your favor. You both need to do what's best. You two need to end this and go to the elders and beg for mercy. If you're fortunate, your sentence will be reduced and you'll be able to keep your lives. And never be able to be together again? Sophia asked. No way. Essis made a chittering sound of agreement. Bane's expression grew hollow and thin. Listen, don't go to court. Don't fight this. Take a deal, Bane pleaded with us. Even if this was legal, it'd only end in disaster. Tawakwa and Kowigny don't work together. They're too different. You're both going to get broken hearts. I got so tired of hearing that crap. It had been repeated over and over to me and shoved down my throat since I was born, and I didn't believe a word of it. It's our decision to make, I told Bane firmly. So let us make it. What kind of children would you raise? A half-breed child could never be strong. It probably wouldn't be able to yield magic. They wouldn't survive in this society, Bane insisted. Sophia's face got really red. If Liam and I decide to have children, that's none of your damn business. Damn, Sophia. She had a mama bear complex coming out, and she didn't even have kids yet. Bane blushed, embarrassed, and he turned to me instead. Words came tumbling out of his mouth. Liam, don't go through with this. I know you're happy now, but this type of thing can't last. One day everything will be fine. The next thing you know, she'll be threatening to burn your house down. Excuse me? Sophia asked, outraged. No offense to you, Sophia. I don't mean it like that, Bane rushed to say. But I don't wish to see either of you get hurt, and it looks like it's heading that way. Please ask the elders for forgiveness before they decide to take your lives. Sophia's hand was so tight in mine it was restricting circulation. She was pissed. I decided to end things before they could get worse. We're not asking for forgiveness, because we didn't do anything wrong. That's the end of it, I said. See you in class, professor, Sophia finished. She dragged me off before Bane could stop us. He's unbelievable, Sophia muttered under her breath. People cleared out of the way as we came down the hallway, shooting to the other side, like they couldn't stand to be near us. He's just looking out for us, even though he's wrong, I told her. He doesn't want to see us get the death penalty. Sophia stopped in front of the classroom that led to Hawkeye Legends. She dropped my hand and said, Do you think we will? I stared at her. I don't know, but after what I've been through the past few months, I think death's preferable to losing you again. Her face softened. We aren't going to die, Liam. We're going to win. Somehow, some way, we'll change the law. She rose up on her toes to give me a goodbye kiss, then ran inside the classroom. Having her out of my sight made a sickening feeling churn in my gut. I just got her back, and we could be separated all over again. Worst part about it was, there was nothing we could do right now. The only option we had was to sit around and wait for the trial to be over, to know for sure if the elders would let us be together. But we were together now, and I wanted to cherish that. I spun on my heels and left. If we truly were running on borrowed time, we had to make these last few months count. On Halloween, I got out of Hawkeye Home Ec early and decided to wait for Sophia outside of her intro to child development class. It was held in a separate building from the school, but still attached to campus. It was a daycare where professors and students who were parents could leave their kids five and under for the day while they were in class. I passed Mia on the way out of the castle. She avoided my eyes and kept her gaze down. Another bruise had appeared on her cheek, though she'd covered it with makeup. We'd stopped talking a couple of weeks ago, but it wasn't my choice. She wasn't following my advice to leave Micah, and I felt powerless. At this point, I felt like there was nothing more I could do.
The door to the daycare was open when I walked inside of it. Sophia's class should have been over, so I took a chance to step inside. It looked like any other daycare would, except that along with kids, there were also a ton of baby magical creatures running about. Tiny griffins, little dragons, unicorn foals, and newborn fawns played alongside the infants and toddlers. A baby calf chased after a lion cub with leaves for fur, and a little boy painted the fur on a kitten with a watercolor paint set. It was also adorably cute, along with loud and chaotic. Sophia had fallen in the middle of the room on an alphabet foam mat under a pile of kids, both elementi and familiar. She laughed as they tugged on her clothes and sat on top of her. She was absolutely glowing. You could tell that this was her calling. My heart swelled watching her play with them. Essis had taken a place in the corner of the room on top of a small table. He was showing a picture book to a group of toddlers who'd formed a circle around him. A baby wyvern let out a puff of smoke and accidentally set the book on fire. Essis rushed to put it out. Sophia sat up and put a little boy on her lap. She saw me coming and immediately brightened up. You look like you have your hands full, I said. She had at least six kids on her. Two girls, one boy, a phoenix hatchling, a newborn chimera, and a feline-looking creature with purple fur and big ears. Miss Sophia, who's that guy? A little boy with black hair wrinkled his nose at me. Sophia brushed her hair back and said, That's Mr. Liam. He's my boyfriend. You have a boyfriend? Ew the boy said. Do you kiss and stuff? Sometimes, Sophia smiled. The boy stuck out his tongue like he was grossed out. Are you getting married? Will you have a coigny wedding? One of the girls asked. Sophia hesitated. Oh, um, Camilla, he's not coigny, Sophia said slowly, and she looked up at me. He's Toakwa. None of the kids blinked an eye. Oh, okay. Camilla said, and she shrugged. How old is he? Sophia laughed. He's 22, and I'm 19. You're so old, the little boy burst out. Like my grandma. She poked him in the stomach. You're old, Josiah. Yep, I'm five, Josiah said very seriously. The back door opened, and a tall, dark-skinned woman entered the room. I knew her as Professor Ambika, the head of the child development program. Everyone to the playground, she announced. It's recess. The kids scattered toward the door. Professor Ambika gave us a glare as she herded the kids outside and shut the door with a snap. Essis put the book down and came running toward us, jumping onto Sophia's shoulder. She laughed. You know, when I signed up for this class, I knew I was going to be watching kids, but I didn't know I'd be babysitting baby familiars, too. They kind of go hand in hand, I said. I extended a hand to lift her up. She brushed off her clothes, which looked like they were covered in apple juice stains, graham cracker crumbs, and acrylic paint. It was kind of nice they didn't judge us, she said. You know, for being inter-house. Kids don't care about that type of shit, I said. They don't know hatred unless someone teaches it to them. I tried to steer the conversation to more positive matters. Anyway, I uh, thought we could go out on a date tonight. You know, just the two of us. Her eyes sparked. A date, huh? Yeah, haven't had one of those in a long time, have we? I teased. Sophia looked down at her ruined clothes and said, Can we run to your house real quick so I can change? I smell like babies. Smelling like babies isn't a bad thing, I said, and I nudged her. But sure. I noticed Professor Ambika watching us through the window. I put my arm around Sophia's hips and guided her outside. How's that class going anyway, I asked, remembering the snotty glare Ambika had given us. She frowned. I don't know. A bunch of parents took their kids out of the program after they found out I was helping to teach. They're worried about me influencing their kids to be inter-house. Oh, that wasn't good. No wonder Ambika wasn't exactly warm toward us. She huffed, and Essis copied her. I don't get what the big deal is. Kids can't catch the inter-house, just like they can't catch the gay. And even if they could, what's the big deal? 
Aren't we supposed to be encouraging kids to be who they are? She shrugged. Anyway, I think I'm going to get an A. I've changed more diapers than anyone else in that class, and Professor Ambika is impressed by that. At least I'm not getting kicked out of the program. I don't think I could choose a major besides child development. You'll be fine, I told her. We spoke no more about it on the carriage ride home. I wanted our date to be a break from all the bad stuff, so I didn't ask any more questions. When Sophia came out of my bedroom, she was wearing skinny jeans that hugged her ass and a thick sweater underneath a tan leather jacket. She was holding something behind her back. Before we head out, I kind of have a surprise for you, Sophia said. She brought her hand around, holding a basket that was packed to the brim with all kinds of items. What's all of this? I sat on the bed, and Sophia placed the basket on my lap. It was really heavy. I've never really gotten you anything as a gift, so I wanted to change that, she said. I went to town while you were in class the other day and got a bunch of stuff. Imogen helped me pick some things out. I couldn't just get you one thing. She sat next to me and started pointing. I found you new headphones, the ones I caught you looking at a while back. There are some mineral salts and menthol oils for baths in there, and this pain relief lotion I found. Your meds are also really disorganized, so I got a box for that, along with some ibuprofen if you need it. There's this mini sleep machine I got that makes noise. You toss and turn a lot, so I figured it could help. Also, I bought that new book you've been wanting, along with a book light, so you can stop keeping me up by leaving the lamp on while you read. She snickered before she continued. There's a heating pad for your muscles when they get sore, and a journal for you to start tracking your symptoms. I got you wrists and knee braces to help your joints, too. Uh, watch it, the basket is kind of heavy. There's a weighted blanket at the bottom for your anxiety, along with a mini humidifier to help you breathe. Oh, and I got us a subscription package for streaming movies, so if you don't feel well, we can just chill together instead of going out. She reached in the basket. And I couldn't resist this little guy. He was too cute. But he's kind of more for me. Sophia held up a stuffed wolf by her face and smiled. Isn't he adorable? I was stunned. Nobody had ever gotten me a gift like this before. It was so incredibly thoughtful. It was like Sophia had studied me and figured out everything that bothered me so she could help with what I really needed. Her face fell at my lack of a reaction. You don't like it? Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I put the basket aside and wrapped her in a tight hug. I love it, I told her. It's absolutely perfect for me. Her body sagged in relief. I'm really happy to hear that. I wanted to give you something that showed I care. I know you care. I ran my thumb over the corner of her mouth. And it was incredibly thoughtful. Thank you. I put the gift basket on my dresser and rummaged in my pocket. Now it's my turn. I can't wait for you to see what I have planned. I brought out a blindfold and put it around her eyes, tying it behind her head. She giggled. Where are you taking me? You'll find out. I took her by the hand and carefully led her downstairs, making sure to grab her purse. Essis launched himself onto my shoulder and sat there, making excited noises. We took the boat to the mainland, and I guided her through the woods by her shoulders. I'm starting to think you're kidnapping me, she joked as we walked up a hill. You're almost there, I said. When we got to the top, I untied the blindfold and said, Okay, now you can open your eyes. Sophia did, and she gasped with delight. I'd taken her to the top of a cliffside that overlooked the ocean and the setting sun beyond. There was a large tree on the cliff that had been decorated with tiny glowing lanterns. From the tree's branches hung glass bottles with rolled up messages inside. Underneath the tree was a small round table covered with a white tablecloth along with two chairs and a couple of candles. A bottle of wine sat in a bucket of ice that I'd chilled with my water magic to stay cold, and two glasses stood next to it. Liam, how long did this take you? Sophia asked as she approached the tree, looking up in wonder. Essis jumped from my shoulder and started climbing the tree, scaling up its height. All morning, I said. Take a look at the bottles. Sophia reached up, took a bottle down from a branch, and uncorked it. Reason number twelve why I love you. 
the way you smile when you catch me staring. She reached up and grabbed another bottle, placing the first on the table. Reason number eight why I love you, the sound of your laugh when you tell a corny joke. Sophia gazed up at the tree with an open mouth. Are all of these filled with reasons why you love me? Every one, I said. There are dozens of bottles here, she said, and her grin widened. She retrieved another bottle and read, Reason number 35 why I love you, the way you dance like no one is watching. There were a lot of reasons. I pretty much ran out of paper, I confessed. And that's not all. I reached underneath the table and pulled out a picnic basket, setting it on the table. I made his dinner. This is all so amazing. Sophia put the bottles down and wrapped her arms around my waist. I can't believe you did all this for me. Believe it. You deserve it, I told her, and I kissed her. Sophia continued reading bottles while I got dinner set up. I set out pasta salad, chicken pesto, antipasto skewers, spring rolls, and strawberries for dessert. The ice that I'd surrounded the basket with was still cold, so everything had stayed fresh. Sophia gathered the rest of the bottles from the tree and set them beside her chair on the ground. She sat down at the table while I poured the wine, and she asked playfully, I thought we agreed not to drink around each other after last time. Well, since I took your virginity last week, I say that rule is out the window. We can get as drunk as we want now and fuck later, I said. She giggled. Is fucking on the list for tonight? If you want it to be, I said coyly. She nudged my foot underneath the table and said, We'll see. We started eating. Sophia read notes from bottles in between bites, and we worked through the wine pretty quickly. Both of us were pretty buzzed, but the food helped offset some of the alcohol. You didn't tell me you could cook. This is delicious, Sophia said. A man who can make food is like a million times hotter than anything else in the world. My mom helped me a lot, but thanks, I said. I don't like eating out, so I know how to make my own food. Sophia read another note. Reason 68, why I love you. The noises you make when I'm kissing you. She uncorked another bottle and read the note inside. Reason number 29, why I love you. The way you feel when I'm inside you. She gave me a sultry look. I chuckled. Okay, some of them are dirty, I confessed. You know I couldn't resist throwing a few of those in there. She laughed before slowly a frown overtook her expression. Something was on her mind. What's wrong, I asked. Sophia looked down at her plate. I have a confession to make. After we broke up, I was really upset and so angry. I went back to the waterfall and burned our initials off of our tree. I hope you can forgive me for it. Don't worry about it. I saw that and already took care of it. A grin played around my lips. Took care of it? How? She looked confused. I smirked. While you were in class the other day, I used my water magic to carve our initials into one of the rocks by the waterfall. Can't burn that. It's there forever now. Sophia laughed. Guess we have to be permanent then. Guess so. The mood had definitely shifted. We'd finished up dinner and the notes were winding down. It was obvious that there was only one thing on both of our minds, and we wanted to get to it. Sophia was reading the last of the bottles. Reason number one, you'll always, always, always be my Pawi. Always, I said. Her eyes were shimmering. She rolled up the note, then put the pile of them into her purse for safekeeping. Night had fallen, and it had gotten cold. Sophia shivered, and I said, we should go back home. Just leave the stuff here. I'll come back and get it all later. Esses came running down the tree when Sophia called for him. We both were a little tipsy. We staggered down the hill, but Sophia tripped. I reached out to catch her and ended up falling over too. We rolled down the hill with Esses chasing after us, making loud squeaking noises. We landed in a giant mud puddle that was at the bottom of the hill. Mud and water went everywhere as we splashed into it. Esses screeched to a halt before he could get covered in muck. Sophia and I, though, were soaked. Ew! Sophia cried. 
I laughed and grabbed her. I pulled her on top of me and started kissing her, not paying attention to the fact that we were covered in mud. She kissed me back. I felt her brush mud across my forehead as she swept my hair back. She pulled her mouth away from mine with a giggle. <laughs> we're filthy. The hunting cabin isn't far, I told her. We should clean up before we go home. Don't want my parents thinking we had sex in the mud. Sophia laughed. She got to her feet and pulled me up so we could make our way to the cabin. Once we were inside, Essis turned on the TV, then sat on the living room couch eating chips that he'd scavenged from the kitchen. I started up the shower so the water could get warm. Sophia followed me to the laundry room and slowly we stripped off our mud-soaked clothes and put them in the washer. We spent the rest of our time in the shower taking care of each other. I washed her hair, and she washed my body, going slow and taking the utmost care. We both dried each other off. By the time we emerged from the bathroom, I felt closer to her than I ever had before. It was so nice to be with someone who cared for you like that, who made you feel loved. On Monday afternoon, I came out of basket weaving with something in my hands. What's that? Sophia asked me curiously as she waited outside the classroom. Her head tilted, and Essis copied her in his arms. It's a blanket, I told her. I made it for you last semester, but I decided to add a little bit more to it. I unfurled it, then wrapped it around her shoulders. It was made in the traditional Hawkeye design with blocks and triangles of red, orange, and white intermingling together. Sophia pulled it tighter around her shoulders. Esses peeked his head out from inside of it. It's beautiful, Sophia said. There are so many colors. I'm glad you like it, I said. A couple of people in the corner of the hallway looked shocked that I'd draped the garment around her, but fuck them. This was my decision, not theirs. Sophia and I were supposed to be heading home. We'd moved our carriage to the back of the school within the woods so that the paparazzi and everyone else wouldn't see us coming or going but there was someone waiting by the carriage for us when we got there. It was a woman with a long blonde braid and glasses. She was short but intelligent looking, probably Navita. How had she gotten on campus and passed the task force? The woman shuffled towards us with intent. Sophia Henley, Liam Mito, might I have a word with you? We don't talk to reporters, I said quickly. I'm not a reporter, the woman said, but I have information that might help your case. Neither of us responded, and the woman hurried to add, Sorry, I haven't introduced myself. My name is Jamin Risk. I'm the lead organizer for the Interhouse Alliance. Then it clicked. She'd been interviewed on TV last semester, when the last Interhouse couple had been discovered and arrested. What do you want? Sophia asked quickly. It was clear in her tone that she didn't trust her. Jamin sighed and adjusted her glasses. Let me be frank, Miss Henley. This case, it doesn't look good for either of you. But we think you might stand a chance if you show the elders there are people behind you. Jamin looked around, then gestured toward the trees. From behind her, all kinds of figures emerged. Men and women came out into the light, each of them holding hands. Couples were gay, straight, and everything in between. They were old, some looking like they could be grandparents, middle-aged and young. But there was one commonality. They were all interhouse, and some of the faces we recognized. Ben? Sophia asked in astonishment. And Marcy? I asked. Ben and Marcy were standing across from us, Marcy clinging on to Ben's arm, a Kawigni and Tawakwa, standing together as clear as day. Daisy flew beside Marcy, appearing proud. That's right. Marcy and I are in a relationship and have been for months now, Ben said. We're tired of hiding this. You guys have given us the courage to come into the light. We're all tired of hiding, Marcy insisted. That's why we've all decided to come out too, in support of you guys. The elders can't arrest all of us and put us all on trial, at least not at once. This is the most important case of the century. We need to stand up and fight for our rights. Sounds of agreement went up around the group. I shook my head. We can't ask you guys to do that. It's not fair for you to put yourselves at risk for us. The protest has already begun, 
Many couples have already been arrested and taken into custody by the task force, Jamin said. There are hundreds of interhouse relationships all around Kinpago, and each of them are willing to come forward to support a movement, a movement to legalize interhouse marriages. Sophia and I looked at each other. I was totally humbled. People were going to jail and risking themselves for us, for the right to be in love. We'll support you in any way we can, Jamin said. If the elders know you have support behind you, they're more likely to decide in your favor to avoid upsetting the general public. This case is the most important thing facing the fate of the Hawkeye right now, Marcy spoke up. It'll decide whether or not being in love with someone from another house is against the law. All of our fates depend on whether you guys win or lose, and we're not willing to let you lose. The elders aren't going to be happy about this, I said. Let them be angry. I've been angry about not telling anyone how I feel about Marcy for months, Ben said. He wrapped an arm around her. I'm willing to do whatever it takes to be with her. If that means standing up to the elders, then so be it. Sophia seemed awed. I'm... I'm so glad there's people out there willing to back us up. For the longest time, Liam and I... We thought we were all alone. You were never alone. There's more people like you than you know, Jamin said kindly. You have a cause worth fighting for. Just know that we'll be behind you all the way. There were footsteps behind us. Liam? Sophia? We turned to see Imogen sprinting our way, sassy at her heels. She skidded to a stop beside us. I was hoping I'd catch you before you left. Jonah... She cut off, blinking at the group surrounding us. Who are all these people? We'll tell you later, Sophia said quickly. What's wrong with Jonah? Imogen bit her lip. Come with me. She grabbed our arms and started dragging us back toward the castle. I sent a glance backward at Jamin and the others, but they'd already dispersed. How many more of them would get arrested tonight on Sophia and I's behalf? Not all of them had people in power like my dad to keep them safe. We looked around to make sure we weren't followed before we slipped into the tower leading up to the Anachi dorms. Jonah was pacing when we arrived. He stopped as we approached and then looked down, seeming guilty. Squeaks was stomping her hooves in the corner of the room, gnashing her beak. She seemed pissed. What's up? I asked. Jonah didn't answer, just kept his gaze fixed on the floor. Tell them, Jonah, Imogen crossed her arms. Tell them what you just told me. Jonah scratched the back of his head. Well, the other night, Raynor and I, we got a little drunk, like a lot drunk, or... At least I did. I could already tell this wasn't going to be good. And I prodded. He let out a sigh. I might have let it slip that we're looking for pieces of the prophecy. You what? Sophia and I both said at the same time. Imogen gave a face palm. I didn't tell him much, he hurried to add. Just that we were looking for the air piece. I, I wanted to see if he had any ideas. Jonah, Raynard's dad is on the air council. This is serious, I shouted. I know, I get it, Jonah said. He rubbed his face. But you guys, I don't think it's that big of a deal. I know we weren't supposed to chat about this outside the group, but Raynor's a good guy, really. I know he'll keep our secret. Like hell he will, Sophia shouted. Jonah, Raynor's not a good guy. He is. He just needs to change, Jonah protested. He'll do what's best for me. We belong together. Holy hell, it was like talking to Mia. Do you understand the situation you've put us all in? I asked him. We're all at risk now, because someone we can't trust knows we're messing with the prophecy. I can trust Raynor. I can, Jonah insisted weakly. Did you tell yourself that before you found out he was cheating on you or after? I asked. I didn't mean to let that slip, but out it came. Everything got really quiet. Jonah's lower lip wobbled, and he said, Raynor promised he wouldn't do it again. Open your eyes, I shouted. He's probably out there fucking some other guy right now. Liam, Sophia said as a signal for me to calm down, but I didn't hear her. This was an emergency situation. Sophia and I were already in hot water due to this case, if the elders found out we were involved in the prophecy on top of it, 
it was all over. All because Jonah trusted the wrong person. Jonah's hurt turned to anger. He balled his hands up into fists and he said, Stop judging me for who I want to be with. It's none of your business. You're my friend, so it is my business. You need to realize that Raynar is an abusive jerk and start looking to the people who really love you. I gestured to myself, Sophia, and Imogen. You guys don't get it, Jonah screamed. You and Sophia have each other, and Imogen has Cade, but I have no one. I'm completely alone. Give it time, Jonah. He's out there, I said. I'm sick of being lonely, Jonah's voice cracked, and tears started beating the bottom of his eyelids. I'm so tired of always thinking I'm never going to find someone. I'd rather be with someone who hurts me than be by myself. You can't do that, Jonah. You need to learn how to be okay with being alone, I insisted. You're 21 freaking years old. What the fuck's the rush? Easy for you to say now that you're not pining away for Sophia every hour of the day, he shot back at me. That's not fair, I responded viciously. You're so lucky. You have someone you'd risk everything to be with. You know what I'd give to have that kind of love? I'd die to have it, he said desperately. You've got to be happy with yourself first, I repeated. Jonah didn't understand. But he hadn't been through what I'd been through in the past couple of months. He'd spent his entire life being rejected by his parents, his sister, and everyone else around him. Imogen, Sophia, and I were pretty much his only friends. If not for us, he truly wouldn't have anyone besides Squeaks. But what he didn't know is that if he really loved himself, he wouldn't have to go seeking that approval from other people, the validation that he mattered. I didn't know what I had to do to get that through to him. He wanted to be liked so badly, and that need was killing him. How can I be happy with myself if I can't get Raynar to love me? Anyone to love me, Joda asked. Love isn't frickin' earned. When are you gonna get that through your head? I asked. Shut the fuck up, Liam, he snapped at me. My temper broke. I was so done with this shit. The only people you find attractive are the people who treat you like shit, I yelled. You're so used to your parents abusing you and pushing you around, you think it's love when your boyfriend does the same. Jonas swung. I acted on instinct, ducked and swung back. Imogen and Sophia screamed as Jonah and I started landing punches. He kicked my legs out from under me and I fell backward. Jonah got on top of me, but I grabbed him by the shirt and tossed him off. We rolled on the ground for a few minutes, tossing blows while the girls shouted at us to stop. Jonah and I usually fist fought when we got into it, but this was different. I could really tell he was hurting this time. So I let him take his hurt out on the closest thing he could, me, while trading some of my own frustration back. Eventually, he got me in a headlock. We stayed on the ground while I struggled to get out of it, but it was a no-go. My body didn't have anything left to give. Give up, Liam! I'm stronger than you! Jonah shouted. He had me, but I'd made my point. I kicked him to let him know I was tapping out, and he let me go. I rolled away and onto my knees while Jonah got to his feet. The two of us panted for air. We hadn't hit hard enough to really hurt each other, but there'd be bruises. You two are fucking ridiculous, Imogen shouted. I wiped blood off my mouth. Sophia looked between Jonah and I and shook her head, speechless. There were the sound of heavy hoofbeats. Squeaks barged between us. She head-butted Jonah until he was against the wall, then put her face at his eye level. They seemed to be communicating silently, which was surprising to me. I didn't know Jonah had gained the ability to speak telepathically with Squeaks yet. It had to have been recently. Guess that was one more thing he'd been keeping from us. We couldn't hear what Squeaks was saying, but the message was clear. I could see the line being drawn in her expression and how her form tensed as she continued to stare at her elementi. Jonah's eyes narrowed as he gazed at Squeaks. Fine. You want me to pick between you and him? Done. Jonah pushed Squeaks out of the way and stomped toward the door. He wrenched it open and left it hanging as he headed down the staircase. Squeaks' head dropped low. 
She seemed completely heartbroken, her beak hanging open as she stared at the spot where Jonah had left. Essis jumped out of Sophia's arms and scuttled to her, laying a paw on her cheek. Sassy left Imogen's side and sat next to Squeaks' front leg, leaning against it. Thick tears dropped out of Squeaks' eyes and splashed onto the floor as she let out a mournful cry for Jonah to come back. Chapter 16 Over the next few days, the tension in the air seemed to wane, but it didn't completely go away. I didn't think it ever would, even after the trial. Even if we won. But I had Liam, and that was all that mattered. On Wednesday, I stayed behind after intermediate coigny magic. Haley bumped my shoulder on her way out of the room, then lowered her voice to hiss in my ear. It was only a matter of time before everyone knew about you and Mito. You owe me one for not ratting you out. I didn't get a chance to respond before she tossed her dark hair over her shoulder and breezed out of the room. Haley spoke it like some sort of threat, but I did my best to ignore her. I approached Doya. Doya sat at the desk at the front of the room, flipping through papers and acting like I wasn't there. Naomi sat curled at her feet. I cleared my throat, and Doya finally looked up at me. She wore a sour look on her face like normal. Good. I could handle normal. I didn't need any more surprises. Madam Doya, I started slowly, unsure of how to say this to her face. Essis placed a comforting hand on my arm. I just wanted to thank you. She raised a curious eyebrow. Thank me? I ran my fingers through Essis' hair. I know you helped Chief Maito convince the council to give us a trial. So, um, thank you. Doya stopped rifling through papers. She spoke in a cold tone I couldn't read. Yes, well, unfortunately, it's all I can do. So you support us? I asked. Doya sucked her cheeks in. I wouldn't go that far, Sophia. What you're doing is dangerous, but it's clear that nothing I say will change your mind. I flashed back to the warning she'd given me before, when Haley told her something was going on between Liam and me. Doya was right. There was nothing she could say to change my mind. She sighed. That said, I don't believe this is worthy of a death sentence. You are not the first couple to challenge the rules, and you won't be the last. She spoke in her usual harsh tone, but her words communicated something entirely different. It was hard to wrap my head around. Doya seemed like the kind of person who played everything by the book. To challenge the other elders? Well, maybe she had a bigger heart than I thought. She leaned forward and folded her hands. Just know this, Sophia. I helped get you this trial, but I cannot change the outcome of it. The rest of the Elder Council are very set in their ways. They truly fear the extinction of their houses and their magic if inter-house relationships become mainstream. So I suggest you take your time between now and the trial to come up with a damned good defense. I opened my mouth to tell her I loved Liam, and that should be enough. But she held her hand up to stop me like she could already sense what I was about to say. Love is not enough, Doya said. Not for the elders. You'll need to use logic with them. I nodded, though I wanted to argue. Even the elders had emotions. But what she was saying was clear. Thank you for the advice. Doya turned back to her papers. I expected her to say more, but several seconds of silence passed. She looked up to me with raised eyebrows. I think we're done here, Sophia. I can't protect you any further. That's okay, I said honestly. I'll handle it myself. I hope you do, she replied. I'd hate to see your magic go to waste. I left her room feeling conflicted. 
Her tone suggested she couldn't be bothered by any of this. But her actions and words were the exact opposite. She seemed like she actually cared, but didn't want to admit it. Almost like she felt guilty to support me. I shook it off. At least she'd helped get us the trial. And that was all I could ask of her. A week passed, and I was already feeling accustomed to our new routine. Imogen met me after intermediate coigny magic and walked me to the commons while we waited for Liam to meet us after basket weaving. Squeaks curled up in front of the couch we sat in, but Jonah was nowhere nearby. He came and went with Imogen, but there was still some tension between him, Squeaks, and Liam. I miss you guys, Imogen said, resting her head on my shoulder. Essis and Sassy chased each other around at our feet. They tried to get Squeaks to play, but she rested her head on the ground and stared off into the distance, like she didn't even feel their little feet bouncing over her. I know, I said to Imogen. You barely spend any time around the castle anymore, she complained. And when you're here, you're in class. I'm here now, I said. Imogen sat up straight and glanced around the room. No one was close enough to hear us. I want to know what's been going on with you and Liam. Spare no detail. I snickered. I already told you about our date. Imogen swooned. And it sounded so romantic. I forgot to tell you he made me a blanket. It was really sweet. He wrapped it around my shoulders and everything. Imogen wiggled her eyebrows. I know what that means. Her eyes caught something across the room. I turned to see Cade had entered with a few of his Navita buddies. They were headed straight toward the ping pong table. Hold on, I'll be right back. Imogen hurried over to Cade, who looked thrilled to see her. He wrapped an arm around her shoulder and brought her in for a kiss. While they chatted, Liam entered the commons and sat beside me. A few people looked our way, but we ignored them. I slid my fingers into his. He looked exhausted, but he squeezed me back. How was basket weaving? I asked. Liam shrugged. Good, I guess, and coigny magic. I laughed. Same as always, it gets pretty heated in there. He smirked. Pun intended. Yep. I scooted closer to him. He didn't really look at me. He kept his eyes on the TV, like he had something else on his mind. I had a vague idea of what, but I didn't know how to bring up the topic. He'd gone to therapy earlier today, and he always seemed a little bothered afterward. I decided to just dive in. How's therapy going? Liam took a deep breath and looked at me. His features softened as he drank me in. It's helping. My chest warmed. Really? That's good. Yeah, I guess. He shrugged, like he wasn't really willing to talk about it. It's helping me manage. But, Sophia... My heart sank, suddenly turning cold in my chest. I could feel whatever he was about to say wasn't good. My mouth felt dry when I said, What? Liam took a deep breath. There's something my therapist and I talked about that I think you should know. Oh? My voice came out cool, but I was imagining the worst. Liam dropped his gaze and lowered his voice. I don't know how to say this. At the beginning of the semester, I swam out to the middle of the ocean, and I tried to drown myself. Like, a lot. Several times, as a matter of fact. I don't know if I understood what I was doing at the time. I just kind of held my breath underwater and tried to pass out. I inhaled a sharp breath. I was shook and didn't know what to say. But I didn't have to. Liam quickly cut in before I could get a word out. I couldn't do it, though, he said. I just thought it'd be nice, you know, if the ocean took me, but... He choked up a little. I could see how hard it was for him to admit it. I placed a hand on his and gently said, It happened, Liam, but it's over. Thank you for trusting me enough to tell me. He lifted his gaze to meet mine and nodded. 
I just didn't want to keep any secrets. I nodded back, but inside my guts were sinking. How hadn't I seen how low Liam had fallen? Why hadn't I done something about it then? I didn't press any further. I'm glad you're doing better. Liam resituated himself and wrapped an arm around my shoulder. He dragged me close and pressed a kiss to the top of my head. I am. I really am. Imogen returned and playfully kicked my foot. Okay, lovebirds, who wants to play a round of- She cut off, and her eyes darted to the TV. She quickly grabbed the remote and turned up the volume. Did they just say Elder Kim's familiar died? We have confirmed that two other Navita Elder's familiars are sick. Names are not being released at this time, the news anchor was saying. Imogen's face went paper white. Elder Kim is Navita. If his familiar died, he doesn't have long. The room seemed to quiet as all eyes turned to the newscast. Even our familiars stopped playing to watch. The screen switched to another area of the newsroom, where three people sat around a table, one woman and two men. They looked like political commentators. Look, the woman said, we've known for months that this is a problem. The question is, when is it going to stop? What are the elders going to do about it? I completely agree with you, but I think we all know what needs to be done, the man on her right said. It's clear where this disease originated from. If we get rid of the source, we get rid of the disease. What exactly are you suggesting, Mr. Brown? The other guy asked. Isn't it obvious, Mr. Foster? Brown said, straightening his tie. He looked to be Yapluma, or perhaps Navita. It was harder to tell without their familiars on screen. But he had all the pride and confidence on his face of a Kawigny. Familiars such as these don't just fall ill, not without some sort of catalyst. It's obviously coming from the weakest in the tribe and working its way up. My jaw dropped. Was he seriously blaming innocent people for this? Clearly, someone was targeting elders' familiars, and the weakest elementi were the ones being summoned to the gallows. Foster opened his mouth to say something, but the woman in the middle cut him off. You make a good point, she said. Familiars everywhere are getting sick. But where's the evidence, Miss Rivera? Foster cut in. We have to track it back to patient zero before we could say for sure. Rivera raised an eyebrow. That'd be impossible at this point. What Mr. Brown is saying makes sense, does it not? The table fell silent as Foster stared at the two of them. Well, yes. I'm not saying that I don't agree with you. So you do agree? Brown pressed. The fact is, some familiars are more equipped to handle these kinds of things. Their bodies are just stronger, better. Those that aren't are out there running around spreading this disease from one familiar to the next. We need to invoke a herd immunity clause. Are you suggesting some sort of high-level quarantine? Rivera asked, already looking like she agreed with the idea. Absolutely, Brown said proudly. It would certainly be the best way to test this theory. He can't be serious, I hissed, while the commentators continued to argue about the best course of action. Both Liam and Imogen looked horrified. They're suggesting segregation, not quarantine. Can they even do that? Imogen asked. Liam huffed. If the elders buy into it, why not? Imogen crossed her arms and scowled at the TV. It's ridiculous. Who decides which familiars are weak and which ones aren't? Not to mention familiars of all species are getting sick. Liam growled under his breath. Their theory is so off the wall, it's sick. Foster spoke again. If you're going to go that far, why not just blame the weakest elementi for starting this whole thing out of jealousy or some type of plot to overthrow the elders? Why don't we? Brown said quickly. Foster's face fell. A wonderful Siri, Mr. Foster. I think you might be on to something. That's not what I- Someone's clearly behind it, Brown continued. We just have to ask ourselves, who has the motive?
I shot to my feet and scooped Essis up in my arms, then tossed my bag over my shoulder. I can't keep listening to this. These people are idiots. Imogen and Liam quickly stood and followed behind me out of the room, with Sassy and Squeaks close behind. Imogen waved to Cade before slipping out of the commons. I shook my head as I started up the stairs. I can't believe they're blaming innocent people without any evidence. Imogen held tightly onto Sassy. I think I get it. What? I asked, totally baffled. No, not that I agree or anything, she said. But if you listen to Jonah talk about his psych class long enough, I get the thinking behind it. They're scared, and they need someone to blame, so they're going after the easiest target. People who aren't like them. It's not right. They shouldn't be allowed to say stuff like that, Liam said, fuming. They're political commentators, not journalists, Imogen pointed out. None of us mentioned where we were going, but it was like our feet already knew where to take us. We reached the Anity dorms and climbed the steps. Liam fell down onto one of the couches, and Squeaks lay on the floor beneath him. She nudged his hand so he'd pet the top of her head. I don't know what to think of this, I admitted, as I sat with Essis in my lap. It's sick. Imogen sat and petted Sassy. She chewed her bottom lip. You don't think this is what the prophecy meant, do you? What do you mean? Liam asked. Imogen nodded her hands together. Well, the Navita part said that no Hawkeye shall survive if the weakest refuse to bend. The room went completely silent as we contemplated the words. That can't be it, I finally said. Why would the ancestors want us to turn on each other like this? We've already turned on each other, Liam mumbled. So quiet, I barely heard him. He sat up straighter when Imogen and I looked at him. Toakwa against Kowigny. That's what the whole prophecy's about anyway. So why would we divide ourselves further? I asked. I refused to believe this is what the ancestors wanted. There has to be a meaning we're missing. Imogen pressed her lips together in thought. Shawana said we could change the prophecy, didn't she? I sighed. Yes, but if this is really what it talks about, that means it's coming true. The question is, can we stop it? Liam set his feet on the floor and rested his elbows on his knees. He stared at the floor like he was thinking hard. We can't stop now. We're too far in. There's only one piece left. Agreed, Imogen said quickly. Shawana said we needed to find all the pieces to get the bigger picture. You could be right, Sophia. Some of the tension in my shoulders eased. We can still stop this once we have the air piece, Imogen said confidently. I dropped my gaze. That's going to be tough without Jonah. Squeaks huffed at the sound of his name. Liam scratched her head and said, He'll come around. Meanwhile, we can still work on getting that meeting with the Navita elders. Imogen frowned. That's what I wanted to talk to you guys about. She paused before continuing slowly. I... I tried to get a meeting with them, but they won't see me. I even approached Elder Kim while he was having lunch in Kinpago, but he brushed me off. No one's taking me seriously. Even if they did, the Navita Council is down for the count right now. Liam's face paled. So what do we do? My stomach felt hollow, but I knew there was only one thing we could do. We find that last piece, and then we change the fate of the tribe. Saturday morning came, and I didn't want to move. Being wrapped in Liam's arms made everything feel like it would all be okay if just for a moment. Liam stirred beside me, then his eyes slowly fluttered open. His gaze traveled over my face, and a smile crept across his lips. I pushed my hair from my eyes. What? He leaned closer to press his lips to my forehead, warming me all the way down to my toes. 
I love waking up next to you every morning. This is how it should be. I curled up closer to him, resting my head beneath his chin. It is, Liam. I don't ever want it to end. It doesn't have to, he whispered, but his voice cracked. I could tell he was thinking about the trial. I drew away from him to look him in the eyes. Liam, I think we need to talk about what we're going to do. He tilted his head in question. It's been a few weeks already since we were subpoenaed, and we still don't have a lawyer, I pointed out. How did it go talking to your dad? Liam's face fell. I've talked to him, but... What? I asked. It doesn't sound like his lawyer's going to take on the case, he admitted. I sighed and plopped my head back on the pillow. There have to be other lawyers in town. Someone will take our case. Liam went quiet, like he was thinking. I didn't know the first thing about finding a lawyer. Maybe it was time to hit up all the law offices in Kinpago. Unless... I pushed myself up to my elbows to look down at Liam. We should talk to my grandparents. They know a lot of people. Liam smiled. You want me to meet your grandparents? I poked him in the side and giggled. Yes. Besides, I need to see them. It's been weeks, and I need to talk to them about what's been going on. Okay. Liam sat up, groaning a little as he did. Essa stirred from where he slept at Liam's feet. We'll go see them today. Breakfast first. I ran my fingers through my tangled hair. I'm going to take a quick shower. I'll meet you downstairs. Liam nodded, but he made no effort to start getting ready for the day. I gathered a fresh set of clothes and slipped out of the room. As I started down the hall toward the bathroom, Liam's dad stepped out of his room with Tatum, his grizzly bear familiar, behind him. Luanu's eyes caught mine, and a look of shock hit his face, like he was surprised to see me alone. I dropped my gaze and reached for the bathroom door, but he stopped me. Sophia, can I have a word? he asked softly. My hands started to shake a little, so I held tighter to my pile of clothes in my arms. Sure, what's up? I was surprised at how steady my voice came out. Luanu took several steps and stopped beside me. He crossed his hands in front of himself and closed his eyes for a moment, taking a deep breath. I wanted to apologize. The words hit me like a tsunami. I swayed on my feet, but I kept my cool. He looked me straight in the eye as he spoke. What I did, what the entire Tawakwa Council did to you and Liam last semester was wrong. I was only trying to do what was best for my people. But I need you to know something, Sophia. The hall fell silent. He took another deep breath. I know I may never gain your trust, but I'm speaking honestly when I say that you're a part of our family now, and I'm going to protect you because my son loves you. I was rendered speechless. Liam's dad always came off a little scary to me, and it was even worse after all those secrets came out last semester. But I couldn't find a shred of dishonesty in his tone or his features. Thank you. I said, though my voice came out smaller than I intended. Luanu and I stood there for another few seconds, just staring at each other. Then he straightened, gave me a friendly nod, and continued down the hall. Tatum mimicked the nod, then followed behind his elementi. I hurried into the bathroom and shut the door behind me, then sat on the closed toilet lid to process what had just happened. I knew Liam's father had changed his mind about us, he had, after all, helped us get the trial. But I never thought I'd hear him apologize to me. Had he meant what he'd said? About me being part of his family now? I hoped so, because I wanted to be. Liam and I arrived at my grandparents' by lunchtime. We came in the flying carriage, which helped conceal us so that no one would notice a Toakwa in the middle of the Coigny village. We didn't want to risk anything with the tension surrounding missing familiars and our public relationship. Besides, 
We didn't need to give the media anything else they could twist into rumors. We arrived in the back alley and hurried through the lawn toward the door. Grandma opened it before we even knocked, like she'd heard us arrive. Sophia, she cried, throwing her arms around me and squashing Esses between us. She pulled away, then hugged Liam. He seemed shocked, but he hugged her back. Grandma dragged the two of us into the house, then glanced up and down the alleyway before she shut the door. We're so glad to see you. We've been so worried. I'm okay, I assured her. Grandma, this is Liam. It's so great to meet you. Why don't we all have a seat? She gestured to the kitchen table. Grandpa came into the room when he heard the sound of our voices. He had a worried look fixed on his face. I'm fine, Grandpa, I said, and he relaxed. Grandma was already digging in the fridge for food. She never let me go hungry. Liam exchanged a quick glance with me, like he didn't know the proper protocol with my grandparents. I sat, and he followed my lead. Essis bounded over toward the fridge next to my grandma to peek curiously inside. She handed him a deviled egg, and he smiled proudly. He brought it back to the table and sat in my lap while he munched on it. Grandpa, I said, this is Liam. Grandpa extended a hand out to Liam, and he shook it. Alan, he introduced. Alan, sir, I've heard so much about you, Liam said. Grandma smirked as she returned to the table with potato salad, deviled eggs, and a bag of dinner rolls. And we've heard very little about you. She raised an eyebrow at me, but I could tell she was only teasing. I sighed. You both know why I couldn't tell you about him. Grandpa spoke gently from across the table. Sophia, you don't owe us an explanation. I relaxed. I wanted to tell you guys, but things have been crazy. As long as you're okay, Grandpa said. That's what matters. Grandma placed plates, forks, and cups in front of all of us, then set a gallon of milk on the table. Finally, she sat. Since I hadn't moved at all, she started dishing up potato salad on my plate. Essis' eyes widened and he licked his lips. We've heard so many rumors, Grandma said. Yeah, well, don't trust them, I said. I couldn't keep my eyes off Liam as I spoke. The truth is, Liam and I are in love, and the rest of it is just... It's shit, Liam finished for me. Grandma and Grandpa both laughed. Oh, dear, Grandma said softly. We never did trust a single rumor. So, tell us what really happened. Well... I didn't even know where to start. I guess it all started when I came to Arenda Academy. I looked to Liam, and he stared back at me with soft eyes. He continued for me. The school sent me to go pick her up, and the rest is history. I chuckled. Well, there were a few bumps along the way. There always are, Grandpa said, smiling. Liam thought I was a pain in the ass at first. I smirked at him. He couldn't hide his smile. Yeah, okay, maybe a little. We tried to stay away from each other, I said. But we couldn't. Liam gazed at me with such admiration that I could feel my heart melting in my chest. That's because we were meant to be. Grandma grabbed Grandpa's hand from under the table and pressed her other hand to her heart. She looked like she might be tearing up. You can't fight those kinds of feelings. No, I agreed, understanding far too well. You can't. This potato salad is wonderful, Liam said, digging in. I was glad to see him eating again. Grandma smiled. Thank you. If we can help at all, you just say something. I could tell she wasn't saying it to be nice. She truly meant it. Well... There is one thing, I admitted. As you've probably heard, our relationship is going to a trial. And we could really use a good lawyer. Grandpa leaned back in his chair with a furrowed brow. He pressed his fingers to his lips. This could be one of the biggest cases in decades. Most lawyers in town might be too cautious to take it on. 
If they don't win, it could ruin their career. And if they do? Liam asked. Grandpa sat up straighter. If they do, it could change everything. We'd have to find someone who's willing to take that risk. Grandma sighed. You know who we have to call, Alan. No, no, Grandpa said. No one will take this case seriously if he's on it. No one will take this case at all if he doesn't, she pointed out. Who? I asked, glancing between the two of them. Grandma turned to me. There's a man by the name of Ludwig Vanderbilt. He retired from law about 20 years ago, but he might be willing to take on your case. That's great, I said, but Liam looked skeptical. Why wouldn't anyone take us seriously? He asked. Grandpa took a deep breath. Well, the last case he fought, he lost. He was representing a boy who was said to be mixed house. The mother was put to death, and the child was excommunicated from the tribe. What about the father? Liam asked. The mother was Navida, but the paternity test showed the child's father was Coigny, Grandma explained. Without the father's DNA, it was impossible to prove who he was, and the mother wouldn't give him up. Grandpa lowered his voice, like just the mere thought of the trial perturbed him. Rumor had it, Vanderbilt fathered the child himself. I gasped. He fought for his own son, and he lost? Grandma and Grandpa shared a nod. How come he was never convicted? Liam asked curiously. Grandpa shrugged. By the time the rumors started, the case was already closed and the boy was long gone. They never reopened the case. Vanderbilt rarely comes out of his house now. Would he come out to help us? I asked hopefully. Grandma stood, then scribbled something on a piece of paper that was sitting on the counter. She turned around and handed it to me. I guess you're going to have to find out for yourself. I glanced down at the paper and saw that it was an address right here in the Coigny village. Well, Liam, it looks like we might have ourselves a lawyer. Vanderbilt's house was on the outskirts of the Coigny village, nestled far back between two mountain peaks. It looked like one of the oldest houses in the area, but it still had the red brick of all the other buildings in the village. We climbed up rickety wooden steps, and Essis reached out to ring the doorbell. Floorboards creaked from behind the door, but the footsteps stopped just on the other side. I expected to hear the sound of the doorknob twisting, but it never came. I glanced to Liam with a hopeless look. He sighed and reached past me to press the doorbell again. I noticed movement in the window as the curtains were brushed aside, and I caught a blue eye rimmed in age lines staring back at us. As soon as I caught the eye, it was gone. Quickly, before we lost his attention, I pounded my fist on the door. Mr. Vanderbilt? An old, gruff voice came muffled through the door. Whatever you're selling, I'm not buying. We're not selling anything, Liam replied. We actually have an offer for you, I said. The floorboard creaked again. I'm retired. I need nothing. Heat began to rise to my skin. If Vanderbilt couldn't help us, no one would. We needed a lawyer if we had any chance of winning our case. I took a deep breath to calm my fire. What if you could change the laws regarding interhouse relationships? Silence. Also, a very large sum of money for your time, Liam added. The door popped open a crack. All I could make out was that blue eye and a shag of gray hair atop his head. You're that couple, aren't you? The Toaqua and Coigny the newspapers have been talking about. You won the cup last year. Yes, I said proudly, while trying to hold on to Essis, who was pushing out of my arms. I lost my grip on him, and he jumped down and bolted straight for the door. Vanderbilt tried to block the crack with his foot, but Essis clawed at his pant leg and squeezed inside. Essis, I cried. Vanderbilt sighed and opened the door further. 
I guess I have no choice but to let you in now, do I? Liam and I exchanged a gaping glance as Vanderbilt turned and left the door open for us. I finally got a look at him and saw that he wore a plaid shirt and gray suspenders. He was shorter than I was, and though he looked very old, there was something about him that suggested he was younger than he seemed. Late fifties, maybe early sixties? We stepped inside, and it was like walking into an abandoned newspaper factory. The shades were drawn on every window, and dust layered most of the surfaces. Stacks and stacks of newspapers filled his living room and lined his stairway. An old TV sat across from a tattered couch, and I smelled the faint scent of lemongrass tea. Ah, there you are, Vanderbilt said as he reached up to Essis. Essis sat on top of one of the many stacks of newspapers, which seemed like skyscrapers piled next to each other. Some of the stacks were even taller than Liam was. Vanderbilt held Essis gently in his hands, then extended them out to me. I took Essis and curled him up in my arms. Bad Essis, I said. We don't run off. He dropped his ears. Vanderbilt took a seat on the couch, causing the hound that was lying there to perk up like he'd just been startled awake. The familiar inched forward until his head was rested on Vanderbilt's leg. He ran his hands through the dog's fur, then looked up to us. Why have you come here? We need a lawyer, Liam started, but Vanderbilt held up a hand to cut him off. I'm aware of your situation, he said. The question is, why did you come to me? I hesitated, then stepped forward. Mr. Vanderbilt, we can't fight this case alone, but other lawyers have already refused to take on our case. We need someone who understands our position. Vanderbilt huffed. And what is your position? We're in love, I answered automatically. Vanderbilt shook his head. Not good enough. It should be. I said sternly, trying not to lose my temper. Haven't you ever been in love? Vanderbilt frowned. I never said it wasn't good enough for me. I'm not the judge of your case, Miss Henley. My nostrils flared, and Liam quickly took over. Look, Mr. Vanderbilt, this case isn't just about us. It's about the entire tribe. We aren't the first interhouse couple, but we were lucky enough to get a trial. People have died for this kind of thing, and they shouldn't have to. If we win this thing, we all win. Vanderbilt went silent, but his hands shook in his lap. No, no. I'm afraid I can't help you. I'm retired. So come out of retirement, I pleaded. Laws have changed in the last 20 years, he said. I'm not brushed up on anything current. It was a total lie. He had every newspaper printed in Kinpago for at least the last two decades. He'd been keeping up. And I wasn't leaving here without a lawyer. I shoved Essis into Liam's hands, then knelt beside Mr. Vanderbilt. He looked into my eyes with emotions I couldn't read. I thought I spotted conflict, like he wanted to help us but didn't think it'd help. Mr. Vanderbilt, this case can go one of two ways. I held up a finger. One, we lose. Liam and I are imprisoned, or whatever the Elder Council decides to do with us, and everyone goes on with their merry lives. Or two, we convince the Elder Council that their laws are flawed. Interhouse couples and interhouse children will no longer be prosecuted for what they are. The ones who've already been banished can return. A sparkle entered his eyes when I said that. Other elementi have already shown their support, I said. Now all we need is you. Because without you, we don't stand a chance. Vanderbilt just stared at me, breathing in and out without a sound. I couldn't read his features anymore. At least a minute passed as I waited for his response. But it never came. Finally, I stood, feeling frustrated. Come on, Liam. We'll have to find someone else who can help us. I grabbed Liam's hand, 
but I stopped and whirled toward Vanderbilt before we reached the door. I couldn't leave here without saying what I really felt. You know what? I heard that you fought for this kind of thing. If you've given up, you're a coward. I hope the ancestors are proud. Just as we reached the door, Vanderbilt stood. Wait. Liam and I paused and turned back to him. Vanderbilt dropped his head. The ancestors are not proud. I already know that. And you're right. I have given up. But maybe, maybe I can make up for it. So you'll take the case? Liam asked breathlessly. Vanderbilt nodded. Yes, I'll take the case. I squealed. I didn't even know what I was doing when I rushed over to Vanderbilt and threw my arms around his neck. Thank you, Mr. Vanderbilt. You won't regret it. He frowned. I hope not, Miss Henley. Another week passed, and we hadn't heard from Vanderbilt at all. It was the end of November, and only a month until our trial. Do you think he was just trying to get rid of us? I asked Liam. We were sitting in the Anichi dorms, chilling with Imogen, Sassy, and Squeaks the following Sunday night. I could barely focus on schoolwork all week because I was worrying about the trial. I wanted to help Vanderbilt build his case, but I didn't know what he needed from us. I'm sure he's doing all he can to prepare, Liam said. Yeah, Imogen agreed. He won't just leave you hanging. I frowned. You didn't meet the guy. Squeaks made a coughing sound from where she lay between the couches. I glanced over to her. She looked even worse than she did when Jonah and her got in that fight. Okay, has anyone talked to Jonah? I asked, changing the subject. Squeaks clearly misses him. I've tried, Imogen said. Me too, Liam admitted. But he made it clear he's not ready to talk. Imogen frowned. He seems to think I'm taking sides. I told him that wasn't true, but... Squeaks coughed again, this time more violently than the last. It turned into a full coughing fit, and everyone immediately jumped into action. We were all at her side in a second. Liam smacked her back to help her, but she didn't seem to feel it. She tried to stand, but her legs were too shaky to hold her up. She collapsed back onto the floor. Squeaks! Oh my god! I rested my hand on her, but I didn't know what to do. We didn't cover this kind of thing in medical care of familiars. Essis scrambled straight in front of her and took her beak in his paws. Sassy yipped in worry. Squeaks looked Essis straight in the eye, and her coughing slowed. We all breathed a sigh of relief and stepped back cautiously. Is she okay? I asked warily waiting for her to break out into another coughing fit. She didn't. She doesn't look well, Imogen said. We'd all noticed Squeaks looking worse and worse since the fight with Jonah, but I'd assumed it was depression that she wouldn't recover from until she and Jonah made up. But now I was starting to wonder. Do you think... Liam hesitated. Could she have the familiar illness? I bit my lower lip. I don't know. Coughing isn't a side effect, is it? And Essis tried to heal Medusa but couldn't. He's helping Squeaks. Squeaks relaxed on the floor, looking on the verge of sleep, but she still seemed weak. I was worried. All I could do was hope it wasn't what we thought it was. We should check on Jonah, I suggested. If Squeaks is ill, he won't be far behind. I'll go, Liam offered. We'll all go, I said but when I tried to help Squeaks to her feet, she just fell back down again. She was so tired that she couldn't even walk. My stomach sank to my feet. Liam's right, Imogen said while she gently stroked Squeaks' feathers. Two of them fell out and drifted onto the floor. Someone has to stay behind to watch Squeaks, and only one of us can get into the Yapluma dorms at a time without getting noticed. Okay, I agreed. Be quick, Liam. I'm worried. He nodded. I will be. Essis looked up at me with watery blue eyes. His face was fallen. 
Keep trying, buddy, I told him, and he turned back to Squeaks. The minutes stretched into an hour as we tried to comfort Squeaks. My stomach felt hollow and worsened as each minute passed. Essis powers seemed to help her at first, but they only took the edge off. Squeaks wasn't getting any better. Finally, we heard the sound of footsteps on the stairs. Relief flooded through me, but my heart fell when I saw that Liam was alone. Did you find him? Imogen asked. Liam dropped his shoulders. He wasn't in his room, so I asked around. I guess he went to stay with his parents this weekend. What? I practically screamed. After the way they treated him last time? Yeah, which means he's hit rock bottom, Liam said. We need to go get him. I was already on my feet. Liam nodded and said firmly, Hell yeah, we do. Let's go, guys. We tried to get Squeaks on her feet again, but she couldn't get up. Her head hung low, and her knees wobbled underneath her. Her hooves slipped and wouldn't support her weight. More feathers fell from her neck and coated the floor, exposing pink patches of skin. Imogen sent me a desperate look. Squeaks isn't going anywhere. I'll stay. You guys go get Jonah without me. Liam nodded quickly. He grabbed my hand and said, Come on, Pawi. I scooped up Essis, then followed behind Liam. The media was still swarming around the school, but we managed to slip through the evening shadows and get to our carriage unseen. It felt like an hour later that we arrived at the Yapluma village, but it must have been only 15 minutes. We pulled up outside a huge white house with endless windows and large Roman-style pillars on the front porch. I was relieved to see it was on the ground, unlike some of the other houses in the Yapluma village. I could see their lights hovering high above us in the night sky. Liam gave three forceful knocks on the door. It didn't open right away. Liam knocked again, harder this time. I was worried he was going to pound the door down. Eventually, the door opened. Jonah's dad, Jason, stood behind it. He immediately gave us a cold glare. What are you doing here? We're here to get Jonah, Liam said coldly. You can turn around and go right back to where you came from, Jason responded. He's not going anywhere. Liam's face got red, so I decided to step in. Squeaks is sick. She needs Jonah, I protested. And, Jason asked, it's none of my concern. We need to talk to him, I shouted. Lights came on from the houses next door. We were creating a scene, but I'd cause a riot if it meant getting Jonah back to school with us. Someone else appeared in the hallway. Squeaks is sick? It was Jonah. He didn't look well. He had dark bags under his eyes, and bits of hair were sticking out of his bun. He froze on the marble tile, his face paling. Yeah, so you need to come with us, Liam demanded. She can't even stand. Jonah went to move toward the door, but Jason blocked the way. I thought I told you that you're staying home for the weekend. I have to go back, Jonah said weakly. Squeaks needs me. She didn't need you all weekend, and suddenly you need to go running back. This is just a ruse so you can get fucked up with your degenerate loser friends, Jason shouted. Unless you want to get fucked up, move out of the fucking way, Liam said, voice rising. Jonah looked scared. His hands trembled at his sides. Look, we have class in the morning, I pleaded. Just let Jonah come back now, please. Jason still looked furious. Another figure appeared in the hallway, a woman. It was Jonah's mom, Joyce. Are you going back to school, Jonah, already? She asked. I have to go, Jonah said. Squeaks. Joyce sniffed, and she said, Fine, go. We're only your parents. We hardly see you anymore anyway. It's fine if we're lonely. One day your father and I will be dead, and then you'll wish you'd spent more time with us. Jonah didn't respond. He kept his head down and grabbed his coat on the way out. 
Jason didn't move from the door until Liam took a step forward. He obviously wasn't playing around. Jason barely moved out of the way, and Jonah squeezed past him. You owe us, Jonah! His father shouted from the doorway as we climbed into the carriage. Don't forget everything we've done for you! Jonah mumbled something under his breath, but I didn't catch it. As his ears perked up, though, like he'd heard, he glanced back to Jason and gave a low growl. Liam paused with his hand on the carriage door. He stared at Jonah in shock. Did you just say? Jonah crossed his arms from where he sat in the carriage. Forget it. No, I won't forget it. Liam climbed inside and sat beside me. He closed the carriage door and we started moving back toward the castle. You said you've been paying them back. Did you give them your tournament winnings? Jonah gazed out the carriage window, not meeting either of our gazes. I said forget it, Liam. It's none of your business. Jonah, you can't let them use you like this. Liam tried to stay calm, but I could hear the irritation in his tone. It's nothing, Jonah said, like he actually believed it. They just needed some help with some debt payments. If I didn't help, they were going to lose the house. I couldn't believe it. His parents treated him horribly. And now they were taking advantage of his cup winnings, too. Jonah, you need to- Liam started, but Jonah cut him off. Don't tell me what I need to do, Jonah snapped. I need to get to Squeaks. The rest of the carriage ride was quiet. When we returned to the castle, we led Jonah to the Anachi dorms. Squeaks hadn't moved, and Imogen had stayed at her side. Sassy sat far across the room, eyeing Squeaks with concern. It was probably best she kept her distance. We didn't want Sassy to get sick, too. Squeaks' eyes brightened when Jonah walked in the room, but she barely lifted her head. Imogen shot to her feet. Jonah! He hurried across the room and knelt beside Squeaks. He pressed his face to the side of hers. I'm so sorry, Squeakers. Squeaks took a deep breath, but she seemed too weak to do any more than that. I never should have started that fight, Jonah whispered, like they were the only two in the room. I wish I could take it all back. Squeaks nuzzled her head into his shoulder. He ran his hand down the back of her head, whispering things to her we couldn't hear. I slipped my fingers into Liam's and looked up at him. Do you think they'll be okay? Liam looked unsure. I hope so. I did too. We spent the rest of the evening in the Anachi dorms, keeping watch over our friends. Imogen and I slipped out for a few minutes to grab takeout from the dining hall since none of us had eaten dinner. When we returned, Jonah and Liam were playing video games on the console Jonah had snuck in a few weeks ago. Jonah hadn't said much this whole time, but he seemed to be loosening up once he was blowing people's heads off. Eventually, Liam and I had to leave. Squeaks couldn't move, so Jonah decided to stay in the Anachi dorms for the night. He spread out across one of the couches, where Squeaks lay beside him on the floor. Are you sure you don't want to get checked into the infirmary? Imogen asked him. Nah, we're already feeling better, aren't we, girl? Jonah rubbed Squeak's head. It was just a side effect of being away from each other so long. Okay, Liam said, but he sounded skeptical. As soon as we made it to the hall outside the Anachi dorms, I turned to Imogen and Liam. I think Jonah's lying. He's acting weird, that's for sure, Liam said. Look, all I know is I've only seen one thing Essis couldn't heal, and it's that disease that's been going around. I told them, squeezing Essis tight in my arms. Jonah and Squeaks could be risking spreading it. Imogen bit her lower lip. What? I asked. Something's on your mind. Well, I might have a theory, but we can't test it if Jonah and Squeaks are in quarantine, she admitted. They should be okay for tonight if they stay put. We'll meet after class tomorrow. Sound good? I frowned. I wanted to help them sooner. Fair enough. Monday morning, I watched the halls for Jonah, but I never saw him. 
I shouldn't have worried, considering I didn't usually see him between classes, but I couldn't help it. When classes finished for the day, Liam and I met up like usual. How's Jonah doing? I asked. I knew he'd checked on him this morning. I'm not sure, Liam admitted. I think he's worse than he's letting on. Did Imogen say where we were supposed to meet? I asked him. I don't think so, he replied. Just then, I heard Sassy's yip down the hallway. She trotted ahead of Imogen and weaved between other people milling around the hall. Imogen was waving us down, a notebook in her hands. When Sassy reached us, she circled around our feet. Imogen looked exhausted, like she'd been up reading all night. She was still wearing the same clothes she had on yesterday, and huge bags were underneath her eyes. Hey guys, I have information, but I need to grab a book from the library to be certain. It might have something that can confirm my theory about... She trailed off, then glanced around the hall to make sure no one was listening. Meet me upstairs in 15 minutes. Okay, I said. We'll see you soon. Liam was right. Jonah looked terrible. By now, half his hair was falling out of his bun. His eyes drooped and his lips looked chapped. He could barely manage to keep his eyes open. We'd brought him and Squeak's food, but they both refused to eat. I checked my watch as we waited for Imogen. Fifteen minutes passed, then half an hour. When my watch hit forty minutes, I'd had enough. I stood, as his eyes darted up to me. Guys, I'm worried about Imogen. She said she'd only be fifteen minutes. I'm sure she's fine, Jonah said in a bleary tone. It's only been like twenty minutes. It's been forty, I stated bluntly. Liam shot to his feet beside me. Let's go find her. I'm coming, Jonah groaned as he tried to get to his feet. Liam rushed over to him and placed a hand on his shoulder. He tried to get him to lie back down, but Jonah pushed his hands away. You're not well, Liam insisted. I'm fine, Jonah lied. There was no talking him out of it. Come on, I said quickly. We left Squeaks behind since she couldn't move. We only made it to the second floor when we spotted Bane climbing the stairs and heading straight for us. He looked relieved to see us. Where have you three been? I've been looking everywhere for you, Bane said breathlessly. What's wrong? Liam asked. But I could already sense what Bane was about to say. Bane's face went pale. I need you three to come to the hospital with me. There's been an incident with Miss Onild. Chapter 17 Professor, what's going on? I asked. Bane was walking down the hallway at a pace I'd never seen him take before. He was practically sprinting toward the hospital wing. Bane didn't answer me, which worried me. It was like every step I took increased the dread growing in my gut, like I already knew what had happened. At first I thought that Sassy had gotten the illness too, and now we had two sick familiars on our hands. But Bane turned away from the quarantine area as soon as we entered through the hospital doors. Stay as far away from the left side as possible. The quarantine is still being heavily enforced, Bane told us. Through a clear plastic curtain I could see the quarantine area. There were so many sick familiars inside that they'd crowded all the rooms. Some of them, along with their elementi, were in beds that lined the hallways. There just wasn't enough room for all the sick students. I couldn't imagine what the main hospital in Kinpago looked like right now. Some of the familiars and elementi lying in bed had long white sheets draped over them. I paled at the sight. Had the morgue already run out of room for bodies? Bane took a right and headed down a long hallway. I knew how the hospital wing was laid out. I'd been here enough. I was in here for weeks after Nashoma died because Arenda Academy students were always sent here instead of the main hospital in town. Bane was taking us to the surgery ward. He burst through the doors. I heard the wheels of a gurney first. Sounds of shouts and loud voices could be heard coming from down the hall. Everyone out of the way, a doctor called at the head of the gurney. Two nurses on either side ran as they pushed the gurney toward the operating unit. We pressed ourselves to the wall to let the patient pass. Then I recognized her. Imogen. 
She was stretched out on the gurney with heavy gauze wrapped around her neck, except the gauze was soaked with blood. Long, jagged gashes ran from her cheek all the way down to her shoulder, as if something had tried to take her head off. Several puncture marks were littered throughout her body, and a nurse pushing the gurney held bloody gauze around her middle, as if trying to keep organs in. On a smaller gurney being pushed behind her by familiars was Sassy. She looked as bad as Imogen did, with ragged cuts running through her side. She was in her kitsune form, like she'd been trying to protect Imogen and passed out in the process before she had time to change back to a fox. Blood dripped from both gurneys onto the floor, creating a trail. Imogen, Sophia screamed. She went to follow the doctors through the operating doors, but Bane grabbed her and held her back. She fought against him as Imogen and Sassy disappeared into surgery, tears streaming down her face. Essis reached out his arms from within Sophia's grasp, as if he wanted to go after Imogen and try to heal her. He squeezed out of Sophia's arms and ran forward, but the surgery doors closed before he could get inside. Sorry, little one, we can't let you back there a nurse said to Essis. She picked him up and put him back in Sophia's trembling hands. Jonah was sobbing. He had his hands fisted in his hair and his back against the wall as if he needed it to hold himself up. I was speechless, numb. My jaw hung open and it stayed like that. I couldn't feel anything, couldn't hear any of the sounds of the hospital around me. I could only see things in one giant blur, it was like I was in shock. When Imogen was gone, Sophia yanked herself away from Bane. What happened? Bane gave us a sad look. It appears that Miss Arnold was walking alone in the halls when she was attacked, most likely by some rogue magical creature, possibly associated with whoever is responsible for the illness and the missing familiars. Professor Fawn heard her scream before she and her unicorn arrived to help, but by then her assailant had fled. Bane shook his head. I thought she would know better. No one should be walking alone in times like this. She had good reason to, I shouted. Like hell, was Bane really blaming Imogen for whatever had happened to her? Be that as it may... Bane acted like he was about to launch into a lecture, but the murderous faces we were all giving him must have changed his mind because he said, The task force is investigating the crime scene now. It appears she was jumped near the library. Can we see her? Sophia pleaded. Bane shook his head. Not until she's out of surgery, I'm afraid. That is, I'm sorry to say, if she makes it out. Her injuries were very extensive. Sophia let out a sob. I reached my arm out and pulled her to my side. What can we do? There's nothing you can do but wait, Bane said. Her family has been given a room. I suggest you join them. Bane guided us into a small waiting room. Jonah was gasping behind me, as if trying to take deep breaths so he didn't lose it. Inside were Imogen's parents, along with all four of her brothers. Her mother and father were talking with a doctor quietly, with terrified expressions and frozen mouths. Her brothers, even the young ones, stared at the wall, completely silent and petrified. I think it might be best if we called in a medicine man or woman for your daughter, the doctor said gently, and he reached out and put a hand on Mrs. Onild's shoulder. Mrs. Onild sniffed and put a tissue to her nose. Yes, just, just in case. Jonah's sobs picked up in intensity, and I felt a heaviness weigh in my gut. Sophia looked confused about what a medicine man would do if there were doctors around, but I didn't go to explain. I didn't want to. The three of us jumped when the door behind us smacked into the wall. Cade was there with Ezra behind him. He was a total mess. His hair was wild and crazy, and his eyes were large and puffy. His face was wet. Tears continued to streak out of his bloodshot eyes. Arabelle was at his side, though she looked just as upset as he did, with her gaze wide and hair standing on end. Diami did what he could and put a wing around her for comfort. Cade was rambling and shaking. Ezra was trying to control him, but it wasn't working very well. 
I couldn't make out a word Cade was saying. Imogen's parents startled when they saw him. As they watched him break down, they started to cry harder. Sophia took initiative and launched herself on Cade. She held him tightly and didn't let him go, rocking him back and forth. Cade squeezed her and wept. From between them, Essis pressed his paws into Cade's side, working his healing power. After a few moments, Cade relaxed. When Sophia finally released him, Ezra was able to ease Cade into a chair. He sat in it with his head in his hand, staring straight ahead with trembling lips. He knew he was about to lose the love of his life. The horrifying reality that Imogen could die pressed in around me and made me feel like I was suffocating. This was real. She was in surgery right now, and if she didn't pull through... I was terrified. I wanted to yell and cry and scream. I wanted to go out there and find whatever had done this to Imogen and rip it to pieces. But then I saw Sophia and Jonah's tearful faces. They were seconds from crumbling. They didn't know what to do. My own feelings weren't important right now. I had to hold the team together or we'd all fall apart. Somebody had to lead them in a time like this. Jonah wasn't much help. He was still trembling. The only person I could depend on was Sophia. Soph, I need to talk to you outside, I told her. I grabbed her elbow and guided her out, shutting the door to the waiting room behind me. What was that about? Sophia asked. A medicine man can help, right? Imogen will be fine. I hesitated before I decided to tell her the truth. Medicine men often come in to deliver last rites, I said quickly, so that the spirit can be prepared to join the ancestors. Sophia put a hand over her mouth like she was trying to hold in a scream. It barely worked. She let out an inhuman sound before dissolving completely into a fit of tears. I had to grab her before she collapsed. Hey, Soph, Soph, stop, I told her. I grabbed her shoulders and shook her roughly. You need to pull yourself together. Squeaks is still sick. If we don't figure out what Imogen knew before she was attacked, there's a good chance we could lose both of them. Sophia's voice was shaky. I can't lose Imogen and Jonah. We need them. We're not going to lose either of them. Not unless we sit around instead of taking action, I told her. But you can't be like this. You need to remain calm and be at the top of your game. For Imogen and Jonah both. Sophia nodded quickly before she wiped away her tears. She managed to stabilize herself before she said calmly, If we can get Essis near her and Sassy, he'll be able to heal them both. Essis peeped, but I shook my head. We can't get in there until after surgery. They won't allow us in. Think about it, Sophia. Why would Imogen be attacked tonight of all nights? Sophia's gaze widened. She must have found out a cure for the plague, and the person who caused it found out and tried to stop it. Exactly, I said firmly. We can't do anything about Imogen right now, but there might be a way to cure Squeaks, and we have to find it. Hey, you guys okay? Ezra had come out of the waiting room. He looked between us, seemingly confused as to why we weren't waiting with the others. Imogen got hurt trying to find a cure for the plague, I told him. We're figuring she must have found a cure. Otherwise, why would someone try to attack her? Ezra nodded. So you two are going to see what you can find? Yes, and Jonah too, I said. He's not much use here. Can you stay here with Cade? Sure, I'm not about to let my best bro go through this by himself, Ezra said. I'll let you guys know if there are any updates. Thanks, man. I grabbed his hand and bumped my shoulder against his. Ezra sent Jonah out. Why are we leaving now? Im needs us. Jonah said weakly as we left the hospital wing and headed toward the staircase. She needs us to find a cure more, I told him. Squeaks is still sick, and if she... Sophia and Jonah looked at me and I took a deep breath. If something happens, she'll have sacrificed herself for nothing. This is my fault, Jonah moaned. If Squeaks hadn't gotten sick, she wouldn't have gotten hurt, and Squeaks wouldn't have gotten sick if I hadn't ignored her. You can't blame yourself. Squeaks got in contact with a sick familiar somehow. That's the only way she contracted the disease, I said. We should start at the crime scene, Sophia suggested. 
We can work our way back from there. There was a large crowd of people gathered outside the library on the first floor. The library had been closed. About 20 yards from it, the task force had roped off an area with yellow tape. There were tons of task force members around, investigating the scene. Get the fuck out of the way, I growled at a couple of first years as I shoved a path to the front. The crowd parted to let us through, though not without a lot of complaining about how rude I was. The scene was a disaster. Pools of blood stained the floor. Broken ivy vines lay all over the floor, mingling with the blood. Those were from Sassy. Large streaks of red across the floor indicated that a body had been dragged and played with, along with the small, bloody handprints from Imogen littering the stones. There were also the footprints of a three-toed creature with long claws. It was some kind of bird, one that walked on four legs. No hippogriff. There were no hoof marks. No griffin either. These prints were too huge to come from one. The span of them was at least three feet long. Judging by the footprints, whatever had attacked Imogen had most likely come from behind, fought her and Sassy, then run off the moment they heard Professor Fawn coming. Hey, back off, a task force member said from behind their mask, and they raised their knocksite gun as they approached us. There's an investigation underway. Our friend was hurt here, Sophia protested. We can't risk anyone damaging the crime scene. Leave now they said in a low voice. We slowly backed off. I didn't feel like getting shot full of noxite and losing my magic for the next 24 hours, because at a time like this, it was a high possibility I'd need it. Essis gave a finger to the task force guy as we turned around and walked away. We left the crowd. I felt a tinge of irritation at all the students surrounding the area. They were acting like this was entertainment. Didn't they understand someone's life was on the line? Once we were far enough away from the crowd, I gestured for Sophia and Jonah to follow me into a secluded alcove down a relatively quiet hall. It was a bird, I said immediately. It's obvious. Sophia nodded. I agree. No other familiar I know makes marks like that. I took a deep breath. Guys, I know this is hard, but if we're going to figure out what happened to Imogen... We have to examine her injuries. Sophia turned a little green before she took a few deep breaths and tapped a finger against her chin. It looked like, I don't know, I didn't get too close of a look when she was being wheeled by, but it seemed like something attacked her with its talons, like it tried to rip her apart. There were puncture wounds from a beak, too, in her and Sassy, Jonah added. They look similar to the mark Squeaks makes when she's eating. But what kind of familiar does that to its prey? From what I've learned in class, most creatures like to make quick blows and end it quickly so that their meal doesn't struggle, Sophia said. Magical creatures don't like to exert energy while hunting. They need to conserve as much as possible. It's a survival tactic. Not unless it's a creature that likes to toy with their game, I said darkly. It's also a possibility that whoever ordered their familiar to attack Imogen told them not to kill her, not at first anyway, to try and get some information. I knew exactly what kind of animal made those injuries. I'd had the thought that Imogen had looked far too much like the deer my dad and I had found in the forest sometimes, ripped to shreds. But I didn't want to say what it was, because I didn't want to hurt Jonah. Do you think that Sassy might have wounded the creature? Sophia asked. I shrugged. It's possible, Let's check the area around the crime scene since we can't get into it. The three of us avoided the task force and ended up on the opposite side of the hall in the direction where we hoped the attacker had fled. We walked up and down the halls for over an hour looking for clues and didn't find anything. Not at first. Then Sophia called my name. I hurried over. She was kneeling by a traditional Hawkeye statue. She pointed to show a small trail of blood droplets leading away from the crime scene. They were so minute, I wasn't surprised the task force hadn't noticed. The statue of the Hawkeye was carrying a spear. The spear tip was dotted in a tiny amount of blood, as if the creature fleeing had done so in a hurry and scraped itself against the spear, drawing blood. 
The droplet trail ended a few paces off, but collected around the statue were a collection of black and brown feathers, so sharp that you might cut yourself on the edges. Cockatrice feathers. I closed my eyes. I'd been right. I stood up and carefully grabbed one of the feathers between two fingers, handling it gently so I didn't cut myself. I placed it in Jonah's outstretched hand. He stared at the feather blankly for a moment, as if he couldn't believe it. He closed his eyes, and a visage of utter pain crossed over his face. Then he squeezed his hand shut, tightly as he could. The feather cut into his palm and blood oozed out from between his fingers. What? What is it? Sophia asked, not getting the point. It's from a cockatrice, I said bluntly. Jonah let the blood from his hand drip on the floor. Essis eyed it from his place on the ground, but made no move to heal. Are you fucking kidding me? Raynar did this? Sophia asked in outrage. How many people do we know have a cockatrice? They're not popular familiars, I said. And if someone else was walking around the school with a cockatrice besides one that had already been registered to a student, you can damn well bet someone would have bloody noticed. Head Dean Ulrich doesn't just let those things walk around. They're restricted on school property because of how dangerous and unpredictable they are, unless they're already bonded. Professors aren't even allowed to use them in class. This doesn't make sense, though. Why would Raynar have a reason to bring a plague to the school? Sophia protested. Jonah was so quiet, it was scary. He had this deadly, hooded look in his eyes, one I'd never seen before. I nearly shuddered when I glanced at him. Sophia picked Essis off the floor. So what do we do now? Do we report Raynar as a suspect? No, not gonna work, I said dully. What do you mean it's not going to work? It's attempted murder, Sophia shouted. Raynar's dad is on the air council, and even if Imogen wakes up, it's her word against his. A couple of feathers and some blood droplets aren't enough evidence to pin him, even if they do a DNA test and the elders will back him up against the other tribes. No one will want to start a conflict with Yapluma over a Navita girl, not even the Navita elders, with how tense things are right now in the tribe. He'll walk free, I said weakly. And Raynor knows it. That's why he didn't hesitate to attack. So he's just going to get away with it? We're going to let him get away with it? Sophia asked. Jonas swept past us. He moved with intention. I got a panicked feeling in my gut. Jonah, where are you going? He didn't answer. Sophia and I rushed to catch up. He started climbing the stairs, two at a time. It was as if how he felt physically was temporarily forgotten as he stormed upward. Sophia and I rushed to keep up. Jonah, you don't want to do this, I said. I didn't dare to put a hand on him to try and hold him back. Sophia kept sending desperate glances at me like she wanted me to do something. Jonah kicked the doors of the Yapluma dorms down. Several people glanced our way, mouths dropping open as they watched Jonah storm forward. Raynar was lounging on a couch with his legs thrown up. Alvarez was nowhere to be seen. Where'd he send his familiar off to? Raynar gave us a cocky grin as we approached. His eyes fell on Jonah. Hey, babe, he said sarcastically. Sorry to hear about your friend. Jonah didn't ask any questions. He strode forward and wrapped his hand around Raynar's neck, lifting him off the couch and slamming him into the wall. A bunch of kids screamed. Raynar's feet dangled off the ground several feet, kicking out into the air as Jonah suspended him with one arm. Raynar's face slowly started turning red. You son of a bitch, Jonah shouted. Raynar's hand scrambled at his neck, gasping as he slowly lost oxygen. Jonah, put him down, Sophia screamed. It was like Jonah didn't hear. His fingers tightened and Raynar choked. You tried to kill my friend, Jonah said lowly. He wrenched Raynar away from the wall and tossed him. He went crashing into a table and it broke as Raynar's weight fell on it. Jonah started for him again and he fisted a hand in his shirt as he smacked Raynar across the face. This was terrifying. It wasn't like watching Jonah at all. It was like watching his dad. 
There was red in his eyes, like the only thing he desired was to end Raynar's life. You went after her because you knew she could cure the plague, didn't you? Didn't you? Jonah accused. What are you talking about? Raynar was bleeding. He clutched at his throat as he rasped. It's her fault she got involved with the prophecy. Jonah's eyes widened in realization, and I suddenly got what he meant. Raynar didn't have anything to do with the plague. He went after Imogen because he thought she had information on the prophecy. His father was on the air council. He must have assigned Raynar to get any information about the prophecy he could. Imogen was just the easiest target. Jonah kicked Raynar in the gut. You knew better than to touch her. Raynar sneered as he clutched at his stomach. She fucking deserved it, poking her nose in places it didn't belong. Jonah gave a loud cry and he started punching Raynar again and again. I launched forward and tried to grab Jonah's arm to hold him back, but he shook me off as if I was a fly. He was really going to kill him, and I couldn't stop him. No one could. Sophia and I watched in terror as Jonah continued to brutalize Raynar. Jonah grabbed his arm and wrenched it backwards. I heard Raynar let out a cry of pain, and the room gave an audible gasp as we all heard something snap. Jonah tossed Raynar to the floor, and he crumpled into a pile, cradling his hurt arm. Fuck you, Jonah, Raynar snarled, and he spat on his boots. You were always a shitty lay anyway. Where's Alvaris? Jonah bellowed. Where'd you send him? Raynar's eyes narrowed. Somewhere he'll be safe. You can go to hell if you think I'm telling you. Jonah yanked on Raynar's hurt arm. Raynar howled. You're a little bitch, Jonah growled. No one messes with my friends. Jonah stomped down hard. Raynar gave a loud cry and clutched at his leg. There was another snapping sound, and everyone gasped. The tone in the room changed as Jonah started coughing hard. He wiped blood away from his mouth and backed off as he hacked for air. Sophia moved. She grabbed Jonah's arm and hauled him away as best she could. I dove in to help and took Jonah's other arm. He didn't resist as we dragged him away. He was too busy gasping. We didn't stop until we were far away from the Yapluma dorms. Jonah heaved. He dove for a potted plant and threw up into it. When he wiped his mouth on his sleeve, I spotted blood. Essis immediately got to work. He scampered up Jonah's leg and up to his shoulder, putting a hand on his cheek. A bit more color came back into his features, and he stopped coughing, though he still had to keep a hand on the wall so he stayed upright. It was hard to acknowledge the feelings I had in that moment. I was terrified of Jonah. It was scary to think someone so gentle could turn so murderous. The only freaking reason Raynar was alive was because Jonah was too weak to do any permanent damage to him. Jonah took a few rasping gasps before he righted. I should have finished the job, Jonah grumbled. Ended him like he ended Imogen. Imogen's still alive. She's a fighter. She'll make it, I said. But she wouldn't have wanted you to go to jail for murder on her behalf. I'll still get into trouble. I beat his ass in front of everyone, Jonah said. Not unless Raynar wants to turn himself in for hurting Imogen, Sophia said firmly. But that doesn't matter now. We need to keep moving forward. Jonah's phone went off. He checked it and his face paled. Imogen's out of surgery, he said. He went to move forward but staggered. The fight with Raynar had taken out what little energy he had left. I put his arm over my shoulders to help him walk as we headed back to the hospital wing. Come on, bro. I'm the only one allowed to be sick around here. Buck up. Jonah gave me a half smile, but it didn't meet his eyes. I could tell he was thinking about not just Imogen, but Squeaks, too. We'd left her alone for hours back in the Anachi dorms. There was no telling how she was doing right now. I don't think we should tell Cade about Raynor. At least not right now, I whispered quietly. He's liable to go livid and hunt Raynor down. Agreed. We say nothing, Sophia said. Jonah only gave a firm nod. When we got back to the hospital wing, Imogen's parents were waiting outside of a room. You can go in and see her, Mrs. Anild whispered quietly. 
she's recovering. How is she? Sophia asked. Mrs. Arnold shook her head. The doctors have done all they can. It's up to her now. We've all visited. You can go in. We'll give you some privacy. Jonah pushed open the door. The three of us filed inside. Imogen was lying in a hospital bed, her neck, chest, and middle tightly bandaged. She was on a ventilator and remained still and unmoving. IVs, along with other tubes, stuck out of her arms and chest. It was really hard looking at someone else in a hospital bed. I'd gotten so used to it being me that seeing someone else hooked up to machines was a real shock. Next to her, Sassy was on a similar bed. She was breathing on her own, although she was also wrapped in bandages from head to toe. She was still in her kitsune form. Guess the secret about her was out. Cade was sitting by Imogen's bedside, holding her hand, while Arabelle lay on the floor at his feet. Ezra was leaning against the wall with his arms crossed. Diami wasn't in here. He probably couldn't have fit. Sophia stepped up next to Imogen, biting her lip and holding back tears. She placed Essis at the foot of Imogen's bed. If you use Essis, the doctors will think something's up, I said. I don't care. Go, Essis, Sophia said. Essis scuttled upward, avoiding stepping on any of the tubes or Imogen herself. What are you guys doing? Kate asked hoarsely. Essis sat by Imogen's head and rested a gentle paw on her neck. Essis can heal, Sophia said. We'd appreciate it if you didn't tell anyone. Watch. Essis closed his eyes. Color began to return to Imogen's face as he worked his magic. Although we couldn't physically see the changes taking place underneath the bandages, we knew his magic had to be working. Though I didn't know if Essis was strong enough to fix everything. I'd seen Essis do some incredible things, but Imogen basically had her organs rearranged and her throat gouged out. I wasn't sure if his powers would be enough this time. When Essis was done, he hopped around Imogen and placed a paw on Sassy. Her labored breathing became soft and calm, and her body relaxed. Essis looked at Sophia and held his tail tightly as if to tell her that was all he could do. Neither of them woke up. Good job, Essis, Sophia said. She observed Imogen. That's it, guys. Essis did all he could. The rest is up to her. Ezra's eyes were huge. He pushed himself off the wall. Whoa, is this how you've been getting better, bro? I nodded. Yep, Essis's healing powers have been keeping me alive. Cade stroked Essis's fur and Essis cooed. I won't tell anyone. He helped Imogen. That's more than what I could ever ask for. Ezra seemed thoughtful. If Essis can heal, can't he stop the plague? No, Sophia shook her head. We've tried that, but what we figured out is that the way Essis's powers work is that he uses the body's natural ability and energy to heal itself. He channels what's already there and boosts it with his own magic to speed up the healing process. But the plague is different. Whatever it is, it blocks his soul magic from healing the victim. They get a little better, but not completely. That reminds me, Cade reached down. He ruffled through a plastic bag before handing us four books. These were by Imogen when she was found. Professor Fawn grabbed them before the task force could. Do they mean anything to you guys? I looked at them. One of them was the notebook that Imogen had waved at us earlier. Could it contain any clues? They might, I said. I took the books from him and eyed Jonah and Sophia. We needed to check on squeaks. We think we might have answers to curing the plague. At least Imogen did. We need to find out what she knew. Go, Kate told us. Ezra and I won't leave her side. We'll be back as soon as we know anything, Sophia promised. Squeaks had worsened by the time we made it back to the Anachi dorms. Feathers were coming off of her now in droves, and she was so weak now she could hardly move. Just sprawled out on the rug, legs slightly twitching. Her eyes dropped big tears, as if she'd thought we'd abandoned her for good. Jonah stumbled forward and fell at her side. He pulled himself across the rug and sat next to her. 
She was too tired to even lift her head, so Jonah picked it up and placed it on his lap for her. She sighed in contentment as he stroked her head feathers, as if all she'd been waiting for was for Jonah to get here so she could die in peace. I'm sorry it took so long, Squeaky, but Imogen got hurt, Jonah said. Squeaks gave another rasping cough. It sounded way worse than the ones we'd heard earlier. Sophia and I scattered the books across the table. Under her breath, Sophia asked, Why is Squeaks worsening so quickly? Lindsay and Medusa contracted the plague weeks ago, and they're still alive. It has to affect various familiars differently, I said. Some of these creatures only have it for a week or so before they die. Remember Madame Chavis, the twin elder from Coigny? She passed away in less than a week after her familiar got the plague. Okay, but what's the difference? Why do some die quickly and some linger forever? Sophia asked. It's not unusual. Illnesses work like that all the time. Some people with cancer die in a couple of weeks. Other people outlast it for years. Disease isn't a straight line, I told her. I scanned the titles of the books quickly. Curses of the Miriamic Coven. Miriamic Rituals and Practices, Spells of Miriamic Origin. What on earth would Imogen want with these? Sophia came to my side and read the titles alongside me. What's the Miriamic Coven, she asked. They're a group of witches who live on the other side of America, in Connecticut. Part demon, I explained quickly. But I don't know how they'd be connected to any of this. Witches and elementi don't typically associate. They're enemies with the arcane, so we try not to talk to the witches in the U.S. for fear of pissing off the sorceresses in Europe. Elementi don't like getting mixed up in international magical affairs. No shit, Jonah added meekly from across the room. We've got enough of our own problems within the tribe. I don't know about this, Soph. I ran a hand through my hair in frustration. This might be a coincidence. Maybe she was researching for a class or something. I don't know how you could connect a familiar plague with the Miriamic coven. They don't have familiars. Imogen thought they were involved, so there must be an explanation, Sophia said firmly. Let's start reading. I sat down and opened a book. Jonah coughed again. It sounded like he needed a drink. Sophia hurried to grab a bottle of water from the fridge Jonah insisted we install up here. She knelt down beside Jonah and helped him drink. Man, this sucks, Jonah said, and Squeaks gave a weak coo. I'm going to die. I'm not ready to die. You aren't going to die. We're going to save you, Sophia insisted. Jonah looked down at Squeaks. He buried his hand in her feathers. Do you know how Squeaks and I bonded, he asked. I'm sure it's a very lovely story, Sophia said. You want to tell it to me? I was trying to focus, but the words blurred together in front of me at the sound of their soft voices. Right now, I was desperate to do something to save them. Anything. It was last year, the beginning of last summer, Jonah began. Me and my dad got in this giant fight, like totally major. It was the worst argument we'd ever had. Squeak scraped her hooves against the floor, and Jonah hushed her so she'd calm down. I burst out of the house and just ran for it, Jonah continued. He came after me, but gave up after the neighbors saw him chasing. He had to keep up appearances, you know? Pretend like he was dad of the year, even though everyone in the neighborhood could hear him shouting at me night and day. Everyone knew that he loved Jenny and hated me. My sister always got all the love and attention. He and mom made it clear I was the son they never wanted. Jonah. Sophia whispered. I ran, Jonah said. I ran so far into the woods, I was pretty sure I'd gotten lost. But I didn't care. It wasn't safe for me to go back home, and I'd rather sleep in the woods than get hit again. So I just walked. I kept walking until the forest got really thick, and I couldn't go through it anymore, so I had to turn around. Jonah's voice got thick. Then I heard chirping. I thought it was baby birds. I looked up and saw in this giant, massive tree there was a hippogriff nest. I was directly beneath it. The mother was there, but she did something horrible. She pushed one of her babies out of the nest. 
You're kidding. Sophia's voice was full of shock. Nope, Jonah shook his head. She was the tiniest and weakest, so to save the others, the mom tried to kill it so the others could survive. I heard this little chick's screams as she fell through the air. I ran forward out of instinct and dove to catch her. This little hippogriff landed in my arms no bigger than a newborn foal. She couldn't have weighed more than a hundred pounds. Squeak sighed. Her eyes closed as she drifted into a peaceful rest. But I knew that if Jonah tried to rouse her, she wouldn't wake up. We were running out of time. Jonah smiled. I remembered I looked at her and she looked at me. She was so excited that I'd saved her life. She acted like I was her new mama. She nuzzled my hair and cuddled up against me. Usually people hear music or smell things when they bond, but I didn't. It was like everything was complete silence and calm. It was something I never had, growing up in a house that was always in turmoil. I tried to look for her name, ask her for it, but she didn't have one. Nothing popped into my head. Her mother didn't give her a name. She didn't think she was important enough to have one. Jonah started to get choked up. She just, she started making all these little squeaky noises, and I just thought, you know, squeaks. Jonah started to cry. Sophia rubbed his back and said, It'll be okay, Jonah. What if it's not? Jonah wept. Squeaks didn't stir. It will. Liam and I will find a way. You just rest. Sophia got up to join me. Jonah closed his eyes and let his head fall back against the armchair. I cleared my throat and focused back on the books. I skimmed through the pages, but these books were massive. There was just too much here. Liam, look at this, Sophia said. She pushed the notebook toward me. In Imogen's handwriting were page notations. I flipped to the first one and saw that a paragraph in the book had been highlighted. For foes and fiends, there are few curses more powerful in a witch's arsenal than the Omnimodus curse, I read. Although it ceases to work against any member of the Miriamic Coven, it is valuable when targeting members of other magical factions. When performed properly, this spell will cause a person's magic to waste away inside of them until it becomes poisonous and deadly to the victim. The curse has an added effect as it mutates to become virally transmittable to other members of that faction's same species. I sat back in the chair. It... It sounds like a spell to steal someone's magic, or at least the curse attacks the magic until it turns against you, like how an autoimmune condition works. The curse makes the body attack itself until you eventually deteriorate because it considers your powers a foreign entity. But why target familiars? Why not elementi? Sophia asked. A familiar is the source of an elementi's magic, though, I said. You don't get your powers until you're old enough to bond, and familiars are easier targets. Animals transfer diseases much quicker than people do. So, the easiest way to take out someone would be to attack their magic, meaning you should attack their familiar, Sophia mused. Right, I confirmed. That has to be it. But an elementi can't do this magic. They'd have to hire a witch, Sophia argued. Why wouldn't they? The Yapluma hired an arcane to bewitch the temple, I pointed out. Who's to say someone wouldn't pay off a witch to cast a spell to make familiars ill? Witches don't care about Hawkeye politics. Sophia reached out to stroke Essis's fur. That makes sense why Essis can't heal them. If the body is already attacking itself due to magic, provoking it to do the opposite and heal won't do much good. But how do we stop it? I glanced at Imogen's notebook. I turned it around and read another annotation she'd written down. I grabbed a separate book, then flipped through it until I came to another highlighted paragraph. The Omnimodus curse can only be lifted in two ways, either by help of a witch... I shook my head. <laughs> well, that's not happening. Go on, Sophia insisted. I continued reading. Either by help of a witch, or the victim finds a way to restore and or replace the magic that has been infected. I lifted my gaze. That's it. That's the answer. What is? Sophia asked. I got up from the table and rushed to Jonah. I kneeled beside him. He was almost out of it. 
Hey, Jonah, wake up. I slapped his face a couple of times. He barely roused. Uh, what is it? Jonah asked weakly. He was barely conscious. You know how you draw power from squeaks to do magic? I asked. Yeah? His head bobbed. I slapped him again to keep him awake. Try the opposite. Try pushing your power into squeaks, I said. Uh, what? Jonah blinked as if confused. What good is that going to do? The curse can only be broken if you replace the magic that's already been infected. Jonah, you have to give Squeaks your magic. Then she'll be strong enough to push the curse out on her own, I told him. Think of it like a blood transfusion. He shook his head a couple of times to wake himself up. Guess it's worth a shot. Jonah laid his hands on Squeaks. He stared at her intently, as if he was focusing on putting all his effort into restoring her health. Wind picked up in the room as Jonah channeled his air magic. It ruffled Squeaks' feathers and made the notebook pages on the table flutter. An expression of surprise crossed Jonah's face. Guys, I can literally feel the plague. It's inside her, blocking her magic. It's sucking the life out of her. Do you think that you can get it out? Sophia asked. Yeah, I just have to push my magic toward it. Make it leave. Jonah's eyes narrowed, and his face scrunched up. He made a sharp grunt, and the wind in the room picked up again. Sweat beaded his forehead as he concentrated on his magic. Squeaks' hooves began to twitch, and her tail swished. We witnessed as a dark energy rose out of her form and twisted into the air, like some kind of smoke. It must have been the plague leaving her body. It's almost gone, Jonah gasped. He gave a final shock blast of air, and the black smoke whisked away, vanishing for good. Slowly, Squeaks began to stir. Her eyes fluttered open, and she lifted her head off the ground. Her expression brightened, and she gave a cheerful call. I witnessed as the color of her feathers changed from a dull brown to a shining tawny. Jonah gave a huge grin. The plague's gone. It's not there anymore. I can't feel anything except her energy. Squeaks launched herself at Jonah and licked his face. Jonah laughed and flung his arms around her neck. I'm so sorry, Squeaky. I was so stupid. I'll never abandon you like that ever again. Essis was cheering, clapping his hands and jumping up and down. I glanced at my girlfriend. She had an ecstatic look on her face. We did it. We cured the plague. Now all we needed to do was tell everyone. The thing was, who would believe us? And how could we tell enough people before it was too late? Soph, I think we need to use some of our celebrity status, I said as I rose. You're thinking exactly what I'm thinking, Sophia said as she got to her feet. Essis jumped and she caught him in her arms. Hey, where are you guys going? Jonah asked as Sophia and I started for the door. Squeaks chirped happily in his arms. They still looked tired and hungry, but it was clear the plague had passed and they were on the upside. Turn on the news, I told them as we headed out. Promise you'll see us. Sophia and I took the carriage as fast as we could to the Elementi News Network station, the only one in Kinpago that provided 24-7 news broadcasting. We ran into the ENN lobby, holding hands, and everyone's necks craned our way. I swear that people stopped breathing as wide smiles lit up the faces of the reporters. A million people were on us at once. They strode forward with cameras and notepads, pressing us against the wall with a million questions. Elementi and familiars, both. Sophia squeezed my hand as the crowd pressed in on us. I tried not to lose my cool and freak out about how claustrophobic they made me feel. Essis wriggled against Sophia and tried to avoid getting smushed. One reporter muscled her way to the front. She had a smile like a snake oil salesman. A fat squirrel sat on her shoulder, chattering. Mr. Mito, Miss Henley, she said pleasantly. I'm Amanda Sly, head anchor for ENN. I'm happy to see you finally accepted my invitation to drop by. We want to go on air for an interview, right now, I told them. It's live or nothing. She was practically giddy with excitement. 
Start up the cameras, boys, she shouted as she grabbed both our arms and hustled Sophia and I into the newsroom. We've got them. The group around us cheered. I sent an anxious look at Sophia. I didn't know if this plan would work, but it was the best we had. We were shoved into chairs in front of a broadcasting table. Amanda Sly sat on the other side of Sophia and gave a fake grin the moment the red light for the cameras turned on. Good evening, Kinpago, and welcome to this special edition of Nightly News, Amanda began. I'm your host, Amanda Sly, and we have a breaking new development in the Interhouse scandal sweeping the tribe. In studio are the accused, Sophia Henley from Coigny and Liam Maito from Toaqua, here to tell their side of the story. Amanda shoved a microphone in Sophia's face. Miss Henley, can we get an exclusive about your feelings on the upcoming trial? Fuck the trial, Sophia snarled, and she grabbed the microphone, wrenching it out of the reporter's hands. Sophia looked straight into the camera and said, Everyone needs to listen to me. The plague is caused by a curse. Whoever began it paid the Miriamic coven to create it. But elementi are the cure. You can use your elemental magic to push out the disease by filling your familiar with your power. It's the same thing as your familiar giving you their magic to help you become stronger, only reversed. Get her off the air, I heard someone cry, but a producer shushed them, and Sophia blazed forward. You need to focus all your power on your creature. Imagine channeling your element into their body. You'll be able to feel the plague inside of them and chase it out. Sophia insisted. Their magic is what's making them sick, but you can replace it. It's the only way. Amanda gaped, but her expression was obviously gleeful. This was a far better story than she expected. I figured she thought we looked crazy. Are you two saying that you know who caused the curse? Did you have any involvement in bringing this plague upon the familiars? Amanda asked us. Great, that's just what we needed. More propaganda. Fuck no, I said. I probably should have used better language since we were live on the air, but Sophia had already sworn, so too late now. Knowing we'd probably shot ourselves in the foot and already ruined the case, I plowed forward. What Sophia says is true. If you want to save your familiars, you need to listen to her, I said. It's the only way. The doors banged open, and task force members swarmed inside the newsroom. ENN employees screamed and dove out of the way as law enforcement came sweeping into the room. They immediately headed for me and Sophia. Miss Henley and Mr. Maito, you are under arrest, a task force member said from behind his helmet. They reached for us as Sophia and I backed against the wall. The camera was still on, catching everything for the broadcast. What are our charges? Sophia screamed. For inciting a tribe-wide incident, causing an intercity panic, and broadcasting a message that was not first approved by the elders, a voice responded. A tall man walked into the room, flanked by the task force. He was well put together with a navy suit, slicked back hair, and narrow eyes. He was followed by Elder Poole and Elder Mallison, both from Toaqua. We're trying to do good, we're trying to save people, Sophia protested. The man gave a delighted grin, only vaguely disguised as a sneer. This information was not formally approved by tribal government. You have spread false and misleading information about this plague, and therefore must pay the consequences. Telling lies about such a severe medical condition that affects the entire tribe is punishable by law. It's not a lie. It's the truth, I shouted. The man didn't even glance my way. Elder Oleander, where do you want them? A task force member asked as she approached. Take them to a holding cell. I don't want them going anywhere, he stated. So he was Elder Oleander, the guy who'd replaced Bane on the water council. Bane had warned me about him. He was a frickin' snake. I looked to Elder Poole for help, but he stared at the floor and kept quiet. Spineless coward he was. Elder Mallison was grinning from ear to ear. He was thrilled that we were getting arrested. 
It was payback for me refusing to go through with the assassination contract last semester. The task force grabbed the both of us and started hauling us out of the newsroom. Someone wrenched Essis out of Sophia's arms and shoved him in a little cage. He shook the bars in a feeble attempt to escape. Give me back my familiar, Sophia shouted. I smelled smoke as her hands started heating up, forming fireballs within her fingers. Sophia, don't struggle, I told her. You'll only make it worse. Sophia's magic slowly died, although she kept her eyes fixed on Essis. Great. Now we'd been dragged off camera by task force members on live TV. Our image couldn't possibly get any worse. We were shoved into an iron carriage and taken downtown by task force members. They barely took our fingerprints before they tossed us into an isolated cell. Essis was carried off down the hall. He bit at the bars and screamed for Sophia before he was taken out of sight. Essis, Sophia screamed. She created a large fireball in her hand and drew it backward to fire it at the prison bars. I grabbed her wrist to stop her. Don't try it. Those bars are made of noxite, I warned her. No way we're getting out. Sophia gave an impatient yell and kicked the bars. They can't just arrest us like this. At least they put us in the same holding cell, I said hopefully. We weren't separated. That's a good sign. Sophia huffed. We have to get to Essis. He's probably scared and all alone. Probably, but he's safe, I told her. He's being held in a part of the building where they keep familiars. If you attempt to bust out, Soph, who can say what's going to happen to him before we get there? Sophia's expression was still worried, but her shoulders fell. You're probably right. The cell only contained one small twin bed. I sat on it. I was so exhausted, my legs were shaking. I didn't know if we were getting out of here. We need to sleep. We've been up all night. We should get some rest before whatever happens tomorrow. Her eyelids drooped. Guess we're not going anywhere else. She sat beside me. We curled up together on the small bed. I draped the rough blanket over both of us so we could stay warm. It was freezing in here. Sophia nestled her head into my chest. Do you think we made the right decision? Because right now I think we screwed ourselves. We saved lives, I said. Whatever happens now was worth it. Sophia didn't reply, just pressed into me. Her fingers brushed against my jeans accidentally, and I snickered as a thought crossed my mind. What could you possibly be laughing about at a time like this, she asked. I grinned. We could have prison sex. A smile broke her lips. She laughed softly and said, You know, that's not such a bad idea. I kissed the top of her head and stared at the blank brick walls of our prison cell. If nothing else, we'd certainly given Amanda Sly one hell of a story. The two of us were woken up the next morning by the screaming of a deranged woman. I could hear her all the way down the cell hall from the main offices of the task force department. That sounds like Madame Doya, Sophia said. We quieted down to listen. I demand that Sophia Henley be released from this hellhole, or so help the ancestors, I'll burn it to the ground, Doya screamed. Beside her, I heard Naomi let out an intimidating roar. Miss Henley, along with Mr. Mito, have incited a panic within the city of Kinpago, the task force head told her calmly. They are being held for a processing period of at least 24 hours, you call this a panic? People are celebrating, Doya said. The plague's been completely cured in a matter of a night. The deaths have stopped, and the quarantine is over. She saved your asses. Sophia and I gave each other looks of relief. So the plan had worked, and we'd been right all along. At least now we wouldn't go down for nothing, and hopefully the elders couldn't charge us with spreading a false cure along with everything else. Be that as it may, their message was not approved by any of the elders as Elder Oleander made clear last night, the chief responded. I'm an elder, aren't I? I will not allow a student of my house to languish in some cell like a common criminal. 
Sophia still has three weeks until her trial date, and you will not hold her a second before then, Doyle replied. You forget Mr. Mito is also being charged, he responded calmly. Keep the boy. I don't care if he rots, Doya shouted. I was really feeling the love from Doya right now. Beside me, Sophia scowled. The cell block door leading to the station outside opened, and Vanderbilt was hustled through. Two task force members were at his side. They came to our cell and began shuffling through keys. You two have caused enough trouble, Vanderbilt seethed. Now I'm left to clean up your mess. You pull a stunt like this now? We have a month left before your court date. We're well aware, Mr. Vanderbilt, Sophia replied coolly. So what's the deal? You two are free to go. For the moment, Vanderbilt replied. Your bail's been paid. Consider inciting a panic added to your long list of charges. Doya bailed us out, Sophia asked, surprised. Well, Madame Doya paid your bail, Miss Henley, Vanderbilt said. Though she refused to pay your boyfriend's. You owe me, Mr. Mito. Tack it on your bill. I've got enough money, I told him. We followed him out of the holding cells. Outside the block in the offices, Madame Doya had her arms crossed and was tapping her high heel against the floor impatiently. She wouldn't even look at me. I had a rotten feeling she blamed me for everything bad that was happening to Sophia right now. I kind of blamed myself, too. If I hadn't fallen for Sophia, she wouldn't be in danger. Esses, Sophia cried when a task force member brought out the cage he was being held in. The cage was unlocked, and Esses scampered into Sophia's arms, quivering and upset. He'd hated being locked up by himself all night. Doya sneered. Vanderbilt? You picked Vanderbilt as your defense? Are you trying to get executed, Sophia? Ah, Eleanor, you've always been fond of me, Vanderbilt said. He shut his briefcase and walked out of the station, as if he couldn't stand to be in Doya's presence a moment longer. He was the only one who took on our case, Sophia said firmly. Now, if you'll excuse me, we have to get back to school. There's someone who needs us. Doya shook her head sharply. Absolutely not. Although regrettable, I have spoken to Chief Maito, and you will be returning to his residence for the time being. And you will stay put. Doya hissed the last words at her, and Naomi growled. Sophia's face got red. That's not fair. We have class and Imogen. When Miss Arnold awakens, you will be informed. You shall be allowed to return to school in a few days, once things have calmed down. Doya snapped. Do not make me force you, Sophia, because I will, and you will take my carriage to ensure that there are no little stops along the way. Sophia gave her a cold look. Fine. She turned her back on Doya and stomped out of the station. Doya followed us, Naomi prowling behind her as if she didn't trust us not to run off. She only left when the Pegasus had carried us far away into the sky, high above the city of Kinpago. The ride back home felt like it took forever. I was dreading walking through the door. My dad was going to beat my ass when I got home for the stunt I just pulled, but it was worth it. At least the plague was over, though whoever had caused it still remained a mystery. Sophia snuggled against me. Do you think Imogen will be all right? I rubbed her arms. I wanted to tell her it would all be okay, but at the same time, I didn't want to lie to her if something happened. I wanted to prepare her for the worst. Imogen was in bad shape, and even with Essis's healing magic helping, I wasn't sure she'd pull through. I gave her the most honest answer I could. I don't know, Polly. Essis curled up into a ball on our laps. Sophia stared out the window of the carriage toward Orenda Academy, like she wished she could teleport there and be by Imogen's side. I wanted to be there too. Our friend needed us. The rest of Kinpago was okay, but Imogen was still fighting for her life. Chapter 18 Liam and I ignored Madame Doya's instructions and returned to school the following day, since we wanted to visit Imogen after class. 
I was worried about facing Doya, as she had specifically told me not to return to Arenda until she deemed it safe. But when I entered her classroom, I was relieved to find there was a substitute in her place, as well as curious. Where had she gone? Lindsay, I cried. She was sitting at her desk, looking in peak health. Miranda had scooted her desk close to Lindsay. Their heads were close together, and they were talking quietly to one another. Medusa sat curled up at Lindsay's feet. No one else had arrived to class yet but the sub, so the three of us were alone. Lindsay lifted her head to look at me, and her eyes brightened. Sophia! She hopped out of her desk and held her arms out to me. I set Essis down on the nearest desk and pulled her into a hug. How are you feeling? I asked, looking her over. Amazing, thanks to you, she said with a smile. You're a hero. I chuckled. I'm not. You are, Miranda argued. Didn't you see the reports? Miranda handed me a newspaper that had been sitting on her desk. Across the top of the front page was a bold headline that read, The Plague is Over. I began to scan the article. Interhouse couple Liam Maito of Toakwa and Sophia Henley of Coigny are being heralded as heroes following the eradication of the familiar plague. It was a welcome change to the rumors that had spread about our relationship, but I had a feeling the elders weren't going to like this. Do you realize what this means? Miranda asked enthusiastically. Everyone's cured? I didn't know what she was getting at. Well, yeah, she said, but I meant for you and Liam. Your trial. People are coming out to show their support. Here, let me show you. Miranda grabbed the newspaper and flipped to the editorial section. They're saying you should be pardoned because you stopped the plague. I froze, stunned. I could hardly process the words on the page. I, I was just trying to help everyone. I didn't know it had helped the trial. Lindsay bounced on the balls of her feet. This is great news for you two. Wait, I said. You aren't upset? About me and Liam, I mean. Because I'm really sorry about how everything went down, Lindsay. I didn't mean to... She held up a hand, cutting me off. I'm going to stop you right there, Sophia. Don't worry. There are no hard feelings. There was someone I'd been wanting to ask out for a long time anyway. Her gaze traveled over to Miranda, and a blush rose to her cheeks. Miranda smiled as she entwined her fingers with Lindsay. You two are dating? I asked in excitement. I was happy for them. Lindsay beamed. Yes, and I seriously can't thank you enough for your help curing the plague. I thought I was going to die. I'm glad we found the answer in time, I told her. It was then that Haley and Kelsey walked into the room. Haley took one look at Lindsay and Miranda's entwined hands and scoffed. She strolled over to her desk and tossed her hair over her shoulder, then mumbled a string of slurs under her breath to Kelsey. Ignore her, I said to Lindsay and Miranda. Lindsay's eyebrows shot up. Ignore her? Girl, we're going to give that bitch something to talk about. Lindsay placed her hand on the side of Miranda's face, and Miranda leaned in. Their lips connected. I beamed proudly at them, and Essis clapped from his spot on the desk beside me. Haley was so shocked that she didn't make a sound. Lindsay and Miranda returned to their seats with wide smiles on their faces. Lindsay turned around in her seat to whisper at me. And that's how you deal with a West Phoenix. After class, I picked up Imogen's history of the Hawkeye homework and met up with Liam in the hospital. The hospital had completely transformed since we'd been here last. The beeping of machines and bustling of hospital staff had completely died down. The white curtain separating the quarantine area was no longer there either. It was eerily quiet. Liam was already in Imogen's room when I arrived. He was sitting at her bedside, stroking Sassy's fur. Sassy was back in her fox form and lying on Imogen's bed, though gauze was still wrapped around her middle. She seemed to be doing better. Sassy was awake and alert, but she kept her head low and rested it on Imogen's hand while she waited for her to awaken. Cade sat slumped in a chair on her other side, holding her hand, 
but he was completely out of it. It was like he hadn't slept all night. He was even snoring a little. Arabelle slept at his feet. Essis hopped out of my arms and onto the bed, where he snuggled up beside Sassy and worked his healing magic on her and Imogen. I pulled up a chair beside Liam. Did you talk to the doctors? He nodded solemnly. They said her vitals have stabilized, but they still don't know when she'll wake up. I gazed down at her sleeping form. Her wounds were still tightly wrapped in bandages. Just thinking about what Reynard did to her made me ill. I'm still trying to wrap my head around everything, I whispered. The attack, the cure, that night in the jail cell. Who was that prick that locked us away anyhow? Liam frowned. Elder Oleander. He's the guy who replaced Bane. Dad says he's just about as bad as Elder Malison. If your dad doesn't like him, why is he on the council? I asked. I don't know, Liam admitted. The chief gets final approval, but if Oleander was the only one eligible, my dad couldn't exactly say no. How do you get considered for the council? You have to either do something good for the tribe or show great power, Liam explained. Anyone with a seat on the Elder Council can nominate someone, and then the chief of that tribe must approve them. I guess Dad felt pressured to fill Bane's space on short notice. I thought of something. If you have to do something good for the tribe to get on the council, what did Doya do? She's so young for an elder. She must have done something important. I've heard rumors, but I don't know if they're true, Liam said. I raised an eyebrow. Oh? Liam shifted in his chair to face me. You know the riots that killed your birth parents? My guts twisted. The Toakwa had come into the Coigny village the night after I was born, hoping to kill me so I couldn't fulfill the prophecy. Yes, I remember the story. Well, after a bunch of people died, there was a lot of tension between Coigny and Toakwa, Liam said. There's always tension between Coigny and Toakwa, I pointed out. He shook his head. Not like it was. People were getting into fights and hurting each other even after the first riots were over. I guess Doya was instrumental in negotiating an agreement between Toakwa and Coigny to calm the tribes. She helped prevent a full-blown war. And everyone kind of forgot about the prophecy. Until you showed up. Wow, I said, absorbing the information. I had no idea. She must have been our age at the time. Can you imagine that the elders actually listened to her? Liam chuckled. I don't think it was easy. What's easy? Jonah said cheerfully as he pushed his way into the room. He was carrying a large bouquet of flowers, every color of the rainbow, along with a dozen balloons that barely fit through the door and a cup of coffee. Squeaks wore a saddlebag and held the door open with her foot while Jonah squeezed the balloons inside. Are we talking about Sophia? Jonah asked with a wink when he turned to us. Because I hear ancestors, Jonah. I threw my hands over my ears. I do not want to know what you've heard. I shot a quick glance at Liam. Or do I? Liam chuckled. Relax, he's just teasing. Cade stirred awake at the sound of our voices. Oh, hey, you... You brought flowers? Yep, for you. Jonah held them out to Cade, who looked totally confused, but reached for them anyway. Jonah pulled back at the last second and laughed. I'm only joking, man. But seriously, the coffee's for you. Jonah handed Cade the coffee cup, and he started sipping on it. Cade smacked his lips. Oh, man, that's so good. Thank you. No problem, Jonah said. You've been taking care of our Imogen. Someone needs to take care of you. Jonah started digging through Squeak's saddlebag. I also went to the dining hall and got some takeout, plus packed a few mice for Sassy. Jonah handed Cade two wrapped burgers, then opened a plastic container of dead mice and let Sassy sniff it. She wasn't as quick to scarf her mouse down as usual, but at least she was eating. Jonah tossed a mouse to Squeak's, who caught it midair, then placed the top back on the container. That's really generous of you, Cade said kindly. That's not all, 
Jonah replied, like he was hosting some sort of game show. He returned to digging through the saddlebag. I also picked out a going-home outfit for Imogen. She'll want to look fab when she finally gets out of this place. He held up a pair of bright red tights and draped them over the bed on Imogen's legs, like he was trying to see how they'd look. On top of those, he placed a matching pleated red skirt. He clapped his hands together. See? She'll look gorgeous. Good God, I'll look like a walking tomato. Imogen, I cried, shooting to my feet. I was beside her head in a split second, as was Cade on her other side. Arabelle startled awake. Imogen's eyes fluttered open. Cade pushed her hair back. Babe, you're awake. He looked like he wanted to hug her and kiss her all over, but didn't want to hurt her, so he held back. It was either that or a heart attack, Imogen groaned. It didn't sound like talking was easy for her. Get those off me. Jonah didn't listen. Instead, he threw himself at her feet and hugged her legs. You're alive. For now, she forced out. Next time, get me rainbow tights. I don't care what you're wearing as long as you're alive, but noted. Jonah quickly removed the skirt and tights from the bed. Liam stood beside me. How are you feeling, Em? She took a moment to breathe. Everything hurts, but I'll live. That's what's important, I said, feeling tears welling up in my eyes. You guys, the plague, Imogen whispered. It's okay, Em. We figured out what you were going to tell us, Liam said. It was the curse, but everyone's okay now, including Squeaks. The plague is gone for good. We cured it. Thanks, the ancestors. Imogen looked to Jonah, and she frowned. Jonah, I have something to tell you about the attack. I know, Jonah said before she could explain herself. I know Raynar sicked Alvarez on you. He what? Cade exploded. He started for the door, his hands fisting at his sides. Jonah placed a hand on his shoulder to stop him. Relax, it's been taken care of. What do you mean? Cade snarled. I'm going to kick his ass. Believe me, Liam said. Jonah's already kicked his ass enough for the both of you. Yeah, Jonah said. He'll be lucky to survive the tournament at this point. He won't if I have anything to say about it. Cade growled. Then let the tournament take care of him, Liam suggested. You don't need to get yourself in trouble. Cade backed away from the door, but he was still fuming. I can't believe he would do this. All to get to you? Cade looked to Jonah. Jonah shrugged. Something like that. All that matters is that it's over between us, and he won't be hurting any more of my friends. Thanks, the ancestors, Cade said, raking his fingers through his dark hair. I just, I don't know how I'm going to compete in the tournament with him on my team. Not after this. Imogen reached up and took Cade's hand. Forget about him, babe. Just make sure that you come home alive. Cade sank back into his chair, and his eyes glistened with tears. He looked deeply into Imogen's eyes, like they were the only two in the room. My heart broke just to see the look on his face. Imogen, we've talked about this. I can't make any promises. Promise me you'll try your hardest, Imogen pleaded. That's all I ask. There's still so much I want to do with you. She wasn't just talking about sex, even though I knew they hadn't crossed that line yet. They were definitely at that point in their relationship, but Imogen said Cade was waiting until after the tournament, just in case he didn't make it. Cade hesitated. Imogen, you know I'll always do what's best for the tribe. She nodded. Tears rimmed her lower lid. I know. I love you, he whispered, dipping his head to kiss her lightly on the lips. A single tear streaked her face as he pulled away. I love you too. I don't think I'm ready for this, I told Liam as we entered the Navita village two and a half weeks later. 
I know, Liam said, raking his fingers through his hair. But there's no avoiding it. All of Kinpago is broadcasting the Elemental Cup this week. And to be honest, if something's going to happen to Ezra, I want to know right away. I don't want to have to wait. True. We began climbing the steps to the Navita treehouses. Imogen had been released from the hospital a few days after the attack, but she spent most of her time at her parents' recovering. Essa's abilities were helping speed up the process, but it had been so bad that it was taking time for her to heal. I wasn't sure she'd have made it without Essis. Liam and I visited Imogen's house most nights after class to study with her and Jonah for finals. Since Jonah was single now, he spent a lot more time around Imogen. He treated her like a queen, always making sure she was well taken care of and had enough blankets to keep warm. Cade came every now and then, but he spent a lot of his time with Ezra strategizing for the tournament and trying not to murder Raynar. Imogen was well enough to return to school for finals week, and I was pretty sure she'd aced everything, even her dance final, which she and Jonah had modified so she didn't have to move as much and risk injuring herself further. For whatever reason, Doya hadn't paired me and Haley up for our final like she'd threatened earlier in the semester. I'd been paired with Ben instead, and we easily passed. I'd done well in my other classes, though Jonah and Liam had barely scraped by. They'd passed, though, and that was all that mattered. Finals were over, and we'd reached the week of the tournament. Since Imogen was still recovering, we agreed to watch the opening ceremony and following footage at her house. It was going to be a week-long party of junk food and chit-chat while we waited for news on the cup. Imogen said it was better if we enjoyed it together instead of getting all depressed over it. I figured it would keep her from worrying so much about Cade. We reached Imogen's treehouse and knocked on the door. She was quick to answer. Welcome! Imogen was looking better. She no longer needed the bandages, though there were still large scabs and pale pink lines where the wounds were once gashed open. It looked like Essis was helping enough that it wouldn't severely scar. We stepped inside, and the smell of pizza hit my nose. I hope you're hungry, Imogen said. Quick, grab some before Jonah eats it all. Jonah was sitting in the living room with his feet propped up on the coffee table, scarfing down two pieces of pizza at once that were folded together like a sandwich. Squeaks lay in front of the TV, where pre-tournament commentary was playing. Old footage of the four of us winning the cup from last year blazed across the screen, but we all ignored it. We didn't feel like champions or heroes. The cup was an experience all of us just wanted to forget. Sassy hurried over to us, and Essis jumped out of my arms to greet her. They sniffed each other playfully. Relax, Jonah shouted with a full mouth. There's enough to go around. Imogen chuckled. My family got tickets to the arena to watch the opening ceremony, so don't worry about leaving extra for them. We entered the kitchen. I grabbed a plate and reached for a piece of pepperoni pizza. Hang on, Imogen said. We ordered a special one for you. Imogen opened a box of pizza on the other side of the kitchen, and I couldn't help but laugh. It was half supreme and half crust, no sauce, cheese, or anything. It was just like the one Liam and I had ordered my first semester at Arenda. Liam smiled wide. Seriously, guys? What? Jonah shrugged innocently from the living room. It's perfect for you two. Total fucking opposites. I laughed and reached for the supreme half. You're right, it's perfect. Thank you. Liam and I snuggled up beside each other on the couch with our food. Did anyone place any bets? Liam started, but Jonah cut him off. Shh, Jonah hissed. It's starting. Music played on the TV, and head Dean Alric stepped out on stage. I felt like I was holding my breath the whole time as teams came up on stage to say their final words to the tribe before they were cast into the tournament. It was sick, really. For some of them, it would be the last thing their families ever heard them say. The first team that came on stage, the yellow team, all looked like timid first years. Their familiars were small, like Essis, and didn't seem to possess any magical abilities. They kind of reminded me of us. 
I hope they all finish, I said. Jonah shot me a skeptical glance, but he didn't say anything. He probably thought they would all die during the first task. But everyone had said the same thing about us. As long as they were smart and worked together, they'd make it. I was rooting for them. The yellow team was ushered to the seating area on the edge of the stage, and another team came out. They kept coming, one right after the other. I recognized a few people from my class. But it wasn't until I saw Lindsay come on stage that my heart began to pound nervously. At least she seemed to have a good team, including a griffin, hippocampus, and a lion-like creature on her team, along with her basilisk familiar. Kelsey's team came next, which included her jaguar familiar, a sea serpent, and two different kinds of birds. I was sensing we were getting to the end of the lineup as more and more powerful familiars were introduced. My blood ran cold as the green team came on stage. Ezra walked out first, with Diami at his side. The thunderbird looked bigger than ever. Alvarez strutted onto stage beside him, Raynar looking confident on his back. He was still wearing two casts, one on his leg and one on his arm, so I was willing to bet he'd spend the entire tournament riding his familiar. Raynar raised his hand and waved to the crowd. Jonah had just so happened to grab a handful of chips at that moment. He raised them to his mouth, but then the camera angle changed and focused on Raynar's face. Jonah's hand clenched into a fist, and bits of chips sprinkled around his lap and the couch. Cade and Arabelle came next. I noticed Imogen clutched Sassy a little tighter to her chest. Vanessa and Aisha stayed close to Cade as they walked on stage. Vanessa wasn't huge yet, but her baby bump was obvious in the tight uniform. Alric gave them a short introduction, then said, Is there anything you'd like to say? He handed the microphone to Ezra, who took it. Ezra opened his mouth to speak but Raynar leaned over from Alvarez's back and snatched the microphone out of his hand. Raynar looked at the audience like they were all beneath him. I hope you bitches all bet on me because only the strongest make it to the end. Enjoy the show. His demeanor quickly changed. He smiled and waved to the crowd like he was a celebrity. He shoved the microphone back in Alric's direction, and Alvarez started toward the seats by the other teams. He didn't even give the rest of his team a chance to say anything. Ezra leaned over to Cade and said something, but we couldn't hear what it was. I bet he was threatening to murder Raynar as soon as they hit the course. Two teams came after them, and then they filed into carriages and started toward the first task. Their carriages didn't fly like ours had, though. They rode through the forest, with the cameras and commentary following them the whole way. Finally, they came to a stop beside a huge cave opening in the mountainside. It was large enough for at least three carriages to pass through side by side, but they didn't go in. They dropped off the contestants outside the cave, then continued into the forest. Everyone stood around for a moment, gazing upward into the sky or deep into the depths of the cave, waiting for some sort of sign so they could form a plan. Nothing happened until the blue team started into the forest. Fireballs rained down from the sky, forcing them back toward the cave. The purple team started to climb the rocks up the cave's side, but fireballs started coming from all directions, and they had to retreat to avoid getting burnt to a crisp. A few teams raced for the cover of the cave right away. I cringed. It was a stupid move, as they could get trapped in there but it seemed to be what the elders wanted. Reynard didn't even glance at his teammates before he tried to fly Alvarez above the forest canopy. A fireball smacked straight into his side and knocked him out of the air before he could get far. Ha! Jonah laughed with a mouthful of chips. That's what you get. Liam tried to hold in a laugh from beside me. Ezra, Cade, and Vanessa joined hands and raced into the cave with their familiars at their sides they dodged fireballs the whole way. I let out a breath of relief when they all made it to the cave safely. The camera angle switched to inside the cave, as if they'd set up cameras before the start of the tournament. We could no longer see Raynar. Was that it? I asked, a little baffled. That seemed a lot easier than our fire challenge. Imogen shook her head. 
I don't think that was the fire challenge. I think this is... She cut off, her face paling. The cave began to shake, the earth groaning as rocks tumbled down the mountain. Screams filled the cave, and everything went dark as the entrance collapsed. A horrified look fell across Imogen's face. Earth! For a moment, everything was dark, until Coigny on all teams started forming fire in their hands to light the cave walls. The camera angle shifted again, and I noticed Reynard and Alvarez beside the rest of the green team. Somehow he'd made it before the cave-in. He was yelling at them, but there was so much chaos that we couldn't hear what he was saying. The earth continued to shake beneath their feet, and dirt rained down from the cave ceiling. We have to go, now! I could just make out Ezra's words as he took Vanessa's hand and followed the other teams deeper into the cave. Large rocks, three feet across, started to fall from the ceiling. Cade raised his hands to try to deflect them with his magic. Several people from other teams screamed as huge boulders fell on them or their familiars. The camera angle changed again, and I couldn't look away soon enough. A boulder the size of squeaks fell onto a feline familiar, squashing it flat. Its elementi didn't even have time to react to save it. Blood squirted everywhere. I buried my face into Liam's shoulder and he pulled me tighter to him. I couldn't block out the sound of the rumbling earth and crashing rocks and the screams. So much screaming. Then, bam! The entire cave crumbled in on itself, causing a deafening roar as rock tumbled over rock. I gasped, finally bringing my eyes back to the TV. The screen went black, then switched back to the commentary room, where the announcers from the opening ceremonies were narrating the events of the first task. Unfortunately, that's as far as the cameras go, Eli the announcer said in a chipper voice. But we'll see soon enough which teams made it through and which ones perished. Let's take a look at the scoreboard. That cave-in sounded insane, I said, horrified. Do you think they made it? They'll make it through, Liam assured me. I heard something in his voice, something that suggested there was no other way. Like the elders would never hurt everyone all at once, or they wouldn't have a show. I got that the elemental cup was tradition and all, but it still seemed horrible to me. I shook impatiently as we waited for news on which teams had made it out. I knew it could be hours or even days, but I wanted to know now. I had to know. Were my friends safe? Imogen's family had returned from the arena by this time and were watching the TV as eagerly as we were. The program was filled with prior year recaps and commentary about this year's contestants. I hated how all the commentators talked about were how Liam and I performed last year, along with notes about the upcoming trial. Couldn't they let it go? I just wanted to know if my friends were safe. Sitting here watching the cup and being unable to do anything was ten times more torturous than actually being in it. We finally got word two hours later. An aerial camera circled an exit to the cave, and three members of the purple team came crawling out. They were covered in dirt, and one of their team members had a huge gash on their arm from the rocks. It would set them back to find plants and herbs to help the healing. Another hour later, the blue team emerged from the cave, two members down. Twenty minutes after that, a member of the white team. He was alone, and he still had three tasks left to go. I didn't think he was going to make it. He was already disqualified for being the only surviving member. The yellow team emerged late that night, with all four of their members and familiars still alive. I felt a sense of pride wash through me, since they were the freshman team marked least likely to make it. More and more teams made it out of the caves once darkness had fallen, but most were missing at least one or two members, and a lot of people were injured. I didn't know what had gone on down in those caves, but it seemed to be worse than what we went through during our Earth task. I don't remember so many people dying during the first task last year, I said solemnly. It gets harder and harder every year, Imogen whispered. 
She hadn't taken her eyes off the screen, as if holding her breath for the moment Cade would come back on. Eventually, the red team, Kelsey's team, made it, with only three team members remaining. Not long afterward, Lindsay's team, the gold team, came out of the caves. They were only the second team who'd made it with all their team members still alive. I was relieved to see Lindsay and Medusa weren't hurt. It was nearing midnight, and most of Imogen's family had gone to bed, all except her eldest brother, Soren. I was beginning to nod off, but I didn't want to sleep until I knew for sure what had happened to our friends. Maybe they're just waiting it out until morning, Liam suggested nervously. He couldn't take his eyes off the TV, and his hold on me had tightened. He was really worried about Ezra. Well, Eli, the second announcer, Lewis, said, it looks like the orange team and the green team didn't make it, but we'll have to wait until morning for confirmation. Hold on, Lewis, Eli said quickly, pressing his finger to his earpiece. The camera switched back to the mountain, but Eli's voice continued over the video footage. A dark shadow moved through the narrow cave opening. It looks like you might have spoken too soon. A member from the green team has just made it. We all let out a collective cry of relief. I suddenly felt very awake and alert. I straightened in my seat. We couldn't make out much in the darkness of the night, but eventually the figure emerged, crawling. I couldn't tell who it was, except that it was one of the guys. A creature stepped out of the cave behind him, and I could make out the silhouette of the cockatrice. Raynar! The blood drained from my face, and the room went silent as we waited. Finally, I couldn't take it anymore. Wait! No! Where's the rest of the team? Imogen's bottom lip quivered. Do you think... She choked up and couldn't finish the last of her sentence. It looks like this green team member might be alone, Lewis said. Oh my god! I cried, grabbing so tightly to Liam's hand that he gasped. Another figure moved near the cave entrance. A beat passed. And then Vanessa stepped out of the cave with Aisha at her side. Yes, I cried in relief. She's alive. Cade and Ezra came right after her, with their familiars beside them. They looked exhausted. But they were alive. Ezra stomped up to Raynar and shouted something in his face, but we couldn't hear it. Eli chuckled. It looks like we have some team drama this year. Of course, it wouldn't be the Elemental Cup without it. Imogen started crying in relief, and Jonah quickly went to her side to console her. I really thought... She could hardly speak past her sobs. I thought they wouldn't make it. Shh. Jonah encouraged. They made it past the first task. That's always the worst. They'll make it through the rest. I looked up to Liam and spoke lowly. Do you think he's right? Liam looked nervous to answer the question. I think they can all handle themselves out there, as long as Raynard doesn't do something to get them killed. I frowned. Yeah. Let's hope not. Three days passed. The tasks seemed even more grueling this year than the last, and people were dying in droves. In the fire task, teams had been forced into a gorge and had to scale the steep rocks to escape the flames at the bottom. I didn't want to watch the green team take on the task, but I couldn't look away. Raynar had gone ahead, dodging fireballs as Alvarez flew up and out of the gorge. He used what air he could as a shield. Meanwhile, Diami was trying to carry everyone else out of the gorge, but his wing was hit by a rogue fireball. He couldn't fly injured with all that weight on his back, which left the task up to Vanessa. I was shaking the whole time, praying to the ancestors they'd make it. Vanessa had calmed the flames enough to give them some time. Then Aisha scaled the rocky cliff to carry the rest of the team to safety on her back. I breathed a sigh of relief. The yellow team had since lost two members, and the gold had lost one, which meant that the green team was the only one left with all four members still alive. 
We'd spent almost every waking second at Imogen's watching the tournament, waiting. On day three, Liam and I decided to take a break that afternoon, since it didn't look like any team was near one of the tasks. We walked hand in hand on the trail from the Navita village toward Kinpago, which was a short, quiet walk, Essis wrote on my shoulder. I don't get it, I said, gazing down at our entwined fingers. Get what? Liam asked. I kicked at a rock on the path. How can the elders keep allowing this? The cup, I mean. It's so brutal. Half the contestants aren't even going to survive this year. It's a sick tradition. It's more than just a tradition, Liam said. It's an important part of securing your bond with your familiar. It puts the two of you through the worst together. Okay, I can accept that, I told him. But everyone makes it sound like it wasn't always so bad. It wasn't, Liam admitted as we got to the outskirts of Kinpago. The dirt path turned to cobblestone, with small shops lining the street. It used to be relatively easy. Almost everyone used to make it through. Then why have the elders made it so hard? I asked. Liam sighed. I don't know. He was cut off by the sharp sound of a slap. A woman let out a pained gasp. I'm sorry, she cried. I recognized the voice as Mia's. It's okay, a man said, shushing to soothe her. We were just passing a landscaping store with outdoor ceramic decor and working fountains out front when we rounded the corner to an alleyway. I stopped dead in my tracks. Mia was wrapped in Micah's arms, clutching the side of her face and holding back tears. Her canine familiar, Taryn, cowered in fear of Micah's familiar. The creature looked like a water serpent, but it was only the size of a young dragon. It had a serpent-like face, with spines coming out of its neck, and legs that reminded me of a lizard. Sharp, pointed scales stuck out of its back like some sort of torture device. I'd heard of these creatures before. It was a Malerta. It stood over the canine, staring down at it threateningly so she couldn't step in and defend Mia. Mia caught our eyes, but Micah didn't see us there. Micah ran his fingers through her silky, dark hair as he cradled her close. Now you know not to be late again. Wait, did he just... I'd had no idea. I felt terrible for Mia. What the hell? I stepped forward. Liam grabbed me by the wrist the same time Mia drew away from Micah and said, Sophia, no! I struggled out of Liam's hold, but he held me tighter. Drop it, Sophia. Let me handle it, he hissed in my ear. I ignored him and aimed my anger at Micah. I finally wrenched away from Liam. You hit her, you asshole! Micah crossed his arms and smirked, like he was amused by my forwardness. I fail to see how that's any of your business. Sophia, just go, Mia insisted. She dropped her hand, and I could see the welt forming on her skin. I'm fine. It was my fault anyway. My jaw dropped. Your fault? Mia, he hit you. Fuck off, Mopite, Micah snarled. Liam stepped in front of me, placing himself between me and Micah protectively. Mopite? I asked. Slang term for interhouse couples, Liam whispered under his breath. I gritted my teeth. Mia turned back to Micah. You didn't have to call them that. Micah grabbed Mia's wrist tightly and dragged her toward him. She struggled out of his hold, but he wouldn't let her go. He took his other hand and forced her to look at him. Don't ever tell me what to do. Mia's eyes filled with tears that she was desperately trying to hold back. That was it. Liam and I both snapped at the same time. He stomped down the alleyway toward Micah, but I set Essis on the ground and pushed past Liam before he made it to Micah. I shoved Micah as hard as I could, and he stumbled a few steps, letting go of Mia. Essis held his fists up, like he was about to box with Micah. Leave her alone, I shouted. He turned to me with fury in his eyes. 
Mia threw herself between us and started crying as Micah advanced on me. Please, Micah, don't, she begged. But I was already ready for him. I formed a fireball in my hand. Liam jumped in front of me. Take one step closer, Liam dared him. Micah stopped and raised his hands in surrender. Hey, it's all cool. It is not cool, I growled. Micah's lips twisted into a sneer. You should learn to keep your girl in line, he said to Liam. Liam opened his mouth to say something, but I spoke before he could. Fuck you, nobody owns me, and you don't own Mia. Micah raised his hand, like he was about to bring it down across Liam's face. Instead, he used his water power to gather water from the gutters above our heads and whipped it at my face. It cracked across the side of my cheek, sending a stinging pain across my skin. Ow! I screamed. Micah! Mia cried, tears streaming down her face now. Esses placed his paw on my leg, and the pain immediately eased. Before I knew what was happening, Liam had lunged at Micah. He threw a punch, and the two ended up on the ground in a scuffle. Oh, shit, what had I done? Fists flew everywhere so that I could barely tell who was punching who. Micah's familiar let out a screech and snapped its jaws at Liam, but the two were moving so quickly that the creature nearly caught Micah with his fangs by accident. Liam gathered water from the nearby fountains and shoved it up into Micah's face. Micah gasped for breath, but it was only a gurgle as the water moved in and out of his airways. Mia threw her hands over her mouth and wept in horror. Liam was drowning him. Liam, I shouted, but he didn't seem to hear me. You're going to kill him. I threw myself into the middle of the fight and dragged Liam off Micah. The effort made me trip. The water fell away from Micah's face and he inhaled a deep breath, but he hadn't had enough. He threw himself at Liam again. Micah gathered the water into a ball in his hand and aimed it at Liam's face. I reacted quickly and grabbed onto Micah's ankle. I called upon just enough fire to hurt him, but not cause any permanent damage. Micah screamed and backed off, aiming his attention at me. He kicked out his other foot at my head, but I got to my feet and dodged out of the way just in time. It was enough to distract him that Liam got free. Liam grabbed me and dragged me to my feet, pulling me several feet away from Micah. Mia was at Micah's side in an instant. She knelt beside him and checked his injuries, then turned an enraged gaze up toward us. What the fuck, Liam? I could hardly believe my ears. After what Micah just did to her, she was still on his side? Micah sat up, but he was too preoccupied with the burn on his ankle to pursue us. I was still too shocked to move. Just go, Liam, Mia whispered, while looking utterly concerned for her abusive ass of a boyfriend. The two of us hesitated, until Mia looked Liam straight in the eye and shouted, Go! Liam had to practically drag me out of the alley while I watched Mia try to console Micah, who just shrugged her off and shot daggers my way. Liam finally let me go when they were out of sight. Essis jumped up my pant leg and crawled onto my shoulder. He checked the side of my face to make sure I was all right. Liam, we have to go back, I insisted. But he kept on walking. Liam! He turned to me, looking distressed. Look, Sophia, it's no use. Wait, you knew about this? I demanded. Liam sighed and dropped his shoulders. It's why I was hanging out with Mia this semester. I was trying to help her. But no matter what I did, she always found a way to defend him. My guts twisted. How could I have thought they were screwing around? He'd been trying to help Mia leave her abusive boyfriend. I was so stupid. She cheated on you with a guy who was abusive? I asked, hardly able to believe it. Some people just don't know what's good for them, Soph, Liam said. I don't think Mia really understands what love is. 
People go looking for the loves they think they deserve. I treated her well when we were dating, but that probably felt strange to her. As sick as it is to think, Micah hitting her might seem, I don't know, normal to her. Ancestors, how long has this been going on? I asked. She needs to leave him. I know, he said solemnly. I've told her that, but she just makes excuses. Nothing's going to work until she realizes for herself how bad he is. My jaw dropped. She could be dead by then. Liam took my face in his hands and stared deeply into my eyes. I know. Just promise me you won't get involved, Soph. Micah's dangerous. And I just can't, I can't stand the thought of him hurting you, Polly. I'd kill him. But you don't care about Mia? I asked in a soft whisper. Even as I said it, I knew it wasn't true. He didn't care about her like he cared about me, but he didn't wish this kind of thing upon her. I do, he said, and I tried to help, but she still wants to be with Micah. She just wants him to change. And I told her that would never happen, but... I reached out to take Liam's hand. I could see the sorrow written in his face. He really had tried. But there was nothing more he could do if Mia didn't leave. Liam, I whispered. I'm so sorry. I am too. His voice cracked when he spoke. And I knew he meant it. The final task arrived two days later. The green team had made it through the air task, though not without hardship. The task had struck without warning. One second they were walking through the woods just fine, and the next they were gasping for breath. The elders had been trying to suffocate them. Reynard had gathered enough air for him and Alvarez, then had flown ahead to get more oxygen for himself, the bastard. Ezra used his water power to gather water from a nearby stream. He used it as a force field to carry a large bubble of air over to each of them, which held them over until Diami got high enough in the sky to force air downward with his wings so they could breathe again. Now we sat in Imogen's living room with her family, on the edge of our seats, as our friends reached the water task alongside the red team. They stood at the edge of the ocean, staring up at a huge wall of water. It stretched up at least a hundred feet and was so long that the cameras didn't show the end of it. It was the only thing that stood between them and the finish line on the island out at sea. Reynard looked overly confident on Alvarez's back as they tried to fly up and over the water wall, but it didn't work. A long funnel of water stretched out and slapped them out of the air. Reynard and Alvarez plummeted to the beach and rolled to catch their fall. I half expected Reynard to stay down, but he pushed himself back up. The cameras were high in the air, so we couldn't hear what was happening on the ground. But we could see Reynard flipping off the ocean as if it were to blame. Meanwhile, Ezra, Cade, and Vanessa had their heads together, strategizing. The two remaining members of the red team... Kelsey and a Toakwa guy I didn't know, had already decided what to do. Seeing as there was no way around it, they stepped forward to the wall of water. The guy's sea serpent familiar swam up to meet them and stuck his head out of the wall. They climbed on its back, then the sea serpent carried them into the ocean. Though the wall looked calm on the outside, there was a raging current within, evidenced by the way the red team tumbled through the water. The Toakwa team member used his magic to right them, but the more they swam forward, the more invisible currents took them off course. It looked brutal inside. This looks impossible, I said. Teams without Toakwa team members aren't going to make it. I could, Jonah said with a shrug. I'd create a bubble of air around my head so I could breathe and bring an air pocket inside the water to rocket me to the other side. Shh. Imogen hissed, flapping her hand to keep us quiet. She was at the edge of her seat, holding Sassy so tightly she let out a squeak. The green team faced the wall of water and stepped inside. They were mere shadows in the sea, 
as the current caught them and tumbled them over and over again. Ezra used his magic to help Cade, Vanessa, and their familiars escape the current, while Raynar looked like he was trying to handle it on his own. Somehow, he got out of the current and started swimming alongside them again. They all joined hands and rocketed forward, but another current swept past them. Cade's fingers slipped out of Ezra's, and he was dragged away from them, Arabelle at his side. I found myself holding my breath so long as I watched them that I felt like my lungs were about to explode. I couldn't imagine what they were going through right now. I wanted to turn my eyes away, but I couldn't. Ezra used his magic to control the current and drag Cade back toward them. He seemed exhausted already. I forced myself to take a breath, but it didn't seem fair, not when they were nearly drowning right now. Another current swept through, but Diami threw himself in front of it and blocked the flow of water with his wide wings until the others swam past. Aisha was at the front of their chain and used her wings to help pull the team through the water. The green team was almost to the other side of the wall. You're going to make it, I thought. But I spoke too soon. Another current came through to sweep the team away before Diami could jump in front of it. Raynar struggled to escape the current, kicking forward with everything he had. He had to try extra hard because of his one leg that was still wrapped in a cast. The three of them got out together, but Raynar kept kicking, desperate to escape the water. And he kicked Cade right in the face. My stomach plummeted to my toes. Across the room, Imogen sat straight up and whimpered. Her eyes locked on the TV. Cade and Arabelle went flying backward, straight into a passing current. They were both dragged down and down and down, far into the depths of the sea. Ezra went for them, but was caught up by a second current, dragging him farther away from Cade. My hands shot over my mouth and my fingers trembled. Time altogether stopped as the room went dead silent. All we heard was the soft music playing on the TV. It had all happened so fast. One second Cade was beside them, almost out of the task, and the next we couldn't see him at all. I wanted to scream, but I couldn't find my voice. Ezra was only a dot in the ocean, but I could see him glancing every which way for signs of Cade. He was forced to make the toughest decision a person could make during the Elemental Cup. Did he go back and search for his lost teammate? Or did he save the ones he knew he could? Ezra hesitated, but he chose Vanessa. No! Imogen screamed out in agony. Imogen's parents and brothers were in complete shock, staring at the TV with open mouths. Their family was close to Cade's. It was like losing their brother Trace all over again. I couldn't begin to pretend I knew what Imogen was feeling, but I felt the loss too, even if it was only a fraction of it. Tears began to fall down my shocked face. Imogen's shoulders shook in heavy sobs on the couch beside us. Jonah pulled her into a hug, but she barely seemed to notice he was there. My heart both broke and rejoiced when Ezra and Vanessa, along with their familiars, broke the far edge of the wall. There was another camera on that side waiting for them. Raynar and Alvarez had already gone ahead of them. The camera angle changed to show Kelsey and her teammate arriving at the flag. They'd won. In the background, we could see Alvarez racing toward the flag at the end with Raynar on his back. Ezra and Vanessa were arguing on the beach, though we couldn't hear what they were saying. Vanessa grabbed Ezra's hand as he tried to go back into the wall of water. He ripped his hand from her grasp and went in, despite her and Diami's protests. Ez, no! Liam yelled at the TV. Diami dove into the water behind Ezra. He tried to get Ezra to come back with him, but he wouldn't. Ezra urgently searched for Cade in the water but after a minute that felt like ages, the reality of the situation turned very real. 
even if Cade and Arabelle were still somewhere out in the water, they both would have drowned by now. It was clear what had happened. Cade and Arabelle, they'd died. Diami dragged Ezra from the water, but they were alone. Ezra coughed and sputtered as he gasped for air. None of us could deny it any longer. Cade hadn't made it. Imogen's sobs grew louder. Imogen, her mother said softly. She reached out for her daughter, but Imogen shrugged her off. The tension in the room was palpable. Mom, don't, Imogen snapped. Then she shot up from her seat and pushed Jonah off of her. Don't touch me. I don't want anyone touching me. Honey, Jonah started. Stop. Nothing you can say can make this better, she yelled. Imogen's voice had taken on a quality I couldn't even comprehend. It was worse than sorrow or pain or even grief. It scared me. Imogen put a hand to her head and sobbed in despair. I hate this society. I hate the elders. I hate that we live in a tribe where we kill our own children. The colonizers should have wiped us out centuries ago. Im, Liam said in a strangled voice. She ignored him. I could barely understand her now through the tears. Kate and I were supposed to have a future together. We were supposed to have everything, and it got taken away because this tribe is fucked up. I wish the ancestors would just hurry up and kill us all, because they obviously don't give a shit about what happens to us. I wish the Hawkeye would just die out. Imogen raced out the front door, leaving Sassy behind where she sat. We all exchanged momentary looks of shock. Then I sprang into action. We'll talk to her, I said quickly to her parents as I scooped up Essis and chased Imogen outside. Jonah, Sassy, Squeaks, and Liam followed close behind. Imogen, I called, but she kept on running. I could hear her anguished wails all the way into Kinpago. She didn't stop running until we were in the town square. She'd climbed up into the blessing tree and wept high in its branches. Imogen, I called up to her, but she didn't answer. Liam and Jonah stopped beside me and looked up at her, but we were all clueless on how to help her. Essis hopped out of my arms and scurried up the tree to her. Sassy barked at the base of the blessing tree, and Squeaks squawked, but Imogen ignored them all. Jonah turned to us and sighed. You guys might as well take a seat. This might take a while. Jonah started climbing the tree, stopping to sit on a branch beside Imogen. He didn't say anything or try to coax her down. He was just there for her while she tried to deal with the weight of losing the man she loved. I sank to the ground with my back to the large trunk. Liam sat beside me and wrapped me in his arms. My stomach felt heavy and empty all at the same time as I tried to understand exactly what Imogen was going through. I couldn't imagine losing Liam like that. It was unbearable to even think about existing without my true love. And that was Imogen's new reality. It took at least an hour before I heard Imogen speak. She was talking to Jonah, but I could hear her soft voice travel down to us on the ground. He kept telling me this could happen, but I didn't want to believe it actually would, she said thickly. I glanced up to see Jonah rubbing her back. No one can prepare for this kind of thing, Im, he told her. They continued to speak in hushed whispers, while Liam and I shot worried glances at each other. My gut twisted even more. I felt awful for her. Eventually, Imogen came down from the tree as darkness began to fall over Kinpago. She wiped at her red, puffy eyes. I'm sorry. Don't be sorry, Im, I told her. You cry all you need to. She sniffled. I wasn't ready to plan my boyfriend's funeral. 
You're never ready to let go of someone you love, Liam said gently. Imogen tearfully nodded. No, but thanks for being here for me. I don't think I could make it, make it through this without you guys. We'll always be here for you, Em, Liam said as he stepped forward and pulled her into an embrace. She started crying again. All four of us and our familiars wrapped her in a group hug. Even after hours to process it, I still couldn't believe Cade was gone. Chapter 19 The day of the trial had finally arrived, and I was pretty sure that I'd have a heart attack and die before I even got to the stand. I'd been anxious in the days leading up to the trial, but was able to shrug the feelings off, because it wasn't here yet. Now that it was, I felt like I was going to hurl or jump out of my skin. If we lost today, we'd be going to jail. Or worse. I almost wanted the worst to be here just so it would be over. No matter what happened, it couldn't be as unbearable and torturous as this waiting was. Not knowing was much worse than anything the elders could do to us. I hadn't slept well, and neither had Sophia. She was staring at me when I opened my eyes, as if she was trying to remember all the little details of my face, just in case this was the last time we woke up together. Essis was still sleeping, curled up in a ball by her head. It's here, she whispered. It was still dark in the room. It was going to be a long day. Yeah. I gave her a good morning kiss, then forced myself upward. Let's get ready. We took a shower together, though we didn't fool around. We were too somber. I put on my best suit, and Sophia had a modest dress. I wore a red tie, and Sophia's dress was blue. We were going to show that the elders couldn't push us around. We stand together until the very end. Before we left my room, Sophia wrapped me in a hug. We're going to win today. I hope so. I put my face in her hair. I didn't want to be ripped away from this. Us? I'd lost so much in my life. I didn't know how much else I could lose. Essis was up by now. He sat on top of my head and hugged it like he was confident too. I know it, Sophia said. I was right about winning the cup, and I'm right about this, too. I gave a humorless laugh and said, Well, hopefully by the end of today you can say I told you so. We headed downstairs, where Mom immediately pushed breakfast at us. Eat, she said. You're going to need your strength today. Neither of us felt very hungry, but she was right, so Sophia and I forced ourselves to consume something anyway. Essis was the only one who swallowed eggs like he was starving. Dad had already left to get ready for the trial. The rest of my siblings were all sleeping, except Ezra. He sat at the dining table and stared at his pancakes listlessly, like the thought of swallowing them was a huge ordeal. He'd been like that since Cade died. Cade's funeral had been horrible. I'd been to a lot of funerals in my life, but his was one of the worst. Both his and Imogen's family were devastated. They couldn't accept the news that he was gone and bitterly wailed that the tribe had taken away someone so cherished by them. The elders had searched, but they'd never found the body. His and Arabelle's remains had been swept off by the waves, so he ended up putting two empty caskets in the ground. I felt terrible for Imogen. She never got to say her final goodbye. She'd changed since Cade's death. She never smiled or laughed anymore, and the quirky parts of her personality were gone. It was like someone had taken all of her color and painted it gray. She wore sweatpants with t-shirts, a blank face, and messy hair in the absence of her usual big dresses, flashy makeup, and weird outfits. Her gaze was calculating, like she was contemplating on how she could get revenge on the elders for taking away the love of her life. Even Sassy was depressed. Her red fur had almost taken on a dulled tone. It was like the best parts of them had died along with Cade and Arabelle. We all skipped the elemental ball. No one wanted to go without Cade. But as worried as I was about Imogen, 
I was more concerned about my brother. Even though Ezra was still alive, that didn't mean he hadn't died too and become someone else. He'd apologized over and over again to Imogen, to me, to everyone that he'd let Kay die, even though we'd reassured him that it wasn't his fault. His best friend had drowned in front of him, and he felt responsible. Ezra was jumpy and on edge. He freaked out at loud noises and stayed away from the water completely. He refused to use his element. He lived with this constant haunted look on his face, like he was replaying Cade's death over and over again in his mind. At his side, Diami often hung his head and was losing feathers. Ezra didn't even go out with girls anymore. He'd all but lost interest in dating. He wasn't the happy kid I once knew, and that shattered me. The elemental cup had changed him. Yet secretly I was selfish, because a part of me was glad Ezra hadn't found Cade. If he had, there was no way he would have been able to pull him out of the water in time. They both would have drowned. I couldn't have even saved him. Ezra was still alive, and I had Cade to thank for that. Halfway through breakfast, Ezra left without a word. I wasn't sure where he was going. The carriage is outside waiting to take you to the courthouse, Mom said. She brushed back my hair and kissed me on the forehead. You'll be fine. Everything will work out. I could see the crinkles of concern around her eyes. Mom never got worried. She handled everything in life like a warship. If she was concerned. We have to go. We have a half hour, Sophia said. She got up and I followed her to the carriage. We sat on opposite sides of the carriage and remained silent. Neither one of us were very touchy-feely today. I think both of us were too absorbed in our own thoughts on the price we'd pay if the elders ruled against us. Liam? Sophia asked after a time. Hmm? I looked up. She didn't appear scared as she asked the question. If we're ordered to be executed, how are they going to do it? I paused for a long moment. I'm not sure if I want to tell you. I want to know what I'm getting into, Sophia said firmly. I sighed. I kicked the side of the carriage slightly and said, When elementi are executed, it's seen as a form of humiliation. You've brought shame onto your tribe and need to be made an example of. So you're usually killed by your opposite element. You pluma are buried alive or crushed. Navita are either dropped to their deaths or suffocated. So... Her eyebrows knitted together. I nodded. You're right. If things go the worst possible way they can today, you'll be drowned and I'll be burned alive. Our friends and families will be forced to watch. She shook her head in disgust. This society's barbaric. Well, that's why we're doing our part to change things. Right? I asked. Sophia gave a slight grimace but I could see the realizations playing across her face. After all this time, she finally understood what I'd been getting at when I said we could lose our lives. The carriage slowed as it landed on Kinpago's streets. The roads were crowded with people. When we got to the courthouse, my eyes widened in shock. Hundreds of elementi were outside of it with their familiars, protesting. People and magical creatures both held up signs and marched, shouting chants, phrases, and slurs. It seemed like the protesters were split into two sides. One side was the Interhouse Alliance. Their signs read things like, Interhouse couples deserve our respect, and unify the tribe. One big banner read, They saved our familiars, so we repay with death? The Alliance protesters walked around with megaphones, chanting over and over, Free our tribe! Love is not a crime! The other side was obviously against us. Their signs were mostly derogatory, reading things like, Keep the bloodline pure, or Interhouse relationships are a sin, and Do you want a mixed society? I didn't care to repeat many of the things they were saying. I never had imagined my love for Sophia would lead to this. There was so much hate. 
but positively, I noticed that the opposing side was much smaller than the Interhouse Alliance, which made me feel a little better. I'd noticed in the past few weeks even the people who didn't agree with our lifestyle had quieted down because we'd eliminated the plague. Only the worst jackasses alive still thought we should be penalized for loving someone outside of their own house. The media was having a field day. There were cameras and reporters everywhere. They swarmed around the edge of the courthouse, waiting for us to emerge from the carriage. Task force members held back the mob, threatening protesters with shields and noxite guns. Sophia looked at me. She extended her hand. You ready for this? I grabbed her hand tightly in mine. As ready as I'll ever be. We stepped out of the carriage. A mix of boos and cheers met our ears as we proceeded up the courthouse steps. Essa sat proudly on Sophia's shoulder and puffed up his tail, like he knew all of our opposers were wrong and we were going to succeed. I kept Sophia close by my side and my eyes on the courthouse doors. Reporters screamed questions, but we ignored them. Vanderbilt was waiting by the door. He guided us into a small, private room and said, I've prepared your defense. What we've got here is the best we're going to get. Just let me do most of the talking, all right? If you say so, I replied dully. It was quiet in the courthouse compared to the raging noise outside, but for some reason it only made me more uneasy. Wait here, I'll come get you when the trial begins, Vanderbilt said. He left Sophia and I alone in the room. Essis squeaked, but that was the only noise that could be heard. More waiting. I couldn't fucking take it anymore. Sophia sat down in a chair and put her head in her hands. I put a hand on her shoulder just because I felt like I had to comfort her. At least we got a trial, I told her, but the positivity felt fake. Most inner house couples don't even get that. She lifted her head. I guess it's a good thing that they decided to try us together, too. I don't think I could take two court dates. Me either. The door is opened. We expected Vanderbilt, but we got Jonah, Imogen, Ezra, Vanessa, Lindsay, and Miranda. Their familiars weren't here, most likely waiting outside in the halls, I supposed. What are you guys doing? I asked. I knew Jonah, Imogen, and Ezra were going to be at the trial for support, but I wasn't sure why the rest of them were here. Vanderbilt called some of us in as witnesses, Imogen said. Though that's not the only reason. We're here for backup, just in case. You guys aren't going to jail, Jonah said darkly. And you're certainly not being executed, Imogen added. If things don't rule in your favor, Jonah and I are willing to do whatever it takes to get you guys out of town. Exactly. Lindsay added. If Miranda and I can be together, it's not fair you guys can't. We need to make a stand. Hell yeah, we do. Ezra cracked his knuckles. He looked ready for a fight. No worse, like he wanted something to happen. Vanessa, you can't. You're pregnant, Sophia protested. I've talked to Bren, and we've decided together we don't want to raise our baby in a tribe that doesn't support inter-house couples, Vanessa said, laying a hand on Sophia's arm. He and I will step in if it looks like the elders are going to go with the death penalty. But you guys can't do that. You'll be fugitives, I protested. Fuck this society. I don't want to be a part of it if you guys aren't accepted, Imogen said violently. Me too, Jonah added. The rest of them had similar words of agreement. But you're only a few people. You can't take on the entire tribe alone, Sophia said. They won't be alone. They'll have the alliance. Jamin Risk had showed up out of nowhere. She was wearing a business suit and looking fierce. She stopped before us and crossed her arms. We have Navita demolitionists on standby to start toppling buildings if worse comes to worse. Excuse me, what? Sophia's eyes popped out of her head, and S's peeped. You heard me, Sophia. I have elementi from all houses stationed around Kinpago waiting on my signal. If this doesn't go our way, we're going to start a riot, and it won't be a small protest, Jamin said in a deadly tone. We have to start fighting fire with fire. You can't do that. People will die on our behalf. We're not okay with that, I protested. I'm sorry, but this isn't about you anymore, 
Jamin's eyes narrowed. Hundreds of interhouse couples are depending on the outcome of the case, and we're willing to use any means necessary to get the elders to change their minds on interhouse relationships, even force. I looked to the rest of the group, but none of them spoke up. Our friends didn't care about the rest of the tribe, as long as it meant getting us to safety. None of this is going to be necessary. We'll win our case, Sophia argued. Jamin gave a skeptical snort. For your sakes, I hope so. Jamin walked out. She passed Vanderbilt on the way in. He barely acknowledged her as he stood in front of us. Miss Henley, Mr. Mito, it's time. See you guys on the other side, I whispered as I passed our friend group. They gave us lonely waves. Sophia and I glanced at each other as we made our way out. The same thought was on our minds. If we lost today, Jamin and the Interhouse Alliance would turn Kinpago into a war zone. Imogen and Ezra wouldn't mind helping. They were both loose cannons right now. Jamin Risk was the type of person who'd resort to terrorism to further the cause. She didn't care if people got hurt, as long as she got what she wanted. Sophia and I needed to get a pardon. Otherwise, we wouldn't be the only ones to die today. The courtroom was gigantic. It was circular, with 20 seats behind a huge bench at the head of the room where the elders would sit. The entire room was made of white marble and had wide wooden chairs that would sit at least 300 elementi and their familiars. Columns were placed in organized rows, and windows that were set in the ceiling beamed light downward. Vanderbilt took us to the defendant desk on the right side of the room. Sophia and I sat down, and she placed Essis on the table. On the other side of the room, a lawyer gathered papers at the plaintiff's station. He was attorney Greg Miller. He was middle-aged, stocky, and all business. He worked for the tribe prosecuting criminals and hardly ever lost. I bet he had a ton of evidence stacked against us that he was going to present. A pit bull familiar walked at his side and growled at us. The wooden benches were crowded with people excited to witness the trial. This was the biggest case of the century. For Sophia and I, this was one of the worst days of our lives. For others, this was entertainment. Our friends sat in the closest bench behind us and waited. Sophia's grandparents and my mom took the seat behind them, along with Maddie. Mom had gotten a sitter for the younger kids at home. She didn't want them to see this. Beside her sat Bane, who I supposed had showed up for moral support. You know, just in case he had to catch Mom after she fainted from me being sentenced to death. I caught sight of Mia's face in the crowd. I was surprised Micah had let her come, but maybe she'd snuck out. She had a new bruise on her face. Mia waved and mouthed, good luck. At her side, her familiar waved a tiny flag with the interhouse colors on it. Well, at least it was nice Mia showed up to support us, even though we'd had a disastrous encounter with Micah the last time we saw her. It was like the Mia with Micah and the Mia without him were totally different. I hoped she'd leave him soon, but I severely doubted it. The trial was supposed to start at 8.30, but we waited for a half an hour and none of the elders arrived. The crowds behind us began to whisper impatiently, what was taking so long? Eventually, a security guard came into the center of the room and said, All rise for the arrival of the Elder Council. There was a lot of noise as people stood, and in entered the sixteen elders from each of the respective houses, along with each chief and chiefess. Toakwa took the left side of the room with Navida next to them, Yapluma in the middle, and Koigni on the far right side. Their familiars joined the benches behind them, those that could fit, anyway. The bigger ones sat on the floor before the benches and observed. A couple of the water ones were missing. They were still in the ocean. I searched for Dad and found him sitting next to Chief Nahili from Nevida. Dad was stone-faced and calm. I resolved myself not to freak out unless I saw him losing control. There were so many new faces on the council. I didn't know half of these people. Had the plague wiped out that many familiars and their elders that the council had basically been replaced overnight? 
Elder Oleander was already giving us a scathing grin. I didn't have to guess what his vote was going to be. He'd made up his mind before he got in here. The trial was just a formality to him. Chiefess Annette was staring at Sophia like she couldn't wait to put her in her place. This would be payback for all the time Sophia had gone after Haley. Madame Doya's expression, on the other hand, was unreadable. She sat by the wall on the far side of the room and remained emotionless, like the trial already bored her. Naomi was still beside her, a cat waiting to pounce. Sophia and I were made to take an oath to the ancestors that we would tell the truth before the charges against us were read. I hardly processed them. This still didn't seem real. Let's get down to business, Chief Nahili begun. He was leading the trial because he was Navida and a neutral party, as well as the oldest chieftain. We'll start by examining Mr. Maito and move onward to Miss Hanley from there. There was a loud smacking sound against one of the windows. Someone was throwing things. A group of people outside were banging on the glass, trying to get in. They looked like Alliance members. Shut them up, will you? Elder Oleander barked. I've had enough of them today. A few of the task force members inside the courtroom moved. A few minutes later, the protesters were dragged away from the windows. It clicked while the elders had been late. Had there been fights outside the courthouse? Mr. Maito, please proceed to the stand, Chief Nahili said. I slowly stood up. My legs felt like they were going to collapse as I made my way to the stand, though I hoped I put on a good appearance of being undisturbed. I sat behind the large witness stand, and Chief Nahili began reading from a long list. Liam Maito, you are hereby charged with high treason, for having a romantic and intimate relationship with someone who is not from your house tribe. How do you plead? He pleads not guilty, your honor, Vanderbilt spoke for me, rising from his chair as he did. Not guilty, Chiefess Makawi from Yapluma asked curiously. Is Mr. Maito not publicly and romantically involved with this woman? She gestured to Sophia. That he is, Chiefess, but we are making the motion that he is not guilty on account that interhouse relationships should be made legal within the tribal system, Vanderbilt began. Shocked murmurs hovered around the courtroom. This was a bold move, but the only way Vanderbilt assured us we would win. There was too much evidence stacked against us. We'd only walk free if we could prove interhouse relationships should be legalized in the first place. Chief Nahili raised his hands, and the room quieted. Very well. If that is the stance you wish to take, Mr. Vanderbilt, you may proceed. Vanderbilt came forward. Mr. Maito, if you could please start at the beginning. Tell me how you and Miss Henley met, and how your relationship formed from there. We'd rehearsed this yesterday night. I took a deep breath. Last year, I was assigned by Head Dean Ulrich and the other heads of the four houses from Arenda Academy to escort Sophia Henley from her home in Utah to Kinpago. She'd been sheltered from our society all her life and didn't know anything about our world. The family that had raised her was Tawakwa, so they thought I'd be a good choice in convincing them to allow Sophia to attend school here. Something changed while I was telling the story. My eyes caught Sophia's, and the narration of facts became something stronger. I'd like Sophia from the moment I met her, but I didn't want to admit it. I knew interhouse relationships were forbidden, but the more I tried to pull away from her, the closer we became. We got paired up on the same Elemental Cup team, and from there I knew I was in love with her. Our connection soon became something that was undeniable. We started dating formally in January, though we kept our relationship hidden. Sophia was smiling at me like I was the only guy in the world for her. I gave her a reassuring grin back. So you didn't go into this relationship with the intention of starting some sort of revolution or rebellion? Vanderbilt asked. No, I said, shaking my head. It was never my intention to overthrow the elders or Sophia's. We just wanted to be together. And you tried to stop it, correct? Vanderbilt asked. 
Yes, I said. I broke up with Sophia in May of this year. We spent several months apart, but it didn't matter. I learned I couldn't be without her. We got back together in October and agreed that we needed to go public with our relationship. We wanted people to accept us for who we were. We didn't want to hide it anymore. And you think that good has come out of your relationship, yes? Even that which is beneficial for the tribe? You did manage to cure the plague that was overtaking much of Kinpago only a few weeks ago, Vanderbilt persisted. Sort of, I said, and I shrugged. We didn't find the cure for the plague. Our friend Imogen Arnold did. We only spread the word because she was in the hospital after being viciously attacked by a magical creature. I eyed Elder Revero, who gave me a cold stare back. Elder Revero was Raynar's dad. I wasn't sure if he wanted us to go down for this or not. I could see the questions burning in his eyes about the prophecy and what it meant, and he couldn't get answers if Sophia and I were dead or out of his reach in prison. But he couldn't interrogate us on the prophecy either, not with all these people watching. It was supposed to remain a secret from the other tribes. If he didn't want to show his hand, he had to keep quiet. Ah, makes sense, Vanderbilt turned to the council. There you have it, the honest tale of two young people in love. Nothing more, nothing less. Nothing more, my foot, an elder from Yapluma spoke up. The way they look at each other is disgusting. Elder Wallace, please, Chiefess Makawi said. Let's try to keep this civil. If you ask me, the fact that they were able to cure the plague at all is rather suspicious, Mallison grumbled from his place next to Oleander. All these familiars get sick, then all of a sudden, when these two need to gain public favor, they're miraculously able to cure an illness our best alchemists and doctors failed to treat. I think they had something to do with the plague starting in the first place. Not to mention that many familiars still remain missing. Many magical creatures were kidnapped and so far haven't returned, Madame Chavis from Coigny spoke. She gazed at me with a cruel, narrow stare. I was betting she blamed Sophia and I for her twin's death. Vanderbilt was starting to sweat, but Dad spoke up. There is no evidence for either Miss Henley or Mr. Mito's involvement in either of these cases, he said. Let's get back to the facts here. Easy for you to say. That's your boy being tried, Liwanu, Madam Chavis shot at him. With all due respect, I'd watch your tongue if I were you, Madam Chavis, Dad said lowly. The elders began to argue amongst each other until Chief Nahili banged a gavel. That's enough. We must keep proceeding. Mr. Miller, you have the floor to cross-examine. Miller got up and walked to the middle of the room, his pit bull following. He tugged on his suit jacket before he asked, eh, Mr. Mito, I notice you're missing a familiar today, but you competed in the Elemental Cup last year. Can you tell me where your familiar is currently? I knew they'd bring Nishoma into this. He died. And how did he die, precisely? Miller questioned. I kept my curled fists hidden underneath the stand. He died trying to protect me. It was over a year ago, before I met Sophia. Hmm, I see. Miller didn't look surprised at all. But this is odd, you see, because as we all know, an Elementi can't survive without their familiar. Can you tell me how you're still alive over a year later, Mr. Mito? Your guess is as good as mine. It's still a mystery to me, I said blandly. Your guess is as good as mine, Miller repeated me, then turned to the audience with wide arms. There seem to be a lot of things about this couple we don't know. Their involvement with the plague, the missing familiars, even how Mr. Mito is alive today. It's not a living you want, trust me, I told him. What exactly do you mean by that, Mr. Mito? Miller raised an eyebrow. I have a rare disability. It became active after I lost my familiar, I said. Do you have a name for this rare condition? It's uh, not in your file, Miller said. It's undiagnosed, I said quickly. He gave me a skeptical look. An undiagnosed condition, another unknown how very convenient. This is all starting to sound very suspicious, Mr. Mito. How do we know you are actually ill? 
You look fine to me, Miller said. Sophia's look was pleading for me to calm down and not lose my shit. I took a steadying breath and said, Well, there are plenty of disabilities you can't see, and it's very ableist to claim that just because you can't visibly see me suffering that I'm not. Is there anyone in this courtroom that can bring forth any sort of facts to this case instead of just hearsay? Miller asked loudly. Some evidence would be nice. Vanderbilt rose and spoke to the elders. We have a witness who can present proof that Mr. Mito's health isn't as stable as Mr. Miller would claim it to be. I would like to call Dr. Jacques Perrault forward. There was silence. I searched the courtroom for Professor Perrault, who I was sure was sitting in the audience. We'd talked to him about being there only last week. He wasn't there. I scanned the crowd three times, but there wasn't a sign of him, nor his peacock Baxter. Where was Perot? He was supposed to be here. He was a key witness. Sophia looked just as panicked as I felt. Essis rose on his tiptoes to search for Perot, but he was nowhere to be found. Vanderbilt looked embarrassed. Miller gave a smug smile and said, It seems your witness has refused to come forward, sir. My heart fell. It was obvious Perot wasn't coming. Why had he abandoned us when we needed him most? Our first witness had copped out on us, and one of the most important. We were totally going to lose. Chief Mito should be able to verify that his son's health isn't in optimal condition, Madame Wells spoke, tossing her long braid behind her. She sat on Dad's opposite side and was reserved and calm as usual. Chief Mito will say anything to get his son off the death penalty, Elder Rivero snapped. He's hardly a witness. It's a conflict of interest to even have him judge this case. All chiefs have the right to sit on trials of high treason, whether or not those accused are related, for house loyalty is considered to be thicker than blood relations, Dad said. I knew he was reciting word for word from the tribal book of law. I will not say anything verifying or condemning my son's condition. That's all very well, Chief Mito, but perhaps someone in this courtroom can shine some light on how your son survived the Elemental Cup last year, Miller began. Footage from the cup showed that your son was very close to death before Miss Henley showed up. He ended up crawling into a cave with severe injuries and burns and walking out with nothing on him. Does anyone care to explain that? Shit, I didn't think that would come up. Sophia and I hadn't told Vanderbilt about Essis's healing powers either because we didn't trust him that far. There was silence in the courtroom for a few minutes before Sophia stood up. I can explain that. Soph, what are you doing? She couldn't reveal Essis now. But instead, she grabbed the totem that hung around her neck and pulled it over her head. The spirit totem. Fuck, she couldn't give that away. It was too valuable. But it was the only thing we had to barter with. Sophia displayed the totem to the elders and said, I found this during the cup when I was wandering around by myself after the fire took over the forest. I thought it was just a cool carving, so I kept it. But after I found Liam in the cave, I gave it to him and it healed him of his injuries. I think it might be an Anachi artifact. Sophia handed the totem to Vanderbilt. He didn't know anything about this, but he acted like he did. Elder Baron, you're an expert on Anachi lore, Vanderbilt said. Would you mind taking a look at this? Elder Baron was from Nevida. His familiar, a python that was over 20 feet long, snaked down from the judging stand and took the totem from Vanderbilt. She deposited the totem in his hand and he studied it closely. This does look like an energy object, he said, though not similar to one I've ever seen. It's quite unique. Yes, but can it do magic? Chiefess Annette asked impatiently. She looked at the totem greedily, like she wanted to get her hands on it. I've never known of energy totems that could heal, Elder Baron confessed. But much of what we knew about the Soul Tribe has been lost to history. Some magical races can enchant objects or infuse them with magic. I don't see why an Anachi couldn't transfer some of their healing power to an object. It kept many things secret from the rest of the tribe. Elder Baron passed the totem down the line. 
Dad studied it closely, while the rest of the elders talked in low voices. If this is true and this totem can heal, why didn't you turn the artifact into the elders of your house immediately after the cup was over? Madame Chavis barked at Sophia. Such possessions belong to the tribe. I showed the totem to Madame Doya, Sophia said. But she said it wasn't anything special, so I just kept it as a souvenir from the tournament. Is this true, Eleanor? Dad passed the totem to Wells and looked at Madame Doya. Doya gave an impassive sniff and sat back in her seat. It is true, Sophia did show me the totem, but I did not feel any sense of power when I held it. I mistook it for a child's plaything. Did she tell you that she used it to heal Leah Mito? Elder Baron asked. Of course she did, but I didn't take her at her word. I hardly supposed such an insignificant little thing would be enough to save Mito's life, and brushed it off as the fanciful dreams of a first year who knew little to nothing about our world, Doya said. Naomi growled in agreement. There were many possibilities on how he could have survived the cup, as being theorized at the time by the council. How was I to know Sophia was actually telling the truth? Not to mention that she couldn't prove the totem could actually heal at the time of her showing it to me. I was shocked. When Sophia told Doya about the totem, Soph had made it clear to me that she hadn't told Doya about its magical powers, soul or otherwise. Why would Doya lie on our behalf? Sophia and Doya shared an impassive gaze that had the slightest undertone of an agreement within. It was clear. Doya still thought Sophia was the chosen one, destined to bring Coigny to glory. And Sophia couldn't very well fulfill the prophecy if she was in jail or dead. Doya would lie all day if it meant getting Sophia off so she could do her duty to her house. Forgive me, Madame Doya, but an object like this should have been brought to the attention of the council immediately, Elder Baron said. It was foolish of you to disregard it. Doya gave a cold laugh. If you think I'm some sort of expert on magical artifacts, then you are sorely mistaken. I would be careful not to overstep, Elder Baron. I've been on this council a lot longer than you have. Elder Baron turned pink, and there were a few insults mumbled by members of the Nevita house, which Doya shrugged off. The elders weren't doing a very good job of interrogating us. If anything, they were confused and disorganized. Half of them couldn't get along well enough to cross-examine me. Can you give a demonstration on the totem's healing abilities? Miller asked, crossing his arms. Sophia shook her head. No, I think the totem only had enough power for one healing. I couldn't get it to work after that. Of course not, Miller shook his head. More circumstantial evidence. Sophia blinked innocently. She was doing good at playing the part of the dumb little girl. It was clear Doya approved. I wondered if they talked about this before the trial. Wait, of course they talked about this. Before we left school, Sophia had told me she had a meeting with Doya about next semester. It was pretty clear now that meeting wasn't about signing up for classes and more about Doya giving Sophia acting lessons. I wondered what other tricks Sophia and Doya had waiting in the wings. The Elder Council will be confiscating this artifact, Miss Henley, to study it further, Madame Wells said, and she handed it off to a court official. We thank you for your honesty. The court official took the totem through a pair of double doors. There it went. We'd lost the spirit totem. That was a major blow. But if it helped us win this trial, it was a fair sacrifice. Miller flipped through some files on his desk. Well, as uncertain as the court is of your physical condition, Mr. Mito, we can reach a conclusion on your mental state. Oh, hell to the fuck no. What do you mean? Miller went to his desk and raised a file. According to the records by your therapist's office, you had a recent suicide attempt no less than 12 weeks ago. How the hell had they gotten their hands on those? They were supposed to be private and inaccessible to anyone whom I hadn't given permission to view. I suppose the elders weren't opposed to using underhanded illegal tactics. I gave a stony face back and said, 
That's private. There's no such thing as privacy when it comes to high treason, Mr. Mito, Miller spat. Tell us, did you or did you not try to take your own life? He had me cornered. But screw him, I was gonna fight back. Fine, you wanna know the truth? I did try to kill myself. I was depressed, I said sharply. But I'm getting better now, and it's because of Sophia. She's the one who made me go to therapy. She's the one who's been supporting me no matter what. She's the one who stopped me before I jumped off that bridge. So if you want the reason on why I'm still alive, there she is. I pointed to Sophia. Essis clapped loudly, but he was the only one. Miller turned away from me. He was obviously done cross-examining. Elders, it's clear that this young man's mental health is unstable, Miller argued. The stress from being in this inter-house relationship is obviously too much for him to handle. It could even be deduced that Miss Henley, as an outsider to our culture, manipulated Mr. Mito into an inter-house relationship, and he fell victim to her control. Objection! This is getting absurd, Vanderbilt shouted. Miller ignored him and instead turned to my father. Chief Mito, as I understand it, your son was very much a law-abiding member of society, even in line to be chief, before his familiar died. Everything a perfect Hawkeye boy should be. Do you think his behavior has changed since Miss Henley came into his life? Dad looked uncomfortable. There really wasn't an answer he could give that wouldn't condemn me either way. I, uh, can't say. There you have it. Is there really anything more to say, ladies and gentlemen? Miller asked. I didn't get why he was doing this. Sophia and I were both on trial. There was no way I was innocent when it came to me being with her. Then I saw the eyes of Malison and Oleander eyeing Sophia greedily, along with a couple of others on various house councils. Then I realized this all led back to the prophecy. Doya was still fighting for the prophecy to come true, but other houses were still trying to prevent it. And the Coigny Council no longer believed Sophia was the prophesied one, which meant they didn't care what happened to her either way. Sophia was their real target. I was just an obstacle in the way of the bigger picture. This was quickly becoming a witch hunt. Mr. Mito, may I suggest that if you testify against Miss Henley, the court will understand your vulnerable position and significantly reduce your sentence, Miller asked. Fuck him. I'd burn at the stake first before I threw Sophia under the bus. I raised the level of my voice so everyone could hear me clearly. What you're trying to do isn't going to work. I'm not going to testify against my girlfriend. I made a decision to be with her willingly of my own sound mind, and whatever punishment you're going to hand out to her, you're going to give me the same thing. Because if her loving me has broken the law, I've done the same damn thing. There were a few claps from the audience this time, which were quieted by Nahili. It was clear that Miller wasn't done with the Sophia seducing me angle yet, but he let it go to move on to something else. Very well, Miller said. He didn't seem bothered. He couldn't pick at my health or sanity anymore which meant he had something else up his sleeve. Mr. Mito, I would like you to answer this next question honestly. Have you and Sophia Henley had any sexual relations? Objection! Vanderbilt rose from his seat. Elders, this goes too far. On the contrary, elders, it is the most crucial part of this case, Miller insisted. Uh, we'll allow it, Chief Nahili said, and he gestured to me. Go on, son. Answer the question. Everyone's eyes in the courtroom were on me. Oh, Sophia's grandparents were sitting right there, along with my own mom and dad. This was freaking embarrassing. But you know what? Screw it. I wasn't going to be ashamed of having sex with Sophia. It was a way to express our love, and we both were of age. Nobody would think twice if we were banging and from the same house. It's what college kids did. We were in a committed relationship, and we cared about each other. We wanted to get married someday. Why was it such a big deal if we shared our bodies anyhow? We weren't doing anything wrong. I straightened up and said firmly, Yes, we have. The courtroom broke out into an instant uproar. 
Many people shouted in alarm and said things like mopite and fornification. Elder Nahili banged the gavel several times, but it took a while for everyone to calm down. Mom and Dad didn't look surprised, nor did Sophia's grandparents. I figured they had to have guessed anyway. Mr. Maito, this is a very serious confession, Miller said slowly. An inter-house relationship is one thing, but do you understand that having intercourse with Miss Henley could result in mixed house children? I wanted to snap at him. Well, duh. But instead, I forced out, we're not trying to have a baby. We're using protection. My words sounded so small and meek to me. I was losing my position. But accidents happen, don't they, Mr. Mito? You do understand that if she was to conceive, you and Miss Henley would breed an inter-house child? One who has no place in this society, Miller asked. Why wouldn't our child have a place here, I said. I was almost shouting. I was getting pissed. What's wrong with having a mixed house kid anyway? Why are they any different? Vanderbilt's face was horrified. He couldn't defend this. I was saying the exact opposite of what the elders wanted to hear, and Vanderbilt wasn't sure if he could backtrack and recover from that. I wished he'd fucking step in and say something. He was supposed to be my lawyer. I wanted him to defend me, but mostly I'd been defending myself. Mr. Mito, mixed house children are significantly weaker than children bred from parents of a singular house. If tribe lines were to disintegrate, we'd lose our culture and our way of life. The elementi would die out, Miller argued. Show me evidence, I said. Give me one fact that proves mixed house children are weak, and I'll believe you. Miller stared open-mouthed at me. I finally had him cornered. You can't produce any because it's not true, I said. The tribe used to interbreed for centuries before Anichi fell. The law against interhouse relationships hasn't even been around that long, except for the last few generations. And even though Sophia and I aren't trying to have a child, any baby we could make together is one I'd be proud of. I don't believe in throwing children away like the rest of this society does. Surprised voices littered the courtroom. Miller saw an opportunity to advance and said, That sounds like a challenge to the elders, Mr. Mito. There's no challenge, just me wanting to protect my own, I said. At the start of this trial, you claimed you had no intention of starting a movement, a rebellion. But what you fail to realize is that you and Miss Hanley have, Miller began. That's none of my concern. How people react to my relationship isn't any business of mine, I shot at him. I'm doing my best to remain uninvolved. But you aren't uninvolved, are you, Mr. Mito? The Interhouse Alliance has been using you as an example for furthering their cause, Miller shot at me. Big deal. It's not something I wanted, I said bitterly. Vanderbilt needed to get me off the stand because I was only making things worse. Just as I thought that, Vanderbilt practically jumped in front of Miller and said, Are you done badgering my client, Mr. Miller? Because your reaching has pushed this court to the point of being a circus. Miller eyed Vanderbilt cautiously before he turned back to the elders. No further questions, for now. Chief Nahili rubbed his face. He looked tired. Uh, the court will take a short recess. We shall question witnesses and begin cross-examination of Miss Henley once we return. Court will resume in one hour. He banged the gavel. The courtroom bustled with activity. I got off the stand and rejoined Sophia. She picked up Essis, and we followed Vanderbilt back to the private waiting room. What the hell was that? I asked Vanderbilt the moment the door was closed. Are you my lawyer or are you going to stand by and watch this go down? I am rather out of practice, Vanderbilt said and he frowned. I haven't participated in an active trial in years. Then work on getting it together. We're getting massacred out there, I shouted. Liam, Sophia put a hand on my shoulder. Let's try to calm down. We aren't done for yet. Soph, they threw everything they had at me. They dug up stuff I didn't even think they could get their hands on, I said. What do you think they're going to ask you? Because it's probably ten times worse. Sophia gave a hardened look. They can throw anything they want at me. I can take it. She glanced at Vanderbilt. Give us a minute. He left, 
grumbling under his breath. Sophia forced me to sit down. Liam, whatever comes up in that courtroom next, you can't explode. You can't show any emotion. Our lives depend on it. I took a few calming, deep breaths. Okay, but what do you expect me to do? Just sit there while they call my girlfriend a harlot? Because you know they're going to do that. It's one of their angles. Yes, I can handle myself, Sophia said firmly. Doya and I talked about this, and she has a plan. But you've got to trust that we're going to make it through this. I forced myself to simmer. Fine, I stood up. I need some air. Don't take too long, Sophia said. She cuddled Essis to her as I slipped out the door. Cameras were everywhere, so I slipped into an isolated hallway and headed to the bathroom. It was thankfully empty. I didn't think the media was allowed this far into the courthouse. I washed my face, just to try and snap out of it. I needed to have a cool head. This trial was taking everything out of me. On the way back, I heard hushed, aggravated voices coming from around the corner. One of them I recognized was Dad's. The other had to be Oleander. I pressed myself close to the wall to listen in. I don't think you understand my meaning, Oleander said lowly. I had to strain to hear him. I understand intently, Dad said, his voice full of hatred. At his side, I heard Tatum give a low growl that was clearly an undelivered threat. This trial can go one of two ways. You don't want to lose my vote, Oleander said. His tone was filled with slightly suppressed glee. If you want your son to walk out of here alive, you'll do as you're told. Understood, Dad replied. I felt a chill go through me. What the hell? Dad didn't take orders, he made them. What was this about? Don't think that this deal ends once the trial is over. I've heard your boy's condition has managed to stabilize, but that doesn't mean he can't get sicker, Oleander threatened. And very quickly, leave my son out of this. He has nothing to do with what's going on in the council. Dad's tone was dark and intimidating. Your son will be fine, so long as you do what you're told. Oleander replied. If you fail to follow orders, don't be surprised when your eldest ends up in the hospital. Again. Or perhaps something more permanent. You've got an abundance of children to work through. I won't stop with just one. Was this guy threatening my family? What a shithead. I was gonna kill him. My family is none of your concern. I inducted you into the Toakwa elders as you asked, and persuaded the other chieftains to choose who you wanted on the other councils, Dad said lowly. If anything, you owe me. Oh no, Liwanu, our work together has just barely begun, Oleander practically sang. I look forward to breaking the will of such a strong chief. Dad laughed and it was a scary sound. One day you'll make a mistake, and the ancestors will make you pay for what you have planned. Perhaps, but I assume you'll meet your end far before I will. You've got an axe hanging over your head as it is. Oleander paused, then said, You might want to get back to your little wife. She's waiting. I'd heard enough. I pushed away from the wall and hightailed it back to the waiting room. Holy fuck. My dad had put Elder Oleander on the Tawakwa Council because he'd threatened to hurt me. For once, dad had actually put me ahead of the tribe. Shit, this was my fault. If I wasn't such an easy target, Oleander wouldn't be on the council in the first place. And because I was vulnerable, that made dad his puppet. I must have looked freaked out when I came back, because Sophia popped right out of her seat when she saw me. What's wrong? I quickly explained what I'd overheard. Sophia was fuming when I was done. Oleander's extorting your dad to get the people he wants on the Elder Council? That's totally sick. Yeah, and it makes sense why Oleander was mad we stopped the plague and arrested us for broadcasting the cure, I said. The plague was actually working in his favor. It was taking out elders and making openings so he could put the people he wanted on the different councils people who are already working for him or who are in his pocket. She tapped her chin. What if Oleander started the plague? 
all this seems to be working out in his favor. What if he's behind the missing familiars, too? I bet anything he is, I said lowly. Who else is benefiting from all this chaos? Sophia shook her head. This goes way deeper than we thought it did, Liam. I know, I said. But you're right. We've got to stay strong. If Oleander is going to blackmail my dad like this, we've got to at least make it worth it and win this case. She looked at me. What are you thinking? I was already coming up with a plan. We've got to fight back. Hard. Chapter 20 Sophia Henley to the witness stand. My knees shook as I rose from my chair and stepped up to the witness stand, but I didn't let it show. I kept a firm mask of resolve on my face as the elders stared me down. I carried Essis with me and set him in my lap. My gaze turned out to the crowd, and shock riveted through me when I saw my sister's face staring back at me. I'd sent a letter about the trial, but Amelia had never said whether she could make it or not. I was glad she was here. It helped ease my nerves. Mr. Vanderbilt? Chief Nahili said, your witness. Vanderbilt stood and straightened his tie. Miss Henley, do you love Mr. Mito? Shit, it was starting already. I was nervous, but I was determined to do my best. Yes, I said honestly, with all my heart. Did you have any intention of forming a relationship with Mr. Mito when he arrived in Utah to escort you to Kinpago? Vanderbilt asked. No. My tone was clipped but confident. So is it as Mr. Mito said? You two had no intention of falling in love, but you couldn't stay away from each other. Vanderbilt raised an eyebrow. Correct, I confirmed. Miss Henley, is it true that you wish to have kids someday? Vanderbilt asked. We'd rehearsed this, and I knew exactly what to say. Yes, that's true, I told him. A few people gasped, but other than that, the courtroom remained silent. It was agonizing. You do realize that interhouse relations are banned due to the risk of bearing interhouse children, don't you, Miss Henley? Vanderbilt pressed. I knew he was only doing this to get ahead of the accusations Miller would bring forth against me. He'd briefed me on that. But it felt like I was being interrogated by Miller already. I do, I said. So, Miss Henley, how will you deal with these conflicts of interest? Vanderbilt asked. You simply cannot have both with how the laws are currently written. I took a deep breath. Killed me to admit this, but it was true. I'd do anything to be with Liam. I'm willing to give up having kids in order to be with Liam Mito. This time, there were a lot more gasps, like people couldn't believe someone would give up something as precious as children for someone they loved. Liam tried not to show his reaction, but I could see the tears welling in his eyes. No further questions. Vanderbilt said. He returned to his seat, and Miller stood. My hands began to shake. At least with Vanderbilt, I knew what was coming. Miller could throw anything at me. Essis placed a comforting paw on my hand to calm me. Miller cleared his throat and glanced down to a stack of papers in his hands. Miss Henley, how can we be confident that what you've just said to the court is true? I'm under oath. I pointed out, though my voice shook a little. You'll have to take my word for it. You did not grow up in this society, did you? Miller asked. No, I said, gritting my teeth. What did this have to do with anything? But the court already knows that. Yes, of course, Miller said coolly. When was the first time you heard of the ancestors? When I came to Arenda Academy, I answered. Liam taught me about them. So you have spent most of your life ignorant to our religion? Miller questioned. Where was he going with this? Yes, I said calmly. 
Therefore, it's possible you have affiliations or loyalties to another god, Miller asserted. There it was. He was questioning the validity of my oath. I don't, I said quickly. My parents didn't take me to church or anything. I was never part of another religion. Your adoptive parents didn't even tell you about the ancestors? He asked, turning to the elders with raised eyebrows. So you grew up without any religious affiliations at all? Yes, I said, shooting a nervous glance at Vanderbilt. He didn't show any emotion, though Liam looked peeved beside him. So your oath to the ancestors could mean nothing at all, Miller accused. How do we know you're telling the truth? I gritted my teeth, but tried to stay calm. I believe in the ancestors. I've seen them and spoken to them. I would never lie to them, especially under oath. I'm a Hawkeye, same as you. Miller ignored everything I said, except one part. You've spoken to the ancestors? How is that so, Miss Henley? I gaped for a second. He was trying to make me out as a liar. I'm referring to my ancestral guides, I told him. Liam is the son of a chief. He summoned them for me so I could meet them, and then I met them again at the time of my naming ceremony. I didn't mention the time I'd seen them during the tournament, or how I'd spoken to Shawana on Ancestors' Day. These types of encounters are not unusual, are they? Miller frowned but didn't answer. He quickly moved on. Miss Henley, you stated that you were willing to give up children to be with Mr. Mito. Yes, I said calmly. And Mr. Mito made it clear that the two of you were dating throughout the second semester of your first year at Arenda Academy. Is that true? Miller asked. Yes, I answered. He glanced down to his papers. During this time, you prepared a presentation for your Hawkeye careers class that highlighted your desire to be a stay-at-home mother. Is that correct? Oh, shit. I knew where he was going with this. I swallowed hard. Yes, but I've since changed my mind. But you just said you and Mr. Mito were dating at the time, Miller pointed out. You must have realized then that you and Mr. Mito would have had to conceive children for that dream to become a reality. My hands were sweating against Essa's fur. It was true that I'd thought about having kids with Liam, but I also knew it wasn't realistic, not in this society. Yes, I answered honestly, then quickly added, and that's one of the reasons why we broke up. We wanted different things. And do you still want children? Miller asked, rather aggressively. I know I can never have children with Liam, I said. Yes or no, Miss Henley? Miller shot back. Do you or do you not still want children? I did. I really did. But I meant what I said that I was willing to give all that up for Liam. So if it meant that the only way I got to be with Liam was if I never had children, then the answer was no. I didn't want them anymore. I answered honestly. No, I don't. Miller pressed his lips together and gazed down at his papers. Interesting, considering you are majoring in child life development. I opened my mouth to protest, to say that had nothing to do with my desire to raise my own children. But the courtroom had already broken into protests. Order! Chief Nahili shouted as he slammed on his gavel. The courtroom quieted as Miller stepped closer to me at the witness stand. You want children, Miss Henley, he accused, his voice rising. You always have, and you still want them with Mr. Mito. It's been your plan all along. You're trying to birth children from mixed houses, even though they'll be weak. That's not true, I shouted back. Mixed children are not weak. Prove otherwise, Miller demanded. If you can present the court with a mixed house child whose powers have not taken a hit due to their ancestry, then perhaps the court will reconsider their position on this matter. But until then, the court's position remains. Interhouse children will not be tolerated. 
I shot a quick glance at Doya, and she sent back the smallest of nods. It was time to break out her plan. We hadn't told Vanderbilt because we knew he'd protest. He wouldn't want his past being put on trial all over again. But Doya knew this might come up, and she knew this was the only way to contest these accusations. I can prove it, I said with stone-cold resolve. The whole courtroom went so quiet you could hear a pin drop. I raised my hand and pointed to a man sitting in the far corner of the front row. He wasn't much older than me, with dark black hair like his Navita mother, and Vanderbilt's round eyes. A beautiful reindeer doe with golden fur and fire antlers sat beside him. Vanderbilt stared at him, shell-shocked, like he couldn't believe his eyes. I thought he might fall out of his chair. Half the elders were frozen in shock, while the others were looking to each other like someone could explain what was happening. Vanderbilt's son stood and held his head up proudly. It's true. My name is Sean Andre, and I'm half Navita, half Kawigny. You were banished 20 years ago, Elder Mallison snarled. You don't belong in Kenpago. For ancestors' sake, Doya snapped. Let the man speak. All eyes turned to Chief Nahili. He hesitated a moment, then said, I'll allow it. Mr. Andre, please make your way to the witness stand. I breathed a sigh of relief as I stepped down and made my way over to Liam with Essis in my arms. Vanderbilt turned to me when I sat and hissed, What are you doing? You should have consulted me first. I knew you might not let him on the witness stand, I said regrettably, but he can help our case. Vanderbilt huffed, then turned back to look at his son. Liam leaned over and whispered, How'd you find him? I didn't, I whispered back, then shot a glance at Doya. Liam nodded. My message was clear. It had all been Doya's doing. Mr. Andre, can you tell the court exactly who you are? Miller asked. Sean adjusted his tie, then set his hand on the back of his familiar's neck. I'm Sean Andre, son of Alyssa Andre of Navita. And your father? Miller questioned. Sean's gaze darted to Vanderbilt. It was clear he knew, though he didn't admit it. It was never confirmed. All I know is that he was Coigny. When the rumors hit that I was inter-house, my mother and I were put on trial. I was six years old. My mother was put to death, and I was banished from the tribe, adopted out to a couple in Oregon. It appears that you've bonded, Mr. Andre. Miller gestured to his familiar beside him. How is that possible if you were banished from the tribe? Sean spoke calmly. I admired him for that. I was banished when I was young, but I was old enough to remember the Hawkeye traditions. When I came of age, my magic appeared. I knew that I would have to bond in order to strengthen my magic and ensure my soul was whole in this life. So I came to the outskirts of Kenpago on my own and bonded with Nora in the woods. You do realize that taking a magical creature outside of Kinpago without permission of the elders is an offense punishable by up to life in prison? Miller pointed out. Yes, but I never took her outside of tribal boundaries, Sean claimed. I've been living by myself in the woods for some time now, just to be with her. And in that time, I've been teaching myself magic. Oh, really? Miller asked curiously. Do you care to show us that magic? Sean held his hand out in front of him, and his palm ignited. Fire shot up 15 feet into the air, making the entire crowd jump back, before settling into a small flame in his hand. He closed his fist and the fire died. Impressive, Miller said with raised eyebrows. Now show us Navita magic. Sean hesitated. I don't have Navita magic. You don't? Miller asked, like he was pretending to be shocked. 
But you said your mother was Navita. Yes, Sean confirmed. But I only inherited my father's powers. This is absurd, Elder Oleander burst. For all we know, this isn't the child who was banished 20 years ago. Aye, aye, Elder Mallison was quick to agree. Even if he was, he's been banished. He shouldn't be allowed to testify anyhow. Elder Oleander pointed a bony, crooked finger at Sean. You don't belong here. Please, elders, Doya shouted. Let him speak. But by now, her pleas were almost inaudible beneath the rest of the crowd shouting. Elders were on their feet, yelling at each other to either take him off the witness stand or let him stay. Out in the crowd, people were chanting things like, Liar! and Take him away! Meanwhile, Chief Nahili pounded his gavel. Order! Order! My jaw quivered. This isn't how this was supposed to go. They were supposed to believe him. Get him out of here, Elder Mallison growled to the nearest task force members. Since his voice was the loudest, it was him whom they obeyed. Two task force members marched up to Sean and grabbed him by the arms, while two others took hold of his familiar. Sean struggled, but he couldn't get free of them. It's true, he shouted as they dragged him away. I'm mixed house, and I am not weak. The task force members twisted Sean's arms behind his back until he was screaming in pain. I shot to my feet and turned to Vanderbilt. Guilt assaulted me. What are they going to do to him? He threw his hand over his mouth and looked on the verge of tears. I don't know, Miss Henley. He'll be lucky to get another trial. You're his father, I exclaimed under my breath. Do something. Vanderbilt grabbed my shoulders and dragged me down into my seat. I am also your lawyer, Miss Henley. And if they hold me in contempt of court, you will have no one to defend you on this case. Do you want to lose? My lips trembled. No. Then do as you are told, he instructed. I hope you don't have any other surprises in store. Stop, Sean shouted. The task force members jumped away from him and screamed horribly, like they'd been burned. Sean aimed his hands at the ceiling, and fire shot out of his palms. It was so intense and hot that I could feel it coming off him in waves. The entire room began to fill with smoke, and the ceiling was engulfed in flames. Task force members reacted quickly and shot Sean with a noxite dart. He crumbled to his knees and grabbed for his leg where the dart had sunk in. It must have had a tranquilizer in it as well, because his shouts died down when he was shot. Still, he wouldn't back down. Task force members pursued him. He quickly used all the magic he had left before the noxite completely took over his body. He shot one last stream of fire at the task force members who were restraining Nora. They jumped back from the flames, freeing her. It bought Sean enough time to crawl onto Nora's back. She took off running, with Sean slumped over her. They burst through the doors near the elders' table and kept going, never looking back. The room was in total chaos. The crowd was on their feet, shouting a mixture of cheers and protests. A handful of task force members sprinted behind Sean and Nora, aiming their guns. By the way they shouted orders at each other, it sounded like Sean and Nora had escaped. Meanwhile, the Kowigny elders were calming the flames. Scorch marks were left all over the ceiling, but the fire didn't burn long enough to cause any real structural damage. I couldn't read Doya's expression. Chief Nahili banged his gavel so hard I thought it might snap in half. I looked to Liam with horror in my eyes. I'm sorry, I whispered. It wasn't supposed to go that way. Liam took my hand under the table. It's okay. Order, order, Chief Nahili shouted. The courtroom slowly quieted as the Coigny elders killed the flames and the Yapluma elders pushed the lingering smoke out of the room. I will not tolerate such discourse in this courtroom. Sean Andre is not on trial here. 
The task force will deal with him. Let's move on with the trial at hand. Mr. Vanderbilt, do you have any further witnesses to call to the stand? Vanderbilt stood. Yes, several. The defense calls Lindsay Andrews to the stand. Lindsay stood nervously, but held her head high while she approached the witness stand. Medusa hung from around her neck. The courtroom had quieted. All I could hear was the sound of her heels clicking across the floor. Miss Andrews, Vanderbilt said kindly, but I could hear the slight shake in his voice. He was still hung up on what had just happened with his son. Can you please describe your relationship with Miss Henley? Lindsay didn't sound nervous at all. Sophia and I are friends. We've been in class together since our first year. Would you describe yourself as good friends with Miss Henley? Vanderbilt asked. Do you spend time outside of class together and talk about personal matters? Yes, Lindsay said. What can you tell us about Miss Henley's character? Vanderbilt asked. Do you believe she would ever lie to you? No, Lindsay said confidently. Sophia has always been very honest with me. I don't believe she has it in her to lie to the court. Objection, Miller yelled. That was not the question Vanderbilt posed. Overruled, Chief Nahili growled. He was obviously starting to get very irritated with this case. Please continue, Mr. Vanderbilt. Miss Andrews, you know Miss Henley fairly well, Vanderbilt said. Did you ever feel that she had plans to start a rebellion? No, Lindsay replied. I don't believe she even supports a rebellion. All she wants is to be with Liam. And what about children? Vanderbilt asked. Has she ever expressed interest in having children with Mr. Mito? No, Lindsay answered. She never said anything like that to me. Miss Andrews, is it true that you were in the hospital for several weeks with the plague? Vanderbilt asked. Lindsay nodded. Yes. Do you believe Miss Henley would withhold information about the cure at your expense? He questioned. No, Lindsay replied. I believe that Sophia came out with the information as soon as she found out. I told her I was sick before I checked myself into quarantine. She would have told me about the cure then, if she'd known. Vanderbilt paced in front of the witness stand, looking pleased with her answers. Miss Andrews, do you believe Sophia Henley loves Liam Mito? Absolutely, Lindsay said. I know she does. There's no question about it. And do you believe the two of them should be together? Vanderbilt asked. Lindsay took a deep breath, then stood from her chair. She stared out across the crowd like she was addressing them all. I firmly believe that love is love, no matter the age, gender, or house. So yes, I believe that Liam Mito and Sophia Henley should be allowed to be together. Thank you, Vanderbilt said as he sat. No further questions. Your witness, Mr. Miller, Chief Nahili said. Miller stood with a smirk on his face. Miss Andrews, you say you support love no matter the age, gender, or house. Would you agree then that pedophilia should be allowed in this society? Lindsay gaped, then said, No, absolutely not. But aren't interhouse relationships just as perverted? Miller asked, looking out to the crowd. He was met with a chorus of mixed cheers and boos. Lindsay turned to the elder counsel. Chief Nahili, if permitted, I'd like to amend my statement to include only love between two consenting adults. I'll allow it, Chief Nahili said. He nodded to Miller to continue. Miss Andrews, you said you and Miss Henley were close friends, Miller asserted. Yes, Lindsay confirmed, though she looked confused, like she didn't know where he was going with this. Miller smiled and folded his hands in front of himself. Is there a reason you left out the part about the two of you being romantically involved? 
My stomach sank. The crowd broke out into protest again. Why didn't you mention this? Vanderbilt leaned over and hissed at me. I stared wide-eyed at him. Because I thought Liam and I were on trial, not me and Lindsay. Chief Nahili banged his gavel. When the crowd finally quieted, he turned to Lindsay. Answer the question, Miss Andrews. The blood drained from my face. How did Miller even know? My gaze flickered up to the Elder Council, and I noticed a smirk on Chiefess Annette's face. She was loving this. She must have heard about us from Haley and passed the information along to Miller to invalidate our case. I, I didn't think it was relevant, Lindsay stammered, considering it's over between us. Miss Henley's love life is on trial. It is very relevant, Miller pointed out. Please tell the court when these relations took place. Lindsay was starting to look as nervous as I felt. I don't know the exact dates. It all happened early this semester, while Sophia and Liam were broken up. Why did you and Miss Henley break things off? Miller questioned, looking positively pleased with himself. Lindsay hesitated. I was sick from the plague. I didn't want her to get hung up on me if I didn't make it. So she just moved on from you like that? Miller snapped his fingers. Doesn't that sound a little heartless? No, Lindsay insisted. Irritation entered her tone and she shot me an apologetic glance. I knew Sophia's heart still belonged to someone else. I encouraged her to get back together with him. If it's over between you two, how can you claim that you are still good friends? Are there no hard feelings that she left you to get back together with Mr. Mito? Miller asked. No hard feelings, Lindsay stated. The breakup was mutual. Some people aren't so quick to hold grudges. Miller huffed, but tried to hide it. Why do you think Miss Henley turned to you for comfort after her breakup with Mr. Mito? I don't know. Lindsay said honestly. I guess she was trying to get over him. Miller raised an eyebrow. And you don't feel bitter about that? About being used? I never said I was being used, Lindsay snarled. She was getting more frustrated by the minute. We were friends and I comforted her. Is that a crime? No, Miller said in amusement. But it does suggest Miss Henley isn't as devoted to Mr. Mito as she says. Liam lost it. He shot up out of his chair and shouted, That's a lie! But there were so many other voices ringing out over the courtroom that he could hardly be heard. The elders were arguing again, and the crowd was mumbling amongst themselves. Liam's dad was the one voice that stood out above all the others. She's a teenage girl who was going through a wild and rebellious phase after her boyfriend broke up with her. That's not unusual. I relaxed when Luanu stood up for me. It was a relief to know he was on my side, even though all my dirty laundry was being aired. Chiefess Annette scoffed and said, My daughter's the same age, and she hasn't gone wild. Your daughter's a whore. Miranda shouted from the audience. Chiefess Annette shot a scalding glare out to the audience, searching for the source of the voice, but so many people were talking that she couldn't tell who said it. At least my daughter is sleeping with people in her own house, she belted. Order, Chief Nahili shouted. The room quieted again. Mr. Miller, if you have no further questions, please call your next witness. Yes, Miller said with a nod. I'd like to call Landon Barnes to the witness stand. Landon Barnes? I didn't know who that was. He had to be some sort of expert witness or something. Lindsay came down from the stand looking defeated. She mouthed a sorry at me as she passed. And then I saw him stand in the crowd and it hit me. Landon from the strip club. Shit, this couldn't be good. Landon strutted up to the witness stand like he was coming to collect a lottery check. 
Miller had probably offered him something to get him on the stand. Who else would want to get involved in this shit? Landon didn't have a familiar at his side, and I realized I didn't know what he was bonded to, since he didn't have a familiar by him at the club either. Which meant it was too big to fit into the courtroom. The elders were going to love this jackass. Mr. Barnes, Miller said as Landon sat. Can you please describe your relationship with Miss Henley? Landon leaned back in his chair and wore a confident smirk I would have liked to slap straight off his face. I couldn't believe I ever found this guy attractive. Sophia and I met at Lucky Stars a few months ago, Landon said. The strip club? Miller asked, like he was shocked, but it was clear he already knew the answer. Yeah, Landon said with a shrug. It was the end of September. She came in and got really drunk and danced up on stage. Her hands were all over the strippers, even though they don't let you do that. She had no respect for anyone else's boundaries. I quickly leaned over to Vanderbilt and said, He's lying. Objection! Vanderbilt shouted quickly. Overruled, Chief Nahili said. Miller smiled and continued. Can you tell us what happened between the two of you that night? Well, I was really drunk, so I don't remember a lot, Landon admitted. But I do remember that Sophia came up to me at the bar and invited me to go make out with her. We went out to my carriage and fooled around for a bit. He's lying, I shouted, but Vanderbilt placed a hand on my shoulder to calm me. Miller ignored my accusation. Can you please be more specific, Mr. Barnes? Landon sighed, like the answer didn't matter to him one way or another. We had sex in my carriage. The crowd gasped, and my skin heated. I turned to Liam and said, It's not true, Liam. I didn't. I know, he said, but his hands were fisting in his lap. He looked like he was on the verge of choking this guy. Honestly, I was nearly to that point, too. And the worst part was that Landon looked like he believed every word he said. I was willing to bet he'd taken some other chick out to his carriage and was so drunk he forgot it wasn't me he'd fucked. Anyway, after that, Mito and his friends showed up and beat the shit out of me, Landon continued. Miller stepped up to the elders' table. If the court would allow it, I'd like to bring up evidence on the screen. He gestured to a large flat screen TV near the witness stand. Chief Nahili nodded, and Miller pressed a button on a remote he was holding. A picture of Landon's beat up face came on the screen. His eye was swollen, and there were bruises all around his nose. Miller clicked the remote again, and the image changed to another angle. The bruises on Landon's face were almost unbearable to look at. I knew for a fact we hadn't done that much damage that night. Liam had walked away worse for wear than Landon. These pictures must have been from a different bar fight Landon had gotten himself into. I quickly leaned over to Vanderbilt. It's another lie. Objection! Vanderbilt shot to his feet. Where is the timestamp on these photographs? There's no way to prove these injuries occurred on the night in question. Sustained, Chief Nahili said, and I breathed a sigh of relief. Mr. Miller, without a timestamp, I'm afraid we're unable to accept this evidence. Miller smirked. Of course. Perhaps you'll accept this. He clicked another button, and the image changed to a video of security cam footage out front of the strip club. Liam and I were shouting at each other, surrounded by our friends. Liam's back was to the camera, so no one could see how beat up his face was. There was no audio either but one thing was very clear. The moment I pulled my dress down to flash the street. My breasts had been blurred out, but it was obvious what I was doing. My hands shot over my mouth, and I felt completely mortified. How were they allowed to show this? I sank low in my seat as my cheeks turned bright red. Liam squeezed my shoulder. It's okay, Sophia. You didn't do anything wrong. 
tears pricked at my eyes. Then why do I feel like I did? Liam, I'm sorry about that night. We were broken up, he whispered. I don't hold it against you. I'm sorry, too. Chief Nahili pounded his gavel again, and the courtroom silenced. Miller turned to the elders. It's clear what we're dealing with here. On the one hand, we have a girl who can't keep her legs closed, and on the other, a boy who can't control his temper. Objection, Vanderbilt shouted. Sustained, Chief Nahili said. Mr. Miller, I'm going to have to ask you to sit. Mr. Vanderbilt, your witness. Miller smirked as he returned to his seat, and his pit bull panted happily from beside him. He was pleased with the damage he'd done. Mr. Barnes, you claim that you and Miss Henley engaged in sexual intercourse. Vanderbilt sounded a little flustered. Shit. Do you have any evidence to prove this claim? Hell no. Landon sounded disgusted, but it seemed like a show for the elders. He definitely seemed like the kind of guy who would take nudes without asking first. What kind of evidence are you suggesting I get? That shit's private. Yes, of course, Vanderbilt said. No further questions. My jaw dropped. That was it? Next witness, please, Chief Nahili said. Jonah was called to the stand next. Vanderbilt questioned him on mine and Liam's character. I felt like the trial might be starting to turn around until Miller got his hands on him. Mr. Chawney, Miller said confidently. You paint the defendants to be heroes, but you've had your own set of misdemeanors lately, haven't you? I don't know what you're talking about, Jonah said. Squeaks huffed from beside him. I've never been charged with anything. Miller raised his eyebrows. Was it not you that put Raynar Rivero in the hospital shortly before he competed in the Elemental Cup? Liam and I exchanged looks of shock. Raynar had never brought any charges against Jonah. We'd assumed he hadn't told anyone. I, I, Jonah stammered. Answer the question, Mr. Chawney, Chief Nahili encouraged. Before he could answer, Elder Rivero slammed his hands down on the table in front of him and shot to his feet. You broke my son's arm and leg. You should be in prison for battery, not on the witness stand. Fuck you. Jonah couldn't hold it in. He shot up and turned on Elder Rivero. Your son is an emotionally abusive piece of shit who attempted to murder- Order, order, Chief Nahili shouted, smacking his gavel. My best friend, Jonah continued without missing a beat. He deserved far worse than he got. We should be prosecuting assholes like him instead of- Chief Nahili gave the order and a task force member shot a noxite dart into Jonah's chest. Jonah took one look down at it, and his eyes rolled back into his head. He collapsed back into his chair. I heard Imogen let out a surprised scream from behind me. Liam's chair squeaked, like he was about to get up and fight the task force, but he thought better of it. Squeaks rose to her hind legs and squawked loudly in protest. She looked like she was about to cut a bitch, but she didn't even take a step before they'd shot a dart into her backside. She collapsed beside Jonah. Ancestors! My hands shot over my mouth, and my face heated from my fire. I turned to Liam and desperately asked, Are they going to be okay? They should be, he said, but he looked worried. Take them to a holding cell until the trial is done, Chief Nahili growled. He placed his fingers to his eyes like he was getting a headache as Jonah and Squeaks were dragged away. Please tell me we're almost done with these witnesses. No more witnesses from the defense, Vanderbilt said. What about Imogen? I leaned over and hissed. Miller's turned every character witness on us. Vanderbilt whispered back. So unless you want to make it worse, we'll not be calling Miss Anild to the witness stand. 
I was so fed up with this case already, and I wasn't letting Vanderbilt take away the last shred of hope we had at winning. I grabbed him by the tie and pulled him close to me. You're a coward. You want to prove you have what it takes to win this case? You get Imogen Onnild on that witness stand right now. Vanderbilt looked totally shocked. I let him go, and he straightened his tie. Chief Nahili raised his gavel. If there are no more witnesses to question, the council will take a short recess. I elbowed Vanderbilt in the ribs, and he shot to his feet. My mistake, Chief Nahili. The defense has one more witness. Chief Nahili waved him to continue. Let's just get this over with. Vanderbilt straightened his suit coat. The defense calls Imogen Onnild to the stand. Imogen strolled confidently to the front of the room, with Sassy holding her head up high at her feet. Imogen held a piece of paper and looked like she was about to lawyer this whole courtroom on her own. She barely looked like herself. She wore her hair down in waves and had on a plain navy blue business dress and a single red bracelet. Miss Arnild, Vanderbilt said, his voice losing all confidence. Can you please describe your relationship with the defendants? We were teammates during the Elemental Cup, and we've been friends ever since, Imogen said. Vanderbilt went on to ask the same questions he'd asked our other character witnesses, and Imogen answered honestly and with poise. Vanderbilt shot me a questioning look when he'd finished, as if to ask if that was acceptable. I nodded, and he returned to his seat. No further questions. As Miller stood, Vanderbilt leaned over to me and whispered, I fail to see how Miss Onild is going to help win your case. I smirked. Liam had spoken to her in our waiting room during the recess. Imogen knew what she was doing, and she'd spend the night in jail if she had to, just for the chance to confront the elders. Miss Onild, Miller started. Is it true that you discovered the cure for the plague that afflicted Kinpago these past few months? Yes, Imogen said, with her head held high. And how did you discover the cure? He asked. I knew that if this plague was magical, it must have originated outside our society, as the Hawkeye don't have the power to create something like this, Imogen explained. I used library books to research what other societies were capable of, and I came across the Miriamic Coven and the Omnimodus Curse. So it was you who single-handedly discovered the cure? Miller asserted. I guess, Imogen said. So Mr. Mito and Miss Henley had nothing to do with discovering the cure? He asked. They helped, Imogen assured him. I was in the hospital when they announced the cure to the public. Miller raised an eyebrow. So they just took credit for your discovery. I wouldn't call it my discovery. Imogen's tone grew irritated. They helped the tribe. And yet they waited until you were unconscious and vulnerable to share the information with Kinpago. Miller accused. You were in on this all along, weren't you? You were going to withhold information about the plague to make them look good. That's not true, Imogen stated trying not to lose her temper too soon. Vanderbilt whispered under his breath, I told you this wouldn't go well. I ignored him and watched Imogen. When exactly did you discover this information? Miller questioned. The day I was attacked, Imogen answered. November 25th. I have the library receipt to prove it. She held out a strip of paper. A task force member came up to take it from her, then handed it to Chief Nahili. That shows the books I checked out that day, Imogen said. Miller scoffed. That doesn't prove that you didn't know about the cure before then. You could have researched elsewhere. He's right, Miss Anild, Chief Nahili said. I'm afraid we can't file this with the evidence. If that is all, the elders are ready to make a decision. It was evident in their faces which way the council swayed. They wanted Liam and I to be put to death, to make an example out of us. It was in that moment that Imogen lost it. 
She shot to her feet and snarled. Do you want evidence? Take this for evidence. Her tone turned fierce. She would not back down. Two days ago, I buried my boyfriend's casket. The courtroom went silent in shock, but Imogen kept going, her voice wavering as she said the words. Cade Garcia was a noble Navita. He was full of love, spirit, and adventure. And you, the elders, murdered him. Cade Garcia will never perform Navita magic again. He'll never kiss me again. He'll never get to try out for the professional soccer team like he planned. He'll never play another game of ping pong in the commons. He'll never see the sun again. And you know why? Because of your stupid tournament. When will the killing end? Chief Nahili banged his gavel as the courtroom burst into protest once more. But Imogen couldn't be stopped. She raised her voice to be heard above the others. If you kill any more of my friends, there will be hell to pay, because the Hawkeye will no longer stand by and let you execute our own. Miss Arnild, Chief Nahili shouted, sit down, or I'll be forced to order the task force to shoot you. She ignored his instructions and continued. I felt proud of her as her voice grew to such intense levels that she couldn't be ignored. You know who else will never see the sun again because of you? My brother, Trace Anild, and all my classmates I watched die in the tournament this year. Imogen looked down at the piece of paper in her hand and began reading off the list of names. Avery Chase, Becca Smith, Alexis Brown, Casey Tyler, Sam Stone, Lauren Banks, David Chapman, Martin Patterson, Evan Baker, Eliza Brooks. Imogen hadn't even made it halfway through the list of names before Chief Nahili had enough. Take her to holding, he shouted. A task force member shot Imogen with a noxite dart, and she collapsed onto the floor. Sassy rushed forward and pulled the dart out with her teeth, but they shot her too. The task force proceeded to grab them and drag them away, the same way Jonah and Squeaks had been taken. The crowd was going insane. It was so loud that I could hardly hear the sound of the gavel slamming against the table. My fire was about to escape if I didn't do something. I got to my feet and continued shouting the names I remembered from last year's tournament. Tears began to fall down my cheeks as Imogen was dragged away. Isla Roberts! I still remembered the lifeless look in the Toakwa girl's eyes after we'd found her frozen to death during the cup. Andy Henry, Taylor Curley, I yelled. They'd been the two we'd found crushed by the landslide. Miss Henley, Chief Nahili shouted. Rebecca Summers, Joseph Perry. I continued shouting out all the names I could think of. After last year's cup, I'd checked the list of those we'd lost to make sure I'd never forget them. Liam stood beside me and began adding names to the list. Kelly Katori, Cameron Walken. They were the couple who'd been sentenced to death last semester for their relationship, the one with the young boy who'd been taken away. Behind us, Lindsay and Miranda took hands and stood on their bench to get higher. They shouted names together. Maria Hughes, Henry Gibson, Grant Duncan. Order, order, Chief Nahili shouted. He was so angry that the veins in his neck were beginning to pop. The earth began to rumble beneath our feet. Order. The crowd didn't seem phased at all. Liam and I stood hand in hand, watching in wonder as more and more people stood on their benches to shout names. It became so overwhelming that I couldn't distinguish one name from another. But one thing was very clear. Too many people had died at the hands of the elders, and all of the Hawkeye knew it. If the elders didn't want a full-on revolt, they were going to have to think of a solution to calm the crowd, and fast. Just as I thought it, the doors at the back of the courtroom burst open. It was so loud that everyone turned their heads and quieted. A short man with tousled gray hair rushed down the aisle, waving a stack of papers in his hands. Stop the sentencing! Perot? 
I glanced to Liam in shock. I thought he bailed. He looked equally dumbstruck. Apparently not. I have new evidence to present, Perot said quickly. He stopped at the front row of benches, breathing hard, waiting for Chief Nahili's signal. We've seen all the evidence, Elder Oleander snarled. Chief Nahili leaned over to whisper to the elders on either side of him, then sat up straighter. As long as the crowd can contain themselves, I'm willing to allow it. Should there be one more outburst, this court will adjourn, he threatened, wagging his finger. It was clear he was only allowing it to calm the crowd. Yes, Chief Nahili, Perot said with a bow. The Navita chief nodded, and a task force member ushered Perot to the witness stand. Your witness, Mr. Vanderbilt, Chief Nahili said. Vanderbilt stood, looking a little more confident. Mr. Perot, what's this evidence you speak of? Well, Perot said, sitting straight up in his chair, I've been running tests for many months now to help diagnose Mr. Mito's condition. Has this condition been diagnosed yet? Vanderbilt asked. No, Perot said regrettably. But I discovered something while running these tests. I looked to Liam, like he could explain what Perot was talking about. But he looked just as clueless as I did. Vanderbilt smiled, like he knew whatever Perot was about to say was good. Mr. Perot, can you please highlight your qualifications for the court? Yes, Perot replied confidently. I am a master alchemist and a professor at Arenda Academy. I'm also a certified MD by the Medical Board of California. Excellent, Vanderbilt said. And what is this evidence you've come to present today? I held my breath. Perot held his papers out to a task force member who brought them to the elders' table. Perot took a deep breath. Liam Mito can't conceive children. The entire courtroom shared a collective gasp. I turned to Liam breathlessly. Why didn't you tell me? His face paled, and he couldn't take his eyes off Perot. I... I didn't know. Perot never said anything. He must have just found out, I whispered. And that's why he was late. Order! Order! Chief Nahili banged his gavel. The courtroom quieted and he turned to Perot. Mr. Perot, please explain what this data means. Certainly, Perot said. As we all know, conception occurs when the sperm and the egg meet to form an embryo. However, I had to perform a variety of medical tests to narrow down what could possibly be affecting my patient. And results have concluded that Liam Mito's sperm is not viable. It's a side effect of his condition. Vanderbilt beamed. He knew this changed everything. Mr. Perot, you're suggesting that Liam Mito is sterile? Precisely, Perot said confidently. There's no chance that he could ever father a child, Vanderbilt asked, making it very clear to the court. Correct, Perot answered. Chief Nahili. Vanderbilt turned on his heel toward the elders' table. Chief Nahili was frantically checking the papers, before Elder Mallison reached over and snatched the evidence out of his hands. Chief Nahili seemed to barely notice. He was too shocked. Is it true that the laws currently in place forbidding interhouse relationships are there to prevent the birth of mixed children and the dilution of our magic? Chief Nahili pulled himself together. I... I am not on the witness stand, Mr. Vanderbilt. Answer the question, someone from the audience yelled, and several others joined in. Chief Nahili looked flustered, but answered anyway. Yes. So if an interhouse couple were unable to have children, their relationship would not apply to current laws. Is that correct? Vanderbilt asked. Uh... Chief Nahili's jaw dropped, and he glanced to the other elders for help. I could tell Elder Oleander was itching to burst out with an objection, 
but he also knew what that would do to the crowd. Vanderbilt had them cornered. Vanderbilt grabbed a thick, leather-bound book from his stack of papers at our table. He approached the elder's table with it in hand. Elder Oleander, do you recognize this book? Yes, he snarled, crossing his arms. It's the Hawkeye Book of Laws. Vanderbilt held the book up for the court to see. Precisely. Madam Doya, would you mind reading a passage for the court? Vanderbilt opened the book toward the end and placed it in front of Doya. He pointed to a spot on the page and said, Beginning here. She began to read aloud. Amendment K, subsection 3, written into law on August 13, 1906. Interhouse relationships are hereby banned on the basis of reproduction concerns following the fall of the Anarchy House. Couples found in violation of this new law shall suffer no less than five years in prison and up to the death penalty. Doya raised her eyes to the crowd. It appears you're correct, Mr. Vanderbilt. Interhouse relationships are only banned when the relationship may result in the bearing of children. Vanderbilt smiled proudly and took a seat. I rest my case. Mr. Miller, Chief Nahili said breathlessly, your witness. Miller's face paled. There was nothing he could ask Perot to turn this around. He remained seated. No, no further questions. In that case, this court will take a short recess as the elders convene for sentencing. Chief Nahili smacked his gavel, and the courtroom broke into chatter again as the elders stood to go to a private room to talk. Vanderbilt led us back to our waiting room. We barely made it inside before I'd flung my arms around Liam's neck. We just stood there in silence for a long time as everything that just happened sank in. Finally, I drew away. How did you know to use the Hawkeye Book of Laws? I asked Vanderbilt. He shook his head. I didn't, since I hadn't prepared this angle, but I always keep a copy with me to reference during a case. I'm so glad Perot made it, I exclaimed. Don't get too comfortable, Vanderbilt warned. The elders have found ways to turn things around before. They'll do anything to make an example of you. But Madame Doya read the law right in the courtroom, I pointed out. As long as we can't have kids, we're safe. I believe we've done all we can, Vanderbilt said. But the elders still have the power to change the laws. Liam and I shared a look of disbelief, but it was he who spoke. They can't change the laws and retroactively charge us, can they? No, Vanderbilt agreed but they could prevent the two of you from being together in the future. Liam looked horrified, as did Essis. They won't do that, I assured him. The tribe would revolt if they did. They don't want a rebellion, so they have to take it into consideration. At least, I hoped they would. It was the only thing that might save our lives. A ruckus came from out in the hall, and I heard Amelia's voice shouting, let me through. I want to talk to my sister. Vanderbilt flung the door open and barked to the task force members. Let her in. Amelia rushed into the room and threw her arms around my neck. Sophia, ancestors, I missed you. Kiwi flew around above our heads. Essis followed him with his eyes until he looked like he was going to get dizzy. Am, I cried, squeezing her tightly. I missed you. I thought you weren't going to make it. She dashed tears from her eyes. I wouldn't miss it for the world. Amelia turned on Liam, pointing a finger at him. You! Liam took an innocent step back. Am! I grabbed her by the shoulder as she advanced on him, but she shrugged me off and stabbed her index finger into his chest. You dirtbag! Do you know what you did to Sophia? I... Liam started, but Amelia didn't let him finish. She stabbed him in the heart over and over again with her finger, even though he was half a foot taller than her and she was hardly intimidating. You broke up with her and she was devastated, devastated. Am, calm down, I insisted. 
No, Amelia growled. I saw what you went through during your naming ceremony. I don't ever want to see you like that again. It's okay, I told her. Everything's good now. She narrowed her eyes at Liam. It better be, because if you break my sister's heart like that ever again, there's going to be hell to pay. Liam remained calm, but I knew that Amelia meant it. She'd carve the skin off Liam's flesh if he left me a second time. Amelia blew out a deep breath. Wow, that felt good. Miss Henley, I think it's best if you leave, Vanderbilt suggested. Amelia shrugged and started for the door. She pointed to her eyes, then to Liam. I've got my eyes on you, Mito. It was great to see you, Am, I called as she left the room. Liam raised his eyebrows at me once she was gone. Wow, your sister's intense. I shrugged. She cares. Hours passed. Liam and I were beyond anxious and both paced around the waiting room. Even Essis couldn't sit still. The wait was agonizing. It felt like we'd been in this room for days. This is a good sign, right? I asked nervously. It means some of the elders are on our side. Yeah, Liam said. But will it be enough? Liam and I sat beside each other, and he wrapped me in his arms. I tried to enjoy it, just in case it was the last moment we had together. But I couldn't get rid of the sinking feeling in my gut. What if we hadn't convinced them? Task force members came to escort us back to the courtroom after sunset. Liam and I walked slowly. We were both afraid of the outcome. When we returned to the courtroom, it was as if no one had moved. The crowd looked eager to hear the sentencing, and the elders sat up at their massive bench. I tried to read their faces, but each one wore an emotionless mask. I couldn't read them, not even Malison or Oleander. Please stand for sentencing, Chief Nahili said. Liam took my hand and squeezed it tightly as we stood. I held my breath and pulled Essis closer to my chest. In the matter of Liam Mito and Sophia Henley versus the Hawkeye tribe, we, the elders, find the defendants. Chief Nahili glanced down to a sheet of paper in front of him and let out a breath. The following two seconds seemed longer than the hours we spent in the waiting room. My heart raced, and Liam's fingers tightened around mine. Not guilty, Nahili concluded. Relief flooded through me, and my stomach felt a million pounds lighter. My mouth hung agape, and I finally took a breath. Liam swooped me up into his arms. We did it, Pawi. The crowd cheered so loud it was deafening. I thought I heard a few protests in there, but they were nothing compared to the applause. Lindsay, Miranda, and Vanessa joined hands and held them up in the air in victory. Chief Nahili banged his gavel. Order! The sentencing hearing will continue without interruptions. The room went silent. Chief Nahili brought his paper back up to his face. As I was saying, the elder counsel finds the defendants not guilty due to their inability to bear mixed children. However, each will be fined $100,000 for engaging in an interhouse relationship prior to having access to this knowledge. A gasp traveled around the room, but I didn't care. It was a lot of money and would drain the remainder of our Elemental Cup winnings, but it was worth it to be with Liam. What does this mean for other interhouse couples? A reporter shouted from the back of the room. The crowd began to murmur their support of the question, but they quieted to listen to Chief Nahili's response. Unfortunately, we can't answer that, as Liam Mito and Sophia Henley are the only two on trial today, he stated. If other interhouse couples can prove they can't reproduce, such as getting a vasectomy or tubal ligation, does that mean... Elder Oleander stood and cut the reporter off. 
We won't be taking any questions. Further issues on this matter will be taken up in their own cases. The elders will convene to discuss an amendment to these laws. Is there an estimate on when? The reporter started. No further questions, Chief Nahili insisted. Court adjourned. He smacked his gavel, and the elders stood and filed out of the room. The crowd began to buzz with chatter. Vanessa hurried up to us, with Lindsay and Miranda behind her. Ancestors, I can't believe you won! Vanessa threw her arms around me, and I hugged her back tightly. I know, I can hardly believe it either. I drew away, and Liam was there a second later. He grabbed me around the waist and picked me up, spinning me around. When he set me down, he took my face in his hands and kissed me in front of the entire crowd. It's over, Pawi. We get to be together now. Tears streamed down my face. I love you, Liam. He began to cry and dashed the tears away. I love you too, Sophia. Out of the way, lover boy. Amelia came up to us and shoved Liam aside, though it was all for fun. She wrapped me into a hug and whispered, I'm so relieved. Congratulations. Thank you, I said. And really, you don't have to worry about me and Liam. We're good. She drew away and wiped at her eyes. I hope so. Thanks for being here, Am, I told her. It means a lot. People were starting to file out toward the back now, but reporters were pushing through the crowd to get to us. I could barely make out their questions over one another as they shoved microphones in our faces. Vanderbilt threw himself between us and the reporters, holding his hands up to get them to back off. No questions, please. If you'd like to speak to my clients, you can schedule an interview with them at a later time. The reporters ignored him and continued to point their microphones at us while rattling off an endless list of questions. Vanderbilt turned to Vanessa, Lindsay, and Miranda. Excuse me, but I'd like to have a word with my clients. We waved to our friends, then followed Vanderbilt toward a private hallway near the elders' chambers. Essis peeped from my arms. Task force members led us through, then closed the doors behind us to block the reporters. I'm very proud of how you two handled yourselves today, Vanderbilt said once we were in the privacy of the hallway. However, you got very lucky. That's a good thing, isn't it? Liam asked. Yes, Vanderbilt said with a sigh. But the elders are going to be keeping an eye on you. That's nothing new, I scoffed. Vanderbilt sighed. The outcome of today's trial changes everything. You two truly have the power to start a revolution. I suggest you use that power wisely. Liam and I exchanged a glance. Heck, we were already trying to stop the prophecy. We already had more power than he realized. We wouldn't screw this up. We will, I told him. You two should try to get some rest, Vanderbilt suggested. It's been a long day. You should be able to meet up with your friends tomorrow after they've been released from holding. Will they be okay? I asked. I mean, will the Noxite cause permanent damage? It will take some time to wear off, but they'll be fine, Vanderbilt assured me. Try to keep a low profile until things calm down. There are a lot of people who would like to hurt you, and I can't help you if you're dead. Shit. More ominous stuff. Vanderbilt was starting to scare me a little. We'll be careful, Liam said. I trust that you will, Vanderbilt replied. If you ever need a lawyer again, you know who to call. Thank you, I told him. He gave a polite nod. Let's get you back to the carriage safely. Vanderbilt, along with two armed task force members, led us out the back, where our Pegasus and carriage were waiting. The street was quiet, but we could hear the roar of the crowd out front. Thanks for everything, Liam said to Vanderbilt as we climbed into the carriage. We'll take it from here. Avoid the main roadways or the media will be all over you, Vanderbilt instructed as he waved goodbye. Good luck. The carriage lurched forward, 
and I finally felt like I could breathe. I set Essis beside me, then flung my arms around Liam. I dragged his lips down to mine and kissed him with such passion that it made me tear up. I still can't believe it, I cried. It was all I could say. Liam kissed me back, which sent heat to pool between my thighs. Me either. We should celebrate. I chuckled. How? There's going to be media swarming everywhere. He shrugged, but gave me a smile. So we go somewhere private. Won't your parents worry? I asked. He pressed his lips together, then playfully said, We'll make it a quickie. I kissed the sensitive area behind his ear. What about right here? Not if the media might find us, he teased. Do you want them to have another picture of your boobs on record? I placed my hand over my mouth to stifle my giggles. At first, I'd been horrified, but now that we'd won, I just found it amusing. You're right, I don't want that. What about the cabin? Liam trailed kisses down my neck. The cabin sounds perfect. Except shit. What? I asked in alarm. I don't have the key, he suddenly realized. It's back in my dorm at Arenda. I never moved any of my shit out. So we go get it, I suggested. The semester's over, so no one's there anyway. Good point. Liam instructed the Pegasus to make a stop at the castle, and we arrived shortly after. The castle was eerily quiet since the semester was over. We slipped inside the empty school and through the shadows. I'd never been inside the Toaqua dorms, but I wasn't surprised to see the common room was filled with multiple pools and wicker chairs, like some sort of spa resort. It was chilly, too. I stopped to stare, and Essis hopped out of my arms to rush over to one of the pools and run his fingers through the water. I chuckled. I think he likes it in here. He should, Liam said. It's beautiful. I poked him in the side. Go get your key. I'll watch Essis since he can't swim. Liam gave me a peck on the lips, then started down a long hallway. I lowered myself to the floor beside Essis and watched the water ripple beneath his paws. It was so peaceful and quiet in here. I didn't even like water, but I couldn't get over how serene it felt to be alone in this big open space. Alone. An idea suddenly struck me. I didn't give it too much thought before I stood and peeked down the hallway Liam had gone down. He wasn't in sight, so I figured I had at least a minute until he returned. I quickly stripped off my clothes and stepped down the stairs into the pool. Essis gave a cat call to me and I splashed him. Shut up, I said with a giggle. He got bored with the water and decided to go play with a bubble machine across the room. The water was cool, so I called upon my fire to help warm it. Bubbles sprang up on my skin, and the water started to boil around me. Steam rose up to fill my nasal passages. It felt amazing. I heard Liam's footsteps down the hall and pulled back on my fire. I ducked down into the pool until only my head stuck out. I got it, Liam started but he stopped dead in his tracks when he caught sight of my clothes lying at the edge of the pool. Essis chittered, then pointed to where I stood, naked in the pool. Liam's jaw dropped. Pawi. Come in, I said, looking up at him past my lashes. The water feels nice. Liam glanced around the dorms, like he expected a Toakwa to jump out at any minute, but we were alone. What's wrong? I asked smoothly. Liam looked like he was about ready to drool. N nothing. Then come in, I encouraged, running my fingers across the surface of the water. Liam quickly pulled his shirt over his head and kicked his shoes off. He fumbled the button on his jeans for a second, since he couldn't take his eyes off me, then dropped his trousers. Heat spread all over my body as I drank him in. He didn't go over to the stairs. He jumped right in from where he stood at the edge, but he barely made a splash. He was over by me in seconds, wrapping me in his arms and kissing me all over. 
Our bodies moved against each other as one. Ancestors, he felt amazing. Liam spun me around slowly as we made out. He made the water swell around us, lifting us up until our feet were no longer touching the bottom of the pool. Liam began to trail kisses down my neck. He spoke between each one. Did you mean what you said about not wanting kids? What does it matter, I asked, if you can't have them? Liam pulled away to look me in the eyes. I don't want to take that away from you if it's what you really want. I shook my head. Liam, you're not taking anything away from me. All I want is you. I really meant what I said. If I have to give up kids to be with you, I'll do that. Besides, Essis is like a child himself, so we've already got one kid. Liam chuckled. Essis raised a fist at me and shook it, obviously offended. Yeah, his horns were getting bigger and bigger, but he was still young. So, you're okay with me being sterile? Liam asked. Yeah, I replied honestly. It makes everything easier for us, I guess. We don't have to be so careful. True, Liam said with a shrug. He was acting like he didn't care, but I knew better. Liam had told me he'd always wanted kids, and now that had been taken away from him. And me, too. It had been a good thing because it was the loophole that enabled us to keep our lives, but at the same time it was crushing to know we'd never get to have a family. I decided to make the conversation lighter and to try to take his mind off of it. So how awkward was it, I teased, jacking off into a cup for Perot. Liam got a horrified look on his face. I'd rather not talk about it. I laughed and he joined in. Good idea. I'm ruining the moment. Nah, nothing could ruin this moment, Liam said as he wrapped me closer. He glanced over my shoulder and began to run his fingers across my tattoo. I shied away from him. I ran my hands through the water to drag myself a few feet away from him. I thought you didn't like it. You acted that way when I got it. Liam smiled. That's not true. That was just me being an ass. I was pissed at you then. I giggled, then splashed him. Typical Liam. He shrugged. Hey, take it or leave it. You're stuck with me now. He grabbed me by the wrist and pulled me close to him again. I wrapped my legs around him in the water. He gazed down at me with a sexy stare that made my mouth go dry. If I'm being honest, I find it a little sexy. My heart fluttered, but I tried not to let it show. Sexy? Yeah, I just want to bite it. I laughed so loud it echoed off the walls of the common room. Bite it? Liam's hands ran up and down my body beneath the surface of the water. I want my lips to touch every inch of you, Sophia. Ancestors, the heat between my thighs was so hot that it must have been burning him by now. Okay, I said in a shaky breath. Okay what? He asked. Okay. Touch me everywhere, I told him. I want you to. His eyebrows shot up. Everywhere? I nodded. Everywhere. Chapter 21 Life was absolutely perfect. Sophia and I were off the hook legally, and even better, we were allowed to be together, in public, we could be in a relationship, and there was nothing that the tribe or the elders could do about it. We were completely free. A huge weight had lifted off my shoulders. It was nearly like I could feel myself floating. There didn't seem like there was anything to be afraid of anymore. From here on out, things were going to be good. On the last day of the year, I woke up earlier than Sophia did. I left her sleeping in my room and headed back to Arenda Academy. I had an appointment with Professor Perot, and I needed to thank him for what he did. His evidence had been crucial in setting Sophia and I free. Without it, I'd bet we wouldn't be alive today. Professor, I slowly opened the door to the alchemy lab. I was shocked to see that everything was gone. 
Perot's desk was usually littered with papers and vials, but I didn't see a single alchemy instrument or sheet of potion recipes anywhere. It had been completely cleaned out. Except there was one letter on his desk, addressed to me, and sitting on top of a large file folder. Dear Liam, forgive me for parting like this. I despise goodbyes, although I hope that this is not so much as a goodbye rather than I'll see you again very soon. It grieves me to say Orenda Academy is no longer my home, nor is Kinbago. Baxter and I have agreed it is best for us to move on. We've decided to go into hiding. I will not tell you where, for your safety as much as our own. This society is no longer welcoming to people like me, as you've experienced yourself. Young people have an urge to right wrongs in society that us old folks have long given up on. You and Sophia have done no small thing in winning the case against you. I will not bother trying to convince you to run as well. I know both of you will want to stay and fight. I must warn you, however, that things are about to change here, and quickly. I wish I could tell you more, but at the moment it would only put you in more danger. I regret having to resign as your doctor, though it is clear you don't need me any more. Your little friend has shown he can provide far better care than I ever could. All your medical records are in the file I've left for you. I dare say it wouldn't be right for me to leave you after all this time without an official diagnosis. I've submitted a briefing to the Center for Magical Maladies, and they've agreed to include your condition in the Universal Manual of Diseases. Stay close to your friends. Only together will you stand a chance against the dark times that are to come. Yours fondly, Jacques. My heart dropped. Perot had left? He wasn't coming back to Orenda? Maybe it was Sophia and I's fault. He was probably receiving death threats for being a key witness. I opened up the file folder and took out the briefing file. It was over 20 pages long and filled with a lot of medical jargon I didn't understand. But there, at the top of the brief, was something incredibly special. Understanding Variables in Combined Magical Suppression Syndrome, CMSS, by Jacques Perrault, M.D. A name. It was more than anything I could have ever hoped for. Names of conditions in the hands of disabled people were powerful. It proved there was something wrong with you. Told people you weren't actually crazy. Now, if someone questioned whether or not I was truly sick, I had proof. Perot hadn't left me with nothing. He'd given me the greatest gift he ever could, save for a cure. I was bummed that Perot wouldn't be here next semester. I'd looked forward to our appointments. Out of all the teachers here, it was so obvious that he cared about his students. Arenda Academy was going to suffer a huge loss without him. It was around lunchtime when I returned to the house. Sophia was up, and she was sitting on the porch swing with Essis, sorting seashells into piles the Kerbal had collected. She had the blanket I'd made her around her shoulders as she stared out to sea. Hey, she said. How'd the appointment with Perot go? He's gone, I said, and I sat beside her. What? Her eyes widened. I handed her the letter. Her face grew confused as she reached the end of the note. But, she bit her lip, and Essis started chucking the seashells he didn't like over the deck. How could he just up and leave like that? Without a goodbye? Something scared him, Soph. Maybe people have been going after him since the trial ended, I said. She shrugged. I don't know. Whatever he was talking about in the letter made it seem like it had nothing to do with the trial. It sounded... Bad. It really did. But after everything Sophia and I had been through, it was hard to imagine things getting worse. We'd already been through so much. I wanted to have hope that things would get better in this society, not worse. Even if things change, we'll survive it, I said, and I grabbed her hand. We've already been through hell and back. What more can they do to us? Sophia grimaced. Perot was right. We would stay and fight. We wouldn't want to accept that this world couldn't change. We did change it. It wasn't a lot, but it was a start, I said. It's still so hard to believe Perot left. What could have been so worrisome that he didn't want to stay? Sophia asked. I know. 
It's confusing. I sighed. But at least he didn't leave without giving my disease a name. Combined Magical Suppression Syndrome. Sounds complex, doesn't it? Liam, that's so great. Her expression grew into a smile. I know that was something you've been waiting for. For sure. It's a small answer in a very long line of questions. And now I have something to throw back at people when they tell me I'm not sick. I grabbed the file holder. I'm taking this back up to my room. I'll go through it tomorrow. Now is the time to celebrate. What does the tribe do for New Year's Eve anyhow? Sophia asked. I was with Imogen in Guatemala last year, so I never got to experience it. We have a powwow. It's called the Dance for the Ancestors, I said. There's a huge party in Kinpago. I've never been to a powwow. She held her arms out to Essis, and he leapt into them. I can't wait to see what it's like. Sophia rose to her feet, and I slung an arm around her. I wasn't here last year either. Too busy doing tribe stuff with Dad. Now I get to spend one of my favorite holidays with my girl. Essis chittered, and Sophia blushed slightly, giving a really cute smile. It was incredibly hard for me not to take her upstairs and have a quick round of really passionate sex. Now that we had the freedom to truly be together, I was growing more and more enamored with her every day. She went to take the blanket off her shoulders, but I stopped her. You should wear it, I said. You don't have anything else for the powwow, and I think it'll fit nicely. What do you do at a powwow anyway? Sophia asked and we left the front porch to walk toward the carriage that had just brought me back from Arenda. The Pegasus snorted as we approached, stomping its hooves. Lots of things, I said. There will be storytelling of Hawkeye legends and demonstrations on old tribal arts. Then there will be a ceremonial dinner. Later tonight, after the grand entry and honor songs, they'll have the contest dancing. Are you competing? Sophia asked. I smirked. Yes, I plan to win. Of course you do, she tilted her head. But shouldn't you be wearing your regalia? Dad's already got my regalia at the ceremony site. Every year, Kinpago builds an authentic Hawkeye village in the middle of the city for people to walk through and enjoy. My regalia is in the Tawakwa plank house. I'll put it on before the nightly ceremonies begin, I explained. Kinpago was already incredibly crowded when we arrived, People were dressed in a variety of different clothing, including everyday streetwear and authentic Hawkeye regalia. I could already hear the music from the drums and flutes in the middle of the city. Essis perked his ears up and looked excited at all the activity, blue eyes shining with enjoyment. A few people threw ugly sneers our way or pleasant smiles, but we were mostly ignored. The excitement from the trial had died down, and most of the population had went back to ignoring us. The mystery of the missing familiars had now taken precedence in the news. The plague had been eliminated, but there was still no answer on who had committed the kidnappings. The center of the city had been transformed overnight. Long square buildings made of cedar planks called plank houses were gathered in a circular fashion around the square. They had low roofs, and some were a hundred feet long or more. Totem poles with designs of magical creatures had been set up next to the plank houses. Men and women in traditional hawkeye wear made of fur, shells, and cedar wood performed demonstrations outside in the square. They worked on constructing and painting long canoes, carved and crafted tools made of wood and stone, or crafted cups from horns of dragons. Their familiars were beside them, their fur and scales painted with different designs and colors. In the middle of the square, a large area had been cleared out to make way for the dancing tonight. The smell of cooking salmon had spread throughout the area, along with whiffs of fresh roasted corn. Tonight, over 4,000 people would be in the center of the square to take part in the powwow festivities. I started pointing stuff out to Sophia and explaining as we walked. The original Hawkeye were mostly fishers. They didn't need to plant agriculture because seafood was abundant around the coast, I explained. The cedar trees were especially important. They provided clothing, shelter, and canoes to hunt whales with. Their lives were mostly based around harvesting fish and creating art from the landscape. 
Professor Amber was weaving an intricate rug in the square next to a plank house while her orangutan familiar worked on a basket. I gave her a wave as we approached the Toakwa longhouse. The totem next to the door had depictions of an orca, a sea serpent, a leviathan, and a kelpie carved into the wood. Sophia and I entered. Inside the plank house were a variety of bunk beds and shelves beneath them to store items. There were a collection of rugs and decorative items scattered throughout. My regalia was inside a trunk on the right side. I'd change into it after dinner. Dad and Tatum were inside, along with Ezra and Diami. They were setting things up for later. Dad was already wearing the traditional chief's wear of a long otter-skin robe and buckskin cloth. Tatum wore a whalebone necklace around his bulky form. Ezra just had his normal clothes on and was goofing off with Diami in the corner. They were having some sort of pushing contest, which Diami was clearly winning. He just took his big wing and whacked Ezra into the ground each time he got back up. Despite getting his face smashed in, he was grinning. This was the first time I'd seen him have a smile on his face since Cade had died. We all needed this powwow especially him. I'm glad you like eating dirt. Won't be so bad when you come in second, I told him as I approached. You'll be the one eating dirt when I kick your ass later, Ezra challenged. Diami raised a wing to whack him down again, but Ezra waved him off. Ezra is competing against me in the men's fancy dancing tonight, I told Sophia. He has yet to beat me. There are 12 other guys competing besides us. It's not always about you, Ezra shot back. Boys, get along, Dad called from the other end of the plank house. I snickered and Ezra flipped me off. Mom poked her head inside the plank house. My younger siblings, Katie and Christian, were at her side while she balanced baby Jackson on her hip. Maddie was off with Drew somewhere. Sophia, dear, would you mind helping me with something, please? Mom asked. Coming, Sophia responded. She headed back outside. Sophia had spent Christmas at my house. She was pretty much a part of the family now. It was crazy how well she'd integrated with the rest of us. Mia had never quite fit in, but with Sophia, it was like she'd always been there. Mom basically treated her like her own daughter. Even Dad, as standoffish as he was, had warmed up to her. Right, Dad said, and he turned toward me. Now that your girlfriend's gone, I please ask that you and your brother stop using my hunting lodge as a sex cabin. I'm tired of finding condoms in the garbage. Ezra bent over, howling with laughter. I let out an embarrassed chuckle and said, Uh, those aren't mine. I, I don't use condoms. Dad narrowed his eyes at me and said, You're lucky you're shooting blanks, son. And you? He turned on Ezra. How many girls do you need to be with in a week? You're going to be chief for ancestors' sake. Not for a few more years, Ezra said. And unlike my big bro, I know to wrap it before I tap it. He high-fived me. Dad rubbed his eyes and Tatum let out an unnecessary groan. Ancestors help me, he moaned. Get out of here, you two. Enjoy the powwow. Ezra and I punched at each other on the way out. Sophia was holding my little brother. She cooed at him and laughed as she tickled Jackson's nose. Essis sat on the ground and stared up at the baby with a jealous expression. It was hard seeing Sophia with a baby in her arms. It made my throat get a little tight. It reminded me that was something she could never have because she was with me. Sophia handed Jackson back off to my mother before rejoining my side. Your baby brother is so cute, she said. I can't get over how adorable he is. He is, I said quietly. It bothered me more than I let on that I was sterile. It felt like it was one more thing I'd taken away from Sophia. On top of it, I really wanted kids. I wanted to be a dad someday. But beggars can't be choosers, and Sophia and I had barely escaped being killed for being together. It would be wrong to ask for more. A life with her was more than enough. Sophia didn't seem to notice my melancholy nature, which was a good thing, because I didn't want to talk about sad stuff on a day we were supposed to be happy. We started wandering around the historical village. 
Essis hopped up on my head and sat there, as I was the tallest and he could see the most from that vantage point. Eventually, we met up with Jonah and Imogen. They were watching the hoop dancers that were giving a demonstration in the square. Imogen was wearing a dress that portrayed all of the four tribes. It was made of buckskin and had red, blue, green, and purple beads decorated in the designs of flames, water, leaves, and wind. She also wore deerskin moccasins. Sassy had on a feathered headband. It was the first unique outfit I'd seen her wear since Cade died. I was hoping she was starting to recover some of herself. She'd been isolated and quiet ever since the cup was over. We'd had a hard time getting her to leave her house. I was surprised to see she was out today, even though her smile wasn't as big as I remembered it could be. Jonah was wearing a t-shirt that commemorated this year's powwow while Squeaks' feathers were streaked with purple paint. Sophia jumped on Jonah's back, thinking he would support her weight, but she caught him off guard. Jonah fell over and Squeaks scrambled out of the way to try and save herself, but it was no use. Squeaks knocked into me, I tumbled into Imogen, and we all ended up on the ground. Ah, I'm being squished, Sophia yelled. I could hear her muffled laughs underneath Jonah. Oh, crap, I'm crushing you, sorry, Jonah hurried to apologize. Will someone please get Squeaks' ass out of my face, I shouted. There was a lot of pushing, and eventually we all untangled. Poor Imogen had somehow gotten caught at the bottom and had to crawl her way out, gasping for breath. Stupid kids, an old man mumbled as he walked by, shaking his head. People moved away from us as we got up off the ground, like they were afraid they'd catch whatever made us weird. Where have you guys been? Sophia said, and she brushed herself off. We haven't seen you since the day after the trial. Recovering from the Noxite, Imogen said. Her mouth was in a thin line. We decided lying low was a good option. Yeah, Noxite is shit, man, Jonah shuddered. I couldn't use my powers for like a day after they shot me with those darts. Remind me never to get shot with those things, Sophia said. You guys staying for the powwow? All day, Imogen said. I'm not participating in the competition, though. I usually take part in the jingle dress dancing, but... We decided not to, Jonah finished for her. He eyed Imogen, and I pieced together that he'd opted out because Imogen didn't feel like it, and he didn't want to make her feel alone. That's okay. There's plenty to do, I rushed to say. Let's just walk around. We left the historical village and started wandering through the different alleyways of Kinpago. In front of the shops, a large variety of outdoor vendors had been set up. Wooden cedar masks painted in all sorts of colors were displayed on tables along with white sage and other sacred herbs. Smudging wands and prayer feathers made from a variety of feathers and furs from magical creatures were sold beneath large dream catchers and woven baskets. There were other things, jewelry made of whalebone, large shells, and rare stones to be found around the area, along with grass braids, beaded bags, flutes, rattles, and drums. There were even some ceremonial weapons on display. Bows and arrows lay next to knives, tomahawks, war clubs, and spears. Professor Bain was looking at the weapons intently. He gave us a kind, awkward wave as we passed by. Can you buy regalia here? Sophia asked as we wandered through the marketplace. I shook my head. Regalia is made, not bought. A hawkeye assembles all the different pieces and makes it with the help of his or her family. Each one is unique and very special to the individual wearing it. So when Amelia gave me our moms to borrow for my naming ceremony, she'd actually made it with the help of her parents? She asked. I nodded. Correct. She sighed. I hope I get to make my own regalia one day. Sounds like fun. It is fun, but very time-consuming. Mine had taken years to make. We spent the rest of the afternoon shopping and watching the exhibitions. When it was time to eat, we walked down the long path that led to the ocean shore back into the forest. As the four of us reached the beach, we saw that it was filled with hundreds of tables, all laden with traditional food. There was fish, crab, clams, corn, fry bread, turtle soup, roasted cattail, and wild celery. 
Elementi and their familiars swarmed around the tables, waiting to eat. Before the dancing begins, there's a ceremonial dinner, I told Sophia. There are rules to how it goes. What are the rules? Sophia asked. The men eat first, with their wives, girlfriends, or sisters behind them. Then the girls eat second, I said. Her eyebrows knitted together. Isn't that a little sexist? I shook my head. The warriors eat first and very quickly. Then the women are free to enjoy themselves while the men keep watch for enemies of the tribe. It's how things used to be. Oh, I see. That's actually rather sweet. She smiled. Yeah, but there's more to it, I teased. I think it's best if we leave that as a surprise. We saw Bren and Vanessa at one of the nearest tables on the beach and immediately gravitated toward them. Lindsay and Miranda were with them, but I didn't recognize any other faces. I hadn't seen Ben and Marcy or any other interhouse couples since the trial. I worried about them. I knew a few other couples had gotten arrested, but their fate was still up in the air. I hoped they were okay. I hadn't seen Jamin Risk either, which I was perfectly fine with. That woman was trouble, and I didn't want her anywhere near me or my friends. Hey guys, care to join us? Vanessa asked. Aisha growled pleasantly behind her. Of course, Sophia said. Jonah, Bren, and I sat down first to eat, while the girls stood behind us and chatted. There were canoe races out on the water as the dinner continued. People cheered for their favorite teams as the meal was switched over from the men to the women. Ancestors, I love food, Vanessa said. I literally can't stop eating lately. Well, you are eating for two, Bren said. He kissed her cheek from where he stood behind her and his chimera purred. What's your due date? Lindsay asked. She and Miranda were holding hands as they ate and giving each other sultry looks. They were a cute couple, but damn, they sure loved PDA. May, Vanessa said. We're hoping it's a boy. But we'll be happy either way, Bren said, and he gave Vanessa the most sickeningly sweet smile. Sophia didn't say anything, just kept her eyes down. Lindsay's eyes flickered to us, and she changed the subject. So I hear Haley's participating in the women's fancy shawl dance tonight. Ick, Miranda said. Now you've just ruined my dinner. I'll be competing against her, Lindsay said. Wish me luck in kicking her ass. That's something we can all toast to, Imogen said. She raised a glass, and the girls clinked theirs against it. I rubbed Sophia's neck and shoulders while she ate. Essis hadn't been happy about having to wait his turn to eat, and he devoured whole ears of corn in seconds. Sophia let out a soft moan of relief when I massaged a tender spot. Hey, no sex at the dinner table, Jonah shouted. Imogen smirked but didn't laugh. I figure they can have as much sex as they want, whenever they want, seeing as how they just told the elders to go screw themselves, Lindsay added. Hear, hear, Miranda agreed loudly. I've always wondered about that, Vanessa said. Was the sex better before or after the breakup? Well, I was a virgin before we dated for the second time, and there were conditions for us getting back together, Sophia said coyly. I can imagine, Jonah began. His deep voice took on a higher pitch to mock mine as he said, I agree to all your demands, Miss Henley. May we fuck now, milady? The table died laughing. That wasn't quite how it went. I said. It was pretty much how it went, Sophia shouted. She struggled to catch her breath in between giggles. I opened my mouth to say more, but the sound of a war cry caught everyone's attention. We turned to look toward the tree line. A line of male elementi and their familiars were charging toward us, faces painted and clothes smudged with leaves and mud from the forest. Ezra and Diami were among them, hollering as they ran. Protect the women, Jonas shouted, raising a fist to the air. He turned and jumped onto Squeaks' back, hurtling toward the mock battle full speed. I wiggled my eyebrows at Sophia and said, This is the part where you run. Don't let them catch you. I left her behind and ran after Jonah. Bren followed me. I hit the line of attackers and immediately harnessed water from the ocean. 
I sprayed several people in the gut and knocked them down while ducking a jet of fire from a Coigny dude and a blast of sand from a Navita. Everyone started using their magic all at once while familiars tackled each other and rolled in the sand to fight. It was all in good fun. Nobody was really trying to hurt each other. The rules were if you got hit in the chest with somebody's magic, you were considered dead and had to sit out and let the rest unfold, or if you were a familiar, got pinned and couldn't move. Imogen had grabbed Sophia's hand and was pulling her into the woods. The two girls were laughing as they fled into the trees with Vanessa, Lindsay, and Miranda, their familiars behind them. My heart pounded as the mock battle grew more intense and exciting. I had to duck and roll to avoid getting hit. Jonah was right next to me. He knocked a guy down with an air blast before Ezra ran by and fired off a water ball. It knocked Jonah in the chest and flattened him to the ground. Oh shit, I'm dead, Jonah said from his place on the sand. Squeaks had gotten taken down by a griffin and was doing a spectacular job of playing dead on her back with four legs up in the air. Hey, Liam, I've got your girl, Ezra called from somewhere in the trees. I turned around and saw that Ezra was carrying Sophia, who couldn't outrun him. Diami had Essis in his beak, who had crossed his arms and was looking pretty surly at getting caught. Not for long, I shouted back. Ezra ran into the trees with Sophia, and I rushed to catch up with him. I heard Sophia's suppressed giggles and Ezra's quiet swear words as he struggled to carry her through the thick forest brush. It was all too easy for me to catch up. I summoned a water ball and tossed it at Ezra's head. It made impact, and he tripped. Sophia squealed as she fell forward and tumbled out of his grasp. When Ezra dropped Sophia, Diami immediately let go of Essis. He coughed up white fur balls and used his wing to wipe off his tongue. Essis, who was wet with bird spit, grumbled before he lowered his head and charged at Diami's leg with his curled horns. He bounced off and tried again, but it failed to bother the large thunderbird. I pulled Sophia up off the ground. You're a terrible runner, I told her. She snickered. I'm better at standing my ground, I think. Ezra's head was soaked. I think I won. I caught her. Yeah, but I caught you, I said. I reached out a hand to get him to his feet. Ezra brushed the dirt off him and said, I need to clean up before the dancing begins. You should hurry, I said. Grand entry's about to start. Yeah, you'd better head back too, he told me. Ezra climbed onto Diami's back, and the two of them took off through a break in the tree line. I looked around and said, where's Imogen? Over here, Imogen called. She'd hidden behind a boulder about 50 feet away, and Sassy's head poked over it. Come on, guys, we need to get Jonah and get going. The ceremony's about to start. Sophia and I headed toward her. Essis scrambled up Sophia's leg and tucked himself inside the blanket in the crook of her arm, seeming cross. Did you see where everyone else went? I asked. Vanessa got taken by some Coigny guy. I think he's one of Bren's friends, she said before she giggled. I'm pretty sure Lindsay and Miranda slipped off to go bang in the woods somewhere. Oh, ancestors. Let's hope Ezra doesn't find them. That's like his daydream. I rolled my eyes. So what's grand entry? Sophia asked. I know it's the start of the opening ceremonies, but what does it mean? I put my arm around her and drew her close as I said, You're about to find out. Chapter 22 We returned to the square. It was packed with people and familiars so tightly that I brushed shoulders with everyone I passed. Since Liam was competing in the dance, he had to leave to prepare for grand entry. Imogen, Jonah, and I pushed through the crowd toward the bleachers. They seemed endless, surrounding the wide dance area like their own arena. There was only a narrow strip of walkway between the back of the bleachers and the nearby buildings. We were lucky enough to grab a seat in the front row. We sat at the edge so Jonah could sit beside Squeaks, since she didn't fit on the bleachers. The air was pleasant for New Year's Eve, though there was still a slight chill. I suspected the elders were manipulating the temperature for the festivities. Your blanket's really nice. Jonah said while we waited. He smiled widely, though I didn't know why. 
I stroked my fingers across the intricate design. Essis copied me from where he sat in my lap. Thanks. Liam made it for me. Did he now? Jonah wiggled his eyebrows. I figured I might as well dress up. It kind of works as a shawl, don't you think? I paused to eye Jonah. Why are you looking at me like that? Imogen, why is he acting weird? Imogen snickered. Long ago, when a Hawkeye man wanted to propose to a woman, he'd weave a blanket and place it around her shoulders. If she accepted, it meant they were engaged. My jaw dropped in realization. Oh my God, so Liam like pre-proposed to me? Imogen just smiled and shrugged. My heart fluttered in a mix of nerves and happiness. I couldn't stop the wide grin that spread across my face. Liam Mito really wanted to marry me. It felt like all of my dreams were coming true. Before any of us could say anything further, a voice came over the speakers. Welcome, Hawkeye. We are here to honor the sacrifices our warriors and ancestors have made for us. In honor and respect for our fallen forefathers, we ask you to rise at this time. Who's ready to powwow? The crowd went wild as they rose to their feet. I quickly joined them, cradling Essis close to my chest. As the drums began to beat, the entire square went silent. All eyes turned down the street as a line of Hawkeye dressed in regalia danced into the square like a parade. Familiars of all shapes and sizes followed. They chanted as they came in, with the beads on their regalia jingling to the beat of the drums. One man walked at the front and held a large flag with all four house colors on it. Behind him, four others each carried a flag with their individual house colors and symbols on them. Next came the dancers. I watched them in awe as they moved together as one. This is amazing, I said to Imogen. She leaned over and whispered to me, It's a high honor to carry one of the flags. They're honored warriors or veterans. You see the guy and girl right behind them? I nodded as I watched the two people marching between the flag carriers and the dancers. Those are the head dancers, Imogen explained. They basically direct the entire powwow. The parade of honored warriors and dancers entered the empty cobblestone area in front of us. Liam caught my eye and shot me a smile. My heart warmed. Liam's regalia was impressive beyond anything I could imagine. Endless blue feathers covered him from head to toe, with beads and ribbons everywhere. Long feathers were crafted in a careful arrangement behind his neck and at his tailbone, which reminded me of a beautiful bird. Beside him, Ezra wore similar regalia in yellow and black, but something about Liam's drew me in more than the others. They continued to dance around the square until the head veterans stopped at the center, and the sound of the drums died down. They're going to sing the honors song next, Imogen explained to me. The first is the flag song. It's like our national anthem. The second is the victory song, which honors our veterans and ancestors. Shh, Jonah hissed at us. The drums began to beat again. There were at least ten drum players gathered around a huge drum, each beating their drumstick against it in time with each other. Even a koala-looking familiar was playing alongside them. First came only the drum beats as the crowd remained silent. Then came the sound of the drummers' voices. They didn't speak words. It was more a combination of hey and ho, but it was coordinated in perfect synchrony. It was like I could feel the ancestors with me. Tears beaded my eyes as I listened to the beautiful song. I'd never felt more connected to my tribe than I did in that moment. When the songs ended, everyone sat. I turned to Imogen and said, Wow, that was beautiful. I know, she replied. Are you ready to dance? Dance? I asked in confusion. Yeah, intertribals, she clarified. Everyone gets to dance while the competitors warm up. The drums began to pound to a different beat, and the dancers in the square spread out. 
At this time, we invite everyone to come down from the stands to participate in the intertribal dance, the announcer said. The dancers began to move in a circle around the square, bouncing on their toes and lifting one knee after the other. Familiars danced along too. Come on, Jonah encouraged, tugging at my arm. Oh, I don't know, I said. I kind of want to watch first. Squeaks and I aren't waiting around, Jonah said chipperly. We're getting in there. Jonah and Squeaks rushed into the middle of the square as more and more Hawkeye joined the tribe. Jonah spread his arms out to the sides and twirled in circles as he bounced on his toes. Squeaks tried to copy him, but she ended up knocking over a juvenile alicorn and nearly squashing a small feline familiar. Essis jumped out of my arms. He and Sassy rushed into the crowd behind Squeaks. I guess I better get out there, Imogen sighed. So she didn't seem too excited. She stood and followed behind our familiars. I couldn't take my eyes off Liam while he danced. He was beaming and looked like he was having the time of his life. I smirked. Liam told me at the elemental ball that he couldn't dance and didn't like to. He was a filthy liar. His eyes caught mine in the stands, and he started making his way over to me, dancing and smiling the entire time. He gestured for me to join him. I shook my head and mouthed, I want to watch. He faked a pout and fluttered his eyelashes. I threw my hand over my mouth because I couldn't help but laugh. When pouting didn't work, he pulled out the imaginary lasso trick and started reeling me in. I mean, how could I resist that? I stood and copied what everyone else was doing while I made my way over to him. I couldn't stop grinning as we joined the flow of dancers around the square. This moment was so powerful. It was like I could feel our ancestors here among us, celebrating. A deep connection to the Hawkeye of the past resonated within me as we continued dancing our way around the square. This powwow seemed bigger than me. For the first time... The entire tribe seemed connected instead of divided. Having fun? He asked as he took my hand. Absolutely, I replied with a smile. Let's get up by Jonah and Imogen. We increased the speed of our footwork until we caught up with them. Jonah was all over the place, while Imogen more or less walked to the pace of the moving crowd. Hey, slowpokes, Jonah joked as he continued to spin in circles. He started to shake his butt to show off, but Imogen smacked him on the shoulder. Ancestors, Jonah, she said. A little respect? Right. He stopped shaking his butt, but he was still going all out by kicking his legs high in the air and spinning as much as he could. Liam and I couldn't stop laughing while we watched him. Essis stopped dancing beside Sassy and hurried over to Liam. He stretched his arms up high, and Liam bent to scoop him up. Essis pointed upward toward the sky. What is it, buddy? Liam asked while he tickled Essis' belly. We continued dancing the whole time. Essis threw his arms up above his head again. Oh, I see. Liam tossed Essis into the air, and Essis let out a gleeful cheer. Liam tossed him again and again as he spun around to the beat of the drums. It was in that moment that the pure bliss sank in. Liam and I had won our trial. But more than that, we were happy. I laughed, looking up at Liam beside me. This is great. Isn't it? He asked. He set Essis back on the ground, and Essis hurried toward Sassy to join her again. I noticed as the song continued that Liam was starting to slow down. He was taking it easy to save his energy for his competition. Eventually, the drum beats ended, and the crowd returned to their seats. Liam headed off by the edge of the dance area to wait for his turn to compete, while Imogen, Jonah, and I sat in the bleachers. The announcer made a short speech to welcome the first group of dancers. He called it the women's traditional category. The women moved slower in this type of dance, but with the same enthusiasm as the intertribal dance. Most of their movements came from bending their knees, since they kept their feet on the ground. There were all types of familiars dancing with them, but most were earth creatures, like deer and coyotes. 
How are the contestants judged? I asked Imogen. They all dance so beautifully. They're judged on three things, Imogen told me. She began counting off on her fingers. Their regalia, their dancing ability, and how well they know the song. For women's traditional, their feet should never leave the ground. It symbolizes their connection to the earth. That's why most of the women in this category are Navita. Well, I'd hate to be one of the judges, I said. It'd be so hard to pick. The song finished, and the next set of contestants came into the square. The announcer called this dance the women's jingle dress category. Imogen stared longingly at the dancers, like she kind of missed being out there. The jingle dress competition was my favorite so far. The regalia was more extravagant than the other dancers, with layers upon layers of tassel-looking attachments all over their clothing. They somewhat resembled bells. The familiars didn't wear the jingle regalia, but they moved in synchrony with their elementi. The women jumped in circles to the beat of the drums and held feather fans that they waved while they danced. What's the significance of the fans? I asked. This is traditionally a healing dance, usually performed by the Anachi before they died out, Imogen said. They would use the dance to send out prayers to the ancestors to heal a sick or injured Hawkeye. See the metal cones on their dresses? I'd thought they were tassels or bells. It was hard to tell from a distance, but now that Imogen pointed out what they were, I could see they were made of metal. Each piece of regalia has 365 dancing cones to represent every day of the year, Imogen continued. The Anachi would place prayers into the cones, and the fans were used to release those prayers to the ancestors. Wow, I said. I had no idea these dances were so symbolic. Jonah nudged me and teased. It's like this is your first powwow or something. I rolled my eyes at him playfully. Following the jingle dress dance came the women's fancy shawl category. I spotted Lindsay as the dancers came into the square, then noticed Haley. Haley had a smug look on her face, but I could already tell her step was off from the others. I quickly had to take back what I said about the jingle dress dance being my favorite. The fancy shawl dance had more intricate footwork, and the shawls around the young women's shoulders accented their flowing movements. Haley's shawl was red with orange fringes and reminded me a little of Anwara's wings. Despite how much I hated Haley, I had to admit her regalia was beautiful. Lindsay's shawl was stitched with green and black diamonds, the color of Medusa's scales. Haley looked kind of bored as she danced beside Anwara until she spotted Lindsay and Medusa stealing the show with beautiful twists and turns. Haley quickly stepped up her game, but her movements didn't look as natural as Lindsay's. Lindsay didn't even notice Haley's eyes on her. She simply beamed and let the music take over her body. Is there significance to the shawls? I asked. They're worn by young women to symbolize butterflies, Imogen answered. When that dance ended, they switched over to the men's dances. The men's traditional was a lot like the women's, but the men wore more feathers and moved in sharp and deliberate ways. The men's grass dance differed in regalia and symbolism. These outfits were more colorful, with long fringes. Imogen told me the dance was traditionally used to clear grassy areas for ceremonial purposes and to represent the hunting that the ancient Hawkeye partook in to provide for their families. Finally came the men's fancy dance, which was the last category and the one Liam would be competing in. Liam came into the square dancing alongside the others with the most amazing smile on his face. His eyes quickly found me in the crowd, and his smile grew wider. I clapped and cheered for him. It was clear from the onset that the men's fancy was meant to entertain an audience. Their regalia was the most elaborate, and they moved quicker than the other dancers. The men jumped high to show off and spun whips around in their hands to add to the dazzling display. I cupped my hands over my mouth and shouted, Go, Liam! He must have heard me because he lit up. He started spinning faster and jumping higher. I knew he must have been pushing himself to his physical limit, 
but he didn't seem to care since he was having so much fun. Ezra noticed Liam stepping it up and started spinning his whips around faster to show off. Diami quickened his step to keep up with Ezra. The two brothers faced each other and mirrored each other's moves as they tried to show the other up. They were both beaming. It was all in good fun. When the song ended, the dancers from every category were ushered back to the square so the winners could be announced. Liam looked wiped out. He leaned on Ezra while they laughed together. I'm glad Liam's having so much fun, Jonah said. Yeah, I agreed. I haven't seen him this happy in... ever. The three of us chuckled because of how ironically true it was. The announcer stood at the front of the square with a microphone to announce the judges' decisions. I didn't know the first two winners of the women's categories, but I clapped anyway when they were announced. I held my breath as the third category came up, then screamed in excitement when they announced Lindsay as the winner. She headed toward the announcer to gather her prize, while Haley huffed and stomped out of the square before they finished announcing the winners. Someone forgot to put on their big girl panties today, Jonah joked. I chuckled. You think she's wearing any? Jonah pretended to think about it. Dunno, wouldn't surprise me if she wasn't. The announcements continued until they reached the last category, men's fancy. Liam will win, I said with certainty. Ezra was pretty good too, Imogen pointed out. I think it's a toss up. And the winner of the men's fancy is... The announcer paused to drag out the suspense. Duncan Rogers. What? I said lightheartedly. Who's this Duncan guy? Apparently him, Jonah chuckled, as one of the older men stepped forward to claim his prize. Liam and Ezra both turned to each other and shared a friendly handshake. Ezra quickly turned it into a hug, which looked like it caught Liam off guard. By the time the winners were announced, it was around 10 o'clock. People began to climb down from the stands and dispersed. What happens now? I asked my friends. Jonah draped an arm around me. We stay, we drink, we dance. Imogen rolled her eyes at him. The scheduled activities are over, but everyone will stay in the square until midnight. Now we just mingle and party. Liam came up to the front row of the bleachers where we sat and reached out for my hands. Before I could grab them, Essis jumped into his arms. I dropped my jaw playfully. What a cock block, Essis. Liam scratched his ears and Essis purred. What did you think? Liam asked as I stood beside him. I loved it, I said. I'm glad. He leaned over to peck me on the lips. I'm going to change back into my street clothes. Then we can hang out for the rest of the night. We'll wait here for you, I said. Liam handed Essis back to me, then headed back to the plank house to change. Let's get some drinks. Jonah begged. We will, Imogen promised, stroking Sassy's fur from where she was snuggling in her arms. Wait for Liam. I'm no good at waiting when it comes to drinks, Jonah teased. Squeaks swished her tail in agreement. Liam returned shortly after, wearing his usual jeans and a light jacket. Okay, should we start with... Liam was cut off by the sound of battle cries coming from just outside the square. People screamed and jumped out of the way as heavy footsteps pounded across the cobblestone. I thought at first that this was some sort of mock battle display like earlier, until I saw the fallen expression on my friends' faces. The sheer terror in their eyes sent my stomach plummeting to my toes. The source of the commotion finally came into view as the crowd jumped out of the way. Two men rode the biggest manticores I'd ever seen, Creatures with a lion's head, bat-like wings, and scorpion tails. Their creatures were at least a thousand pounds each. They tore through the middle of the square like they were on a mission to the ancestors. The men dragged two women behind them with ropes secured to their wrists. The women's clothes were torn, and their faces were so bloody I could barely make out their features. Their familiars were nowhere in sight. The manticores slowed as the men reached the center of the square, screaming like warriors going into battle. 
The crowd went silent, too stunned to do anything but gasp. My friends and I inched closer to each other in fear. Luanu was the first to step forward. He was still dressed in his regalia and feathered headdress. What is the meaning of this, Jonathan? His voice boomed over the square. We caught them, Jonathan shouted, holding the rope in his hand above his head like a victory flag. These two were caught smuggling magical creatures out of town. They were behind the disappearances and plague all along. Execution by element, someone shouted. The crowd responded with a mix of agreement and protests. I wasn't sure whether to be terrified or relieved that the criminals had been caught. Luanu held his hand up to quiet the crowd, but it barely helped. If this is true, they deserve a trial. If it's true, let them burn. Elder Mallison stepped forward and snarled. I hadn't even seen him come out of the crowd. I grabbed onto Liam tightly, my knees quivering. Names, a few people started chanting. Give us names. Who's involved? Jonathan looked down to the women with pure and unadulterated loathing. Past the blood on their faces, I could see the pleading look in the women's eyes. Eyes that I knew. I inhaled a sharp breath. It hit me who they were a second before Jonathan spoke. I knew them from my medical care of familiars and unicornology classes. Jonathan sneered their names like they were poison on his tongue. Those who kidnapped the missing familiars are none other than Professor Cynthia Costas and Professor Brenda Fawn. Chapter 23 The square erupted. People tried pushing inward to get to the two professors. The task force had arrived on scene and created a square barrier around the two manticores and their elementi. The professors stood in the middle of the square with their heads hung low, blood dripping down their faces. They'd been dragged to their feet. My mind could barely process the information. They were responsible for the plague and the kidnappings? How could this be possible? I knew them. Costas and Fawn were good people. They were my teachers. I held Sophia even tighter to my side as the accusations grew. The crowd parted as Elder Oleander emerged. He stood behind Mallison and sneered at the professors with disdain. Are these accusations true? Did you bring the plague upon the tribe, as well as kidnap and restrain various magical creatures? Professor Costas raised her head in defiance. We will not deny it. We were responsible. Angry shouts and slurs grew. The rage grew so loud I thought my ears might break. My body grew cold in denial. We have a confession. Execution. Execution by element, someone in the crowd shouted. The mob around us vocalized their support for blood. Elder Mallison raised his hands and the noise died down. The tribe deserves to know why, he said, glaring at Professor Fawn. We demand an explanation for these hideous acts. Fawn's voice was trembling, but she spoke clearly. We never meant for the plague to spread so far. The Miriamic Coven promised us that the curse that caused the plague could be easily contained. The sickness was only to target the familiars of the elders, so they would die and new leaders could assume their place. We never intended it to wreak havoc upon the public. Gasps spread around the square and Mallison's eyes widened. How dare you question our power? Oleander held up a hand to silence Mallison. And the missing familiars? We initially took only unbonded magical creatures to destabilize the region and cause distrust of the leadership within the tribe, Professor Costas spoke. Her tone was resolved and firm, like she'd already accepted her fate and was only using her last moments to defy the elders. As the plague spread, we intended to save as many bonded familiars as we could, so we stole familiars that we knew had contact with the diseased creatures. It was an elaborate plan that got out of hand. 
So you are confessing that all of this was an organized plot to bring down the elders, Oleander said. Costas nodded. Yes, we believe that if we disrupted the power system in the tribe, that a new government would take over, one that wouldn't be so cruel and unjust. Our plan wasn't to harm innocent people. It was to overthrow the elders and nothing more. Oleander spread his arms out wide and turned to the crowd. Is there anything more to investigate? It is clear that we have found the true perpetrators of this crime. They deserve a trial, a rebellious voice spoke out, but few voices rang out to agree with her. People were angry, very angry. Their faces contorted with hatred as they stared at the professors who'd caused so much pain and suffering. The trial has already been held, Oleander snarled. He faced Costas and Fawn. We, the elders, find you both guilty of high treason to the tribe. The sentence shall be public execution by element, carried out at once. How could he do that? All the elders weren't even here. I didn't know where they were. Oleander couldn't declare an official sentence without the approval of the other voters. But the crowd didn't seem to care. They shook their fists and cheered in approval of Oleander's ruling. I looked desperately over the crowd. Where the fuck was Dad? He needed to stop this madness. I didn't see him standing with the other elders. He'd been there only seconds before. Then he disappeared. Costas was Toaqua and Fawn was Navita. They'd be executed by their opposite element, Costas by fire and Fawn by air. Bring in their familiars, Oleander shouted. The mob roared, and our attention was diverted to a hydra and a unicorn being pulled on scene. Professor Costas's hydra, Hera, was dragged out from behind a building by several large familiars. A dragon, a wyvern, and a lizard that had to weigh a ton with razor-like spines on its back held ropes in their mouths that bound Hera's nine heads, even though Hera was large and frightening, she seemed terrified. She pulled on the ropes and tried to get to Professor Costas. The familiars holding the ropes bound her in place and prevented her from moving, except to drag her further into the square. She spat venom out of the poisonous spines on her back and used her tail to whip several familiars behind her aside, but more just jumped forward to pin her down. Though she lashed out with her big claws, eventually the weight of so many familiars on her back caused her to collapse onto the ground. Professor Fawn's familiar, Soraya, looked worse for the wear. The unicorn's golden horn had been broken off, and long gashes along her sides poured blood onto her velvet fur. The whites of her eyes showed as they rolled backwards in her head, she struggled weakly at the ropes that were held by wolves and screamed for Professor Fawn. It was a haunting sound I feared I'd remember for the rest of my life. Sophia let go of me and moved forward to do something, but I reached out and grabbed her shoulders to hold her back. Soph, don't, I begged. There were four of us and hundreds of them. This was impossible. We have to stop this. If we just stand here and let it happen, we're just as responsible, Sophia protested. Essa squeaked in agreement from within her arms. Sophia, if you interfere, they'll kill you too, Imogen said worryingly. The four of us stared at the scene about to take place, feeling completely helpless. Dad appeared suddenly in front of me, his face shadowed and dark. Find your siblings, take your friends and get out of here, Dad said to me. His tone was harsh and commanding. What do you mean? You can stop this, right, Dad? I asked weakly. Do as I say. Dad fisted his hand in my shirt before pushing me roughly. I staggered to the ground and Jonah went to pull me up. My mouth hung open for a moment as I watched Dad stride away. That got my attention. I immediately understood what was about to happen and knew we had to get out of here before it did. I turned toward the group and said, we gotta go, now. I grabbed Sophia's hand and started dragging her through the crowd. Imogen and Jonah closely followed along with their familiars. I searched the mob for Ezra and Maddie, but I didn't see them. There were just too many faces. Any last words? Oleander called. 
the four of us skidded to a halt. I knew I needed to move, needed to get my friends out of here, but it felt like I was frozen, feet glued to the ground. I couldn't pull my eyes away from the scene. Neither could anyone else. It's okay, Soraya, Professor Fawn said gently. Tears ran down her quivering face as she desperately tried to comfort her familiar. The unicorn snorted, blood drying on her inflamed nostrils. Professor Costas's voice was cold as she spoke without mercy. The ancestors will judge you for your cruelty, elders. I know I will join my family in the afterlife. Can you say the same? Oleander narrowed his eyes and said, I will hear no more of this slanderous talk from traitors. Let the execution commence. After he said those words, everything happened exceptionally quickly. Jonathan, the man who'd brought the professors in, stepped forward and whipped out his hand, creating a gust of wind that looked like a blade. His air magic sliced against Soraya's neck, and the unicorn instantly fell, her arteries sliced. Soraya! Professor Fawn screamed, her terrible yell cutting through the night. Soraya was down, her hooves desperately scraping the ground as she bled out. Jonathan then turned on Fawn and raised his hand. His fingers curled inward and Fawn clutched at her throat. She gasped, her face turning blue as the oxygen was slowly drained from her body. Nobody did anything. They just stood there and watched, some with horror and others with glee as Professor Fawn struggled to breathe. Beside her, Soraya's legs twitched and went still. Watching this was agonizing. Suffocation could take up to seven minutes. She'd suffer. Fawn's eyes pleaded for someone to have mercy and to help her. Jonathan smiled as he did it, as if it was pleasurable for him to take her life. He was dragging it out for as long as he could. I didn't even think about it twice. I knew I had to do something. It was more of an instinct than anything else. I closed my eyes tightly and focused my magic on Professor Fawn. She was less than a hundred feet away, so she was still in my range of magic. The water in her blood was pumping furiously as it tried to keep her alive without oxygen. It was just like killing a deer. I could feel her life be extinguished easily as I rushed the blood supply to her heart and it exploded inside her chest. I opened my eyes and watched as Fawn collapsed on top of her dead familiar, one hand still clutched around her neck. It was hard for me to comprehend that I'd taken Professor Fawn's life until I'd done it. My body went rigid with shock. I'd never killed a person before. Animals were different. I couldn't even understand what I had done because I didn't believe it. While I was still processing, the execution moved on. Oleander brought his hand down in an order, and Hera screamed in pain as the familiars holding her tightened the ropes around her necks. Hera was slowly pulled apart by the various familiars holding her ropes. They all went in different directions. I grabbed Sophia and pulled her face to my chest so she wouldn't see it, but she still could hear it. The sound Hera's body made as it was ripped apart was horrible. Blood went spilling in all different directions as her nine heads were torn from her torso. I could feel Essis's little claws scratching my stomach between Sophia and I as he scrambled to get free. You bastards! Costa screamed in rage. She ran forward, her water magic gathering in her bound fists. Chiefess Annette, who'd been lurking behind Malison, strode forward. She threw out both of her hands, creating a fire tunnel twelve feet tall that immediately engulfed Professor Costas. Costa screamed in terrible pain as the fire tunnel consumed her, flesh melting off her body. Her skin peeled away as the flames licked up her form. She staggered as her body turned immediately from human to charred ashes. Her charred husk fell to the ground in the fetal position, where her muscles contracted as the last of the flames died down from her form. I could smell her burning corpse from here as smoke rose over the square. After Costas fell, Jonathan moved forward. He sliced with his air magic, then held up Professor Costas's dismembered head for all to see. The professors and their familiars were dead before I could even comprehend it. 
The moment all four of them were gone forever, a cheer was raised among violent shouts of protest. Behind me, Jonah was throwing up. Imogen was crying. Sophia still had her face pressed into my shirt and was refusing to come out. I was glad she hadn't witnessed. Justice has been served, Oleander announced. There was scattered applause and cheering, though a lot of people like me stood in shocked silence. Nobody expected it to get that brutal. No, I heard the voice of Jamin Risk escalate above the crowd. She was on top of a statue and shouting loud for all to hear. The professors were right. The elders have too much power, and they've just shown it today. Death, death to the elders. Jamin had brought her army. The protesters among her raised shouts of approval at her words. Quiet down, or you'll be next, Mallison threatened. Worried murmurs scattered over the mob. That wasn't an execution. It was a slaughter, Jamin rebutted. I order you to stand down, Oleander said. He moved forward with task force members behind him, approaching Jamin at a high speed. The bodies of the dead lay in the square, and Oleander and the police stepped over them as if they didn't matter at all. Jamin didn't listen. People of Kinpago, look at what happened. These good professors sought to make a change, and the elders silenced their voices forever. The elders no longer work for the good of the people, Jamin raged. Are we going to sit back and do nothing about it? There was a divided yell of agreement and opposition. The task force members reached for Jamin. They tried to pull her off the statue, but Jamin's protesters fought back. That's when everything dissolved into absolute chaos. The task force members raised their guns and began shooting Noxite into the crowd. Jamin's protesters or not, it didn't matter. A whole line of people was knocked down by Noxite darts. Oleander lashed out at Jamin with his water, but Jamin uprooted the ground out from under him using Navita magic and caused him to fall over. The mob divided into two sides, those who opposed the elders and those who thought that justice had been served. Elements started flying everywhere as screams lit up the night. A stampede erupted in the middle of the square as Hawkeye started using their magic to hit anyone and anything. Things had gotten out of hand so quickly. The powwow had gone from a night of celebration to a desperate fight for survival. Guys, come on, I screamed. I started pushing my way through the panic. All of our familiars immediately went into protective mode. Squeaks shoved her way to the front and cleared a path for us. She bit into an elementi shoulder that stood in our way and tossed him several feet. Squeaks pushed back against people with her wings and trampled over people with her hooves that had fallen before us. She kicked a griffin in the face that had gone after Jonah and hissed before leaping onto him, ending his life with a quick blow to his neck. At her side, Sassy had transformed into a kitsune. She used the vines on her back in a whip-like fashion to push and slap people out of our way. Sassy opened her mouth and a beam of sunlight erupted from it. It blinded several people and familiars, causing them to stumble backwards. It cleared enough of a pathway that we were able to get out of the immediate area. Once we left the square, the temperature immediately got colder. But the riot had spread to include the entire city. It wasn't just the elementi that were losing it. Familiars fought each other as they tried to protect their elementi from the chaos. Large familiars, such as chimeras and elephants, squashed people underneath their giant feet while trying to escape. Dragons flew overhead and started lighting up houses. I caught sight of Jamin's vigilantes and their familiars destroying public property, toppling over statues and smashing buildings. One Navita, who I knew was on Jamin's side, used his earth magic to crumble a large office building to the ground. The four-story building came falling toward us at a high speed, looming overhead as it threatened to collapse on us. Jonah hurried backward the way he'd came with squeaks, while Imogen, who was ahead of us with Sassy, darted ahead. Sophia, move, I shouted. I pushed her out of the way and ended up tripping. 
Sophia darted ahead to the right side and escaped the falling tower, but I didn't have enough time to get up and out of the way. The shadow of the tower loomed over me as the building approached. I was going to be buried alive. I felt air magic yanking me backward, and I skidded along the ground as if being dragged. I just got out of range of the falling building before it smashed into the pavement. Dust and debris kicked up and got into my eyes and mouth. I sputtered, trying to catch my breath as I staggered to my feet. The building that had fallen over had killed dozens of people. Those barely alive moaned underneath the building, while limbs and unmoving bodies stuck out from under the crushed rubble. In the distance, I watched as several more buildings started crumbling down. Jamin's people were demolishing the entire city. My eyes hurriedly scanned the ruins. Where the fuck was my girlfriend? Sophia? Sophia! Liam! I heard Sophia scream. I caught sight of her over the ruins, mingling within the mob and holding on to Essis. Her head bobbed within the various faces of the crowd before it went under. Complete panic overtook my body. I hurried to climb over the ruins and follow, but a lion knocked into me and sent me flying. I landed hard against the ground again. Several people stepped on me and I screamed out in pain, though I don't think anyone heard me. A familiar kicked my head and my eyesight went hazy. I was nearly trampled before I felt a brawny hand on my arm. Jonah yanked me to my feet before I could get crushed. A couple of people tried to push past us, but Jonah punched a particularly big guy across the face and sent him hurling backward. The crowd gave us space after that. I tried to stop the world from spinning as I wavered on my feet. I lost Imogen, Jonah's voice was totally freaked out. He turned in place, but even with as tall as he was, he couldn't spot her in the madness. We need to find the girls, I said breathlessly. My head was spinning. I couldn't keep up, but my body couldn't give out on me now. If it did, I'd die out here. Right, Jonah said darkly. Air magic filled his palms. Let's fuck some shit up. Chapter 24 Liam, I shouted. My heart slammed wildly against my ribcage as the crowd dragged me away from my friends. Essis clung tightly to my shirt. He let out cries of terror that sent my stomach plummeting. Someone's shoulder knocked into mine as they raced away from the rubble. I went tumbling backward. I caught myself on the cobblestone, but a second later, someone's foot sank into my gut as they trampled over me. I held Essis and quickly got to my feet, before anyone could squash him. I looked to where Liam had just been standing on the other side of the rubble, but he was gone. Fuck! I spun in circles trying to find my friends. Liam, Imogen, Jonah! Vanessa, Lindsay, Miranda, Ezra. There were so many people here I cared about, and I didn't see a single one of them. Thank the ancestors my grandparents hadn't come to the powwow. I aimed my palm toward the sky. Fuck it, if anyone saw me conjure lightning. I had to signal to Liam where I was. But the lightning never came. My stomach dropped as I remembered I no longer had the spirit totem, the tool that had helped amplify my powers. I couldn't conjure lightning without it. I was totally screwed. The chaos around me didn't die down. If anything, it got worse. Rocks and rubble were flying through the crowd from Navita magic. The main fountain was empty since Toaqua were using the water to protect themselves. Whirlwinds swirled all around the square from Yapluma freaking out. And then there were the fires. Buildings went up in flames, lighting the entire square against the dark of night. Screams filled the air from every direction. Above me, Familiars of all different sizes flew through the sky, some racing away from the riots and others joining in. I couldn't find my bearings. Thanks, Sophia, I chastised myself. Instinct told me to run, to get out of there where Essis and I would be safe. But I couldn't go without my friends. I had to find them. And I wasn't going to find them standing here. My eyes turned upward toward the four-story buildings lining the square. 
I needed to get a good vantage point. I started racing toward the nearest building. As I got closer, I saw that the entrance was crowded with people trying to push their way through the door to find shelter. Ayapluma shouted at the crowd to move faster. When he got impatient, he thrust his air magic at the shop windows. They shattered, and nearby Hawkeye screamed. One woman clutched her face. When she brought her hands away, tiny shards of glass were embedded all along her skin. Her face dripped with blood. The Yapluma guy didn't even notice. He shoved her out of the way and jumped through the window to get inside. Several others followed, trampling her down. I pushed through the crowd to get to her, but before I could, a griffin had come to her rescue. She jumped on his back and they took to the skies. I turned back to the building entrance, but several fights had broken out in front of it. Blood splayed the cobblestone streets everywhere I looked. I thought I might be sick. I wasn't getting inside that building, and all the others looked just as bad. I needed another way to find my friends. My eyes caught the narrow alleyway, and I started toward it. I had to elbow people out of the way if I didn't want to be trampled. It felt like I could finally breathe when I made it through the crowd and into the empty alley. I took a moment to catch my breath and tied the ends of my blanket tightly around my waist so I wouldn't lose it. I sprinted over to the fire escape on the side of the building, jumped on top of the nearby dumpster, and leaped toward the ladder to pull it down. Essis clung to me the whole time, leaving my arms free to climb. My heart raced and my breaths were heavy when I made it to the roof. By the time I looked over the edge, the chaos in the square was even worse. A dragon flew overhead and rained fire down upon a corner of the square. I could hear the pained screams of elementi as the fire consumed their bodies. I couldn't bear to look. I forced my gaze away and continued to scan the square frantically, it was almost impossible to make out any of the faces. I caught sight of someone familiar and had to do a double take. My heart skipped a beat. Across the square, Maddie and Drew, the coigni I'd introduced her to months ago, were running hand in hand away from the dragon's fire. They ducked under a vendor booth to hide. Stay put, I'm coming for you. I continued to scan the square, my hands fisting at my sides. I didn't have time to stand here much longer. I had to find my friends, and I had to find them now. Before I could get another thought in, the building began to shake beneath my feet. I spread my arms out to steady myself on instinct, but the shaking continued. Essis climbed up my shirt and crouched on my shoulder, tangling his paws in my hair to hold on. He whimpered quietly in my ear. Below us, Hordes of people screamed and flooded out of the building they'd been hiding in. A Navita below raised his hands, destroying the foundation. Fuck, I mumbled under my breath. This building was going down, and I didn't have time to climb back down the fire escape. I glanced to the buildings on either side of me and quickly calculated the jump. It was too far. My eyes caught sight of an incoming creature. One of the manticores, I quickly realized. It was going to fly straight past us. The building creaked and groaned beneath my feet, and I knew this was my one and only shot. I backed up a few steps, took a deep breath, and said, Hang on, Essis! Then I sprinted toward the edge of the building. The brick gave way just as my feet left the edge. I soared through the sky with Essis hanging tightly to my shoulder and landed on the manticore's back. The manticore roared as it felt my weight land on top of it, and I breathed a sigh of relief. I quickly looked behind me to see the building crumbling to the ground. People screamed and ran out of the way, but others were crushed beneath the rubble. We did it, I cried. My relief only lasted a split second. This manticore was so not having it with me. It twisted its lion head back as we flew through the sky and snapped its terrifying jaws at my hands. I jerked away from where I was holding onto its fur until it couldn't reach me. It was so distracted that we nearly slammed into another building. Essis and I both screamed, 
and the manticore quickly corrected its flight. Once we were steady in the air again, it lifted its barbed scorpion tail and aimed it at me. I grabbed tightly to its fur and dodged out of the way of the attack. I was hanging over its side now, my pulse pounding in my ears. Fuck, fuck, fuck. I was barely hanging on and was going to fall. I readjusted my hand on the manticore's back and pulled myself up with all my strength. It aimed its tail at me again. This time I ducked my shoulder and wrapped my arm around its incoming tail, holding it in place. It roared in pain. Land, I commanded. The manticore huffed in protest. Now, I shouted, tugging harder on its tail. The manticore swooped down out of the sky. It crashed so hard and fast on the cobblestone that Essis and I went flying over its head. I threw my arms out to catch myself. Essis rolled across the ground and came to a stop several yards away from me. He lifted his head and shook it, looking disoriented. I barely had a second to glance at Essis before the manticore let out a loud, terrifying roar. A second manticore dropped out of the sky beside the first. They both bared their razor-sharp teeth at me and began to advance, like I was prey. Stay back, I warned, but they continued toward me. I shot a blast of fire out of my hands, but all they did was shake their heads like it tickled them. Low growls bubbled up out of each of their throats. Essis got to his feet and scurried in front of me. He lowered his head and aimed his horns at the manticores. Essis, no! I scrambled forward and scooped Essis up, then took off running. I jumped over rubble and broken statues, my heart hammering. The manticores pursued me. I could hear their roars from only feet away. When I glanced back, I saw that one of them was about to pounce. I threw myself to the ground at the last second, keeping Essis close to me so I wouldn't crush him. The manticore soared over me. It skidded into the base of a broken statue, its claws scraping along the cobblestone as it went. Its nose smashed into the stone, and it let out a whimper. Blood spurted from its face and dripped at its feet. Behind me, the second manticore let out a primal growl. I rolled over just in time to see its sharp scorpion tail headed straight toward me. I kept rolling as quick as I could. Its tail pierced the ground right where I'd been lying just a split second ago. The manticore shot me a hooded look, then ripped its tail out of the ground. Dirt and stone went flying everywhere. I jumped to my feet, and Essis hopped onto my shoulder again. I barely took a breath before the manticore with the broken nose lunged at me once more. I leaped out of the way, and it quickly whirled around to snap its jaws. Meanwhile, the second manticore had swiped its claws out on the other side. I ducked. The two collided. One bit the other, while the second left deep claw marks in the first's neck. It barely slowed them down. Really, it only pissed them off. Shit! I couldn't outrun them, and they were too big to fight on my own. They struck before I could come up with a plan. One aimed its tail at me, while the other snapped its jaws. I saw the solution in a split second and took the opportunity before I could second-guess myself. I ducked out of the way of the jaws, then spun and grabbed a hold of the other's tail. I yanked it forward and dragged it downward. The barb sank into the other manticore's neck. It reeled back on its hind legs and let out a pained roar as the venom entered its bloodstream. Before the first manticore could yank its tail away, I brought fire to my palms and let it burn as hot as I could manage. The manticore jumped away from me as its tail lit up in flames. The fire spread up its tail and to its body, quickly spreading to its wings. The manticore reeled on the ground in pain, while the other collapsed dead. I stepped back, breathing heavily and shaking at the knees. My flames consumed the manticore. It gave one last twitch, and then it went still. Essis tugged on my hair and pointed. My eyes caught sight of a familiar couple. 
Ben and Marcy were running away from one of the fires. I took off sprinting toward them. They stopped when I crossed in front of their path. Ancestors, I cried. Are you two okay? This was the first time I'd seen them all night. Marcy was clutching her winged teacup pig in her arms, and tears were streaming down her cheeks. Sophia, Ben said breathlessly. You have to get out of here. I know, I replied in a rush. But I have to find my friends. Have you seen them? Marcy wiped at her nose. No, we just got here. Just got here, I asked. Why do you come? We were trying to warn everyone, Ben explained quickly. We knew Jamin might start a riot tonight. She took Marcy's familiar and threatened to hurt her if we told. We had to go find Daisy before we told anyone, to protect her. But when we got here... Marcy trailed off and glanced around to the destroyed square. I could hardly believe it. Jamin's taking this shit too far. Marcy stroked Daisy's head and nodded in agreement. We'll help you find everyone, Ben promised. Did you see where they went? I don't know, I shook my head. Last I saw, Imogen went that way, and Jonah and Liam. I was cut off when an arrow whizzed through the crowd and sliced straight into Marcy's stomach. Her eyes went wide in shock, and a chilling silence fell over the three of us. Ancestors! Ben caught Marcy as she fell to the ground, letting out an agonized cry. I quickly knelt beside them and frantically glanced around the crowded square. What the fuck? And then I saw it. A group of rioters had grabbed bows from a vendor stall and were firing the sharp-tipped arrows into the crowd. Shit, I turned back to Ben. We have to get out of the square. I couldn't find my friends anywhere. I hoped that meant they'd made it out. Either way, Ben, Marcy, and I had to get out of here if we wanted to survive. Agreed. Ben reached down for the arrow, but I stopped him. Wait, I said. Pulling it out could increase the bleeding. Right, right. Ben sniffled as he stared down at the woman he loved. He was starting to panic. I grabbed his wrist, forcing him to look at me. Listen, Ben, Marcy's going to be okay, but we have to get her out of here. This kind of wound would take time for Essis to heal. If we stayed any longer, another one of us could get shot. He could work his magic as soon as we were somewhere safe. Ben nodded and wiped the tears away. Okay. He scooped Marcy up in his arms. She gasped in pain, but didn't protest. I've got her, he said. Let's go. Essis jumped off my shoulder and onto Marcy's stomach. Essis, no, Ben insisted. It's fine, I said quickly. He can help. Ben didn't question it. He carried Marcy and the two familiars toward the edge of the square. We dodged arrows as we made a run for safety. I saw Maddie and Drew over there earlier, I said, pointing. Go get them. Ben instructed. We'll meet you at the edge of the square. I'll be right there, I assured him, as I took off toward the vendor table I'd seen Maddie and Drew hide under. I left Essis with them so he could heal Marcy. But I didn't make it halfway there before I heard the sound of a dragon roaring above us. I whirled around to see a huge red dragon swooping down, aiming its talons straight at Ben. Ben, I shouted. He saw the dragon, but there was nothing he could do. The dragon curled its massive talons around Ben and Marcy. Essis squealed and jumped out between the talons and onto the cobblestone. His blue eyes went wide in terror as he watched Ben, Marcy, and Daisy being dragged away into the sky. No, I screamed, my voice wavering. Blood rained down into the square and Ben and Marcy's screams echoed above me. Without warning, the dragon unclenched its talons, and the couple tumbled through the air, screaming as they clutched tightly to one another. Nobody but Essis and I seemed to notice. Had a Yapluma seen, they might have been able to stop what came next. 
I heard their bones crunch. The same time their screams came to an abrupt halt. I let out a horrified shriek and slapped my hands over my mouth. Ben and Marcy were only yards in front of me, but I was completely frozen. I couldn't move as I took in their twisted limbs and lifeless stares. Blood spattered the ground everywhere, and a jagged, broken bone stuck out of a raw, bloody wound in Ben's leg. Large gashes sliced across Marcy's side from where the dragon's talons ripped into her. Bits of insides that never should have seen the light of day leaked out of her. Even Marcy's familiar was lying beside them, its skull crushed in, and its eyes turned up to the dark sky. Their eyes still held terror as they gazed blankly up at the smoking sky. My entire body shook so much that I thought the ground was quaking again. Essis gently tugged on my pant leg. I tore my gaze away from the bodies, but it did nothing to remove the image from my mind. I didn't think anything ever would. I looked down at Essis, and he gave me a sad expression. Without awaiting my instruction, Essis stepped forward and placed his hands on Marcy's stomach. The arrow had been broken off and shoved even deeper into her skin. I finally found my feet and stepped up to their dead bodies. Tears welled in my eyes, but a searing burn in my face kept them back. Essis, I whispered. He dropped his ears and looked up to me with watery eyes. It broke my heart. It was as if he was questioning why it wasn't working. He didn't understand they were already dead. I shook my head and swallowed the lump in my throat. I'm sorry, buddy, but they're gone. Essis furrowed his brow and turned back to Marcy. He resituated himself and stepped into the blood, pooling between their bodies. He placed one paw on Marcy and another on Ben. Essis, I pleaded, it won't work this time. He blinked up at me. I could hardly bear it. Ben and Marcy were gone. And somewhere out there, a magical creature destined to bond with Ben, his literal soul, was dying and didn't know why. A creature roared in the sky. I was too distracted to place what it was, but it snapped me back to attention. I reached for Essis, forcing myself to pull myself back together again. It took everything I had. Come on. Essis clung to me and stared desperately after Ben and Marcy as I ran away. Blood coated my shirt from his paws, but I didn't care. I stopped beside one of the vendor tables and ducked down. Two terrified faces stared back at me as the elementi clung to each other. Maddie and Drew. I held my hand out. We have to go. Sophia, Maddie breathed in relief. She wiped her tears, and the two of them crawled out from under the table, their knees shaking. Where's Liam? We got split up, I said, taking her hand. Where's Era? She's not here. She went hunting just before. Maddie's voice cut off as a screech filled the air. Above us, Arakari dropped out of the sky. She landed with a hard thud in front of us and flung herself at Maddie, nearly knocking her over as she nuzzled her head against her shoulder. They both looked relieved to see each other. Get on! I started ushering Maddie and Drew onto the ice dragon. No, wait! Drew protested. What about- You need to get somewhere safe, I insisted. Meet us at the castle outside the southern tower on the third floor. It was the safest place that came to mind. Maddie pushed against me but I shoved her harder onto Arakari's back. My brothers, she shouted. I'll find them, I promised. Get out of here, now. Maddie and Drew didn't have a choice. As soon as they were on Era's back, she took off to the skies. I felt like a small weight had lifted off my shoulders now that I knew at least two people I cared about were safe. Two down, about 30 more to go. My eyes darted around the square. By now, the crowd had thinned, but the riots continued. 
It had only been minutes since all this started, but it felt like a lifetime. The sound of shattering glass came from all directions. People continued to fight one another, and magic of all kinds whipped through the square. The blessing tree was entirely consumed by flames, and it broke my heart. The fire was so big that I could feel the heat radiating off of it from 20 yards away. What was fucking wrong with these people? And where were the elders? It was like they'd all fled. At least, I'd thought so, until I spotted Madame Doya and Professor Bain across the square. Doya was calming the flames raging through a shop, while Professor Bain was gathering what water he could find left in nearby fountains to clear a path for people stuck inside. I could hear their screams from here. Naomi went full-on fire lion, then jumped through the flames into the open doorway. Four other Coigny ran up to help. My heart lifted in my chest when I saw who it was. Lindsay, Miranda, Bren, and Vanessa. Their familiars, Medusa, Kingston, and Aisha, were all beside them. The students lined up beside Doya and helped kill the flames. I took off running toward them. Before I could get there to help, they'd killed the flames inside the building. Naomi walked out of the smoke in her regular form. In her mouth, she carried a baby swaddled in a blanket. The parents, Toakwa, rushed out behind her, coughing and sputtering. The smoke was so thick that they could barely breathe. I arrived a moment later. Guys! Sophia! Lindsay cried in relief. She threw her arms around my neck, squashing S's between us. You're okay! Doya whirled toward us, totally oblivious to our little reunion. What are you all still doing here? She snapped in the sharp tone she'd mastered. All of you must leave immediately. But we can help, I started. You need to get to safety, Bane roared in a tone I'd never heard him use. It was so commanding that none of us could argue with him. He's right, Bren said quickly. Bren grabbed Vanessa around the waist and hoisted her up onto Kingston's back his three-headed familiar with a snake's tail and bat-like wings. Vanessa let out a surprised squeal. Let's go, Miranda shouted. We all glanced around, and the realization hit us at once. Between the fallen buildings and raging fires, the square was completely blocked off. Then I saw it, an alleyway that was burning with fire, but I could see to the other side. We were all coigny. We could make it. There, I pointed. We ran toward the fire with our familiars at our sides, leaving Bane and Doya behind. With five of us, the fire blocking our path was easy to calm. But what we found beyond it sent my stomach plummeting to my toes. Imogen stood in the middle of the alleyway, looming over an old man who was cowered against the side of the nearest building. His familiar was nowhere nearby. He held an arm up in front of his face, like he was trying to protect himself from her and Sassy, who was in kitsune form at Imogen's side. His leg was twisted, and his regalia was stained with blood. It looked as if his leg had been crushed by one of the falling buildings. He'd probably crawled into the alleyway, and Imogen had found him like that. Please, the man begged in a wavering tone. You killed him, Elder Pool, Imogen shouted taking another step toward the man. The murderous look in her eyes was enough to make anyone cower. You designed the water task that took Cade in the elemental cup. Imogen, I shouted from down the alleyway. I shoved Essis into Lindsay's hands and started sprinting. I couldn't get to Imogen soon enough. No! Imogen never heard me. She gave the signal and Sassy shot vines out of her back. They snapped at Elderpool in the blink of an eye, wrapping around his neck tightly. He clawed at the vines and gasped for air. My body slammed into Imogen's, and I tackled her to the ground. She stumbled over Sassy, who let out a high-pitched squeak and loosened her hold on Pool. What the fuck? Imogen pushed me off her. Her expression relaxed when she saw it was me. Sophia? Imogen, stop it, I commanded. You can't do this. 
We both got to our feet. Imogen's hands fisted at her sides, while her features contorted in fury. I can! Poole and the elders are responsible for too many deaths. Look what's happened here tonight! I grabbed Imogen by the shoulders and shook her. You can't solve murder with murder. Killing Poole won't bring Cade back. Imogen blinked a few times, absorbing my words. Her chest rose and fell rapidly. I softened my tone. You're not a murderer, Imogen. She didn't respond. She just stared Elder Poole down, like she wasn't sure whether she wanted to kill him or not. Imogen, leave it, I demanded. We have to get out of here and find Liam and Jonah. At the sound of Jonah's name, Imogen seemed to snap back to attention. She looked beyond me at the group and realized for the first time that Jonah and Liam weren't with me. Her face paled. She turned to Poole and sneered. I'll let you go today, but only because there's been enough death tonight. Mark my words, Elder Poole. The Elder's Day is coming. Imogen! I pushed at her, but she kept her eyes on Poole. Sassy ran ahead, and Imogen finally turned to follow her. She was fuming as she stomped out of the alleyway. I was just relieved she hadn't gone through with it. I took Essis back from Lindsay, and our group stepped out of the alley. We didn't bother to help Poole. Outside the main square wasn't the safe haven I'd been hoping for. Fires burned through the streets, though they weren't as large as the ones inside the square. The cobblestone had been upheaved in some places, and injured people were suffering on the edge of the sidewalks as other elementi and familiars tended to them. Voices overlapped as people cried out in pain or called for their loved ones. Jonah! Imogen screamed. Liam! Jonah! Wren cupped his hands around his mouth and called for them. No reply. My heart sank further and further as we walked through the streets of Kinpago without any sign of them. What if they were back in the square, buried under a pile of rubble? My chest ached just thinking about it. No, I told myself. They made it out. They had to. Still, a voice in the back of my head made my whole body shake. But what if they didn't? We rounded the corner. And that's when my heart stopped. I felt both joy and utter despair all at once. Jonah and Liam were standing in the middle of the street, fighting a giant cobra as thick around as I was and at least 50 feet long. It bared its long fangs, then snapped its jaws toward Liam. He jumped out of the way and rolled across the cobblestone. I threw my hand over my mouth and screamed. Liam gathered water from a nearby trough meant for horse familiars. It smacked hard into the cobra's nose before it could strike again, and the creature reeled back, hissing. Squeaks snapped her beak at the end of the cobra's tail, while Jonah swirled his hands above himself to stir up a windstorm. Liam, I cried, rushing forward. He turned to look at me while repeatedly spraying water toward the cobra's face. Sophia. Jonah heard his cry. Sophia, Imogen! Imogen ran beside me, the others close behind, as we hurried toward them. Liam ran out of water, and the cobra shook his head. He looked pissed. Back away, I shouted as I stopped beside Liam. I held one palm up toward the snake, showing off my fire. I didn't want to kill it in case it was bonded. Imogen didn't wait around. The earth shook, and plants pushed up through the cobblestone and wrapped around the cobra. But instead of holding it down, it quickly slithered out of the plant's hold. The snake was faster than Imogen. It circled around our group, causing us to back toward each other. Lindsay and Miranda shot fireballs at the creature, but it saw them coming and dodged around them. We've got this. Bren quickly helped Vanessa off Kingston and pushed her to Aisha's side. He stepped in front of her protectively, and huge streams of fire rose up out of his hands. Kingston, attack! Kingston lunged forward. 
His lion head snapped at the cobra, while the goat head aimed its horns at it, and the dragon head shot fire. Kingston barely made it three steps before the cobra had slithered out of his reach. The cobra lifted its head, then snapped forward toward Vanessa. Vanessa screeched, but before the snake could get to her, Aisha had jumped in the way. She snapped her powerful dragon jaws at the cobra. Blood spurted out of the cobra's face and flew everywhere. Bren lifted his arms to shoot fire, but Vanessa grabbed him and said, don't, you could hurt Aisha. Aisha lunged again. Squeaks, Kingston, and Medusa all joined in to help her. They bit and scratched at the creature, scraping scales off as they attacked. Sassy whipped her vines out at the snake, leaving red, bloody marks behind. Medusa was less than half its size, but she slithered up its body and wrapped her own around it, squeezing hard. The cobra let out a low, growling hiss, then collapsed onto the street in a heap. Ancestors, I cried as the street quieted. Squeaks clacked her beak and jumped around, pleased to see we were still alive. Essis struggled out of my arms and ran ahead of me. He jumped onto Liam's pant leg and climbed him until he was sitting on his head, giving him the biggest hug he could. Liam and I collided like two magnets. He squeezed me so tightly I could hardly breathe, but I didn't care. They were okay. And that was all that mattered. Liam took my face in his hands and kissed me over and over again. Beside us, Imogen and Jonah embraced, and Squeaks and Sassy rejoiced. You're alive, Liam cried. I was looking for you. My voice cracked as tears started to stream down my face. What happened? We were looking for you, Liam said. We saw the cobra's elementi die, and he went full-on murder crazy. He came after us. I buried my face in his chest, and my tears soaked his shirt. I'm so glad you're okay. Just as I said it, a huge gust of wind swept through the street. It was so strong that Essis clung to Liam's hair to keep from getting swept away. His feet left Liam's head, and he waved in the wind like a flag. I jumped up to catch him, then cradled him to my chest. Our whole group huddled together, with the largest familiars on the outside to protect us from the raging winds. It's not over, I shouted above the deafening noise. We have to get to the castle. The castle? Jonah shouted. I told Maddie to meet us there, I yelled back. My hair whipped around my face. It's the safest place right now. The semester's over. No one's there. Good idea, Imogen shouted. The winds began to die down, and we all parted. Liam breathed a sigh of relief. Maddie's okay? Yes, Erikari took her to the castle, I said. We have to get there. What about Ezra? Imogen asked. He's got a freaking thunderbird, Lindsay pointed out. He'll be okay. A loud screech came from the skies at that very moment. We looked up to see Diami soaring overhead, lightning crackling around his form. Ezra leaned on his back, and they circled around to land in the middle of the intersection with us. The ground shook beneath Diami's feet. Ezra jumped off his familiar's back and rushed over to Liam. I'd never heard him sound so worried. I've been looking everywhere for you. Where's Maddie? At the castle, Liam said. We need to get up there. I saw a lot of people headed that way, Ezra said. Do you think it's still safe? We know somewhere that will be, I replied quickly. Our group started down the street. It was a straight shot to the road that led to the castle. Liam walked in front, with Bren and Ezra on either side and Jonah at the back. The four guys were protecting us girls in the middle. The further we got from the square, the quieter it became. It felt like we might actually be safe. Until we reached the edge of town. Task force members were lined up along the road to the castle, blocking our route. They were spread out from the thick line of trees on one side of the road to the wide river on the other. What the hell? Ezra exclaimed. They weren't here when I was flying over before. 
the task force caught sight of us, and three of them broke off and started walking our way. I stole a glance at Liam. Do we run? A muscle in Liam's jaw popped. No, we stand our ground. You're to stay in the city limits, one of the task force members demanded of us. Liam stepped forward and raised his chin to the masked men. No, our family is out there. Let us through. We have explicit orders from the elders to keep the Hawkeye contained within the city, the task force member growled. You're to return or be marked as traitors. It's a bloodbath back there, Jonah shouted. Liam turned to him and calmly held up a hand, signaling for Jonah to let him handle it. He turned back to the task force. My heart pounded as I wondered what he was planning. I looked around for ideas, but there was only one way to the castle. Our airborne familiars couldn't carry all of us at once, not to mention the task force was armed with noxite guns. Liam, I said, maybe we should just go back. There had to be other ways to the castle than the main road. No, Liam insisted. I'm not leaving Maddie, so they're going to either let us through or die. The largest task force member, the one closest to us, scoffed. You're all students. You really think you can take us on? Liam lifted his palms at his sides. No, I know it. I swore I could hear the smile in the task force member's voice, though I couldn't see it beneath his dark helmet. Okay, boys, take aim. Now, Liam shouted. I barely knew what was happening. All at once, our group started to attack. Ezra gathered water from the river and started throwing balls of water at the task force, one after the other. Liam did the same, but with so much force that he knocked several on their asses. Lindsay, Miranda, Bren, and Vanessa shot fireballs in all directions. I quickly joined in, shooting fireballs at any task force member I could. Imogen rocked the earth beneath our feet, and Jonah sent the air raging around us until it was so loud I could hardly hear myself think. Several men on the task force shot noxite darts at us, but they were carried away by Jonah's wind. Others dropped their weapons and used their magic to counteract ours. The earth shook a little less and the winds died down. It was enough that they gained the upper hand and shot noxite darts into our group. Lindsay gasped and grabbed her leg. Lindsay, I cried, whirling around and rushing over to her. She fell onto one knee and cursed under her breath. Miranda was a mess beside her, looking like she had no idea what to do. She held on to Lindsay's shoulder and said, Shit, babe, hold on. Lindsay ripped the dart from her leg and opened her mouth to say something, but she didn't get a word out before her eyes rolled back into her skull. Everything happened so fast. I barely had a second to react before Bren shouted a curse. I looked over to see him ripping a noxite dart out of his shoulder. Bren! Vanessa jumped toward him and caught him on the way down. Essis, help! I shoved him toward Lindsay. I didn't know if he could do anything about the Noxite, but maybe his healing abilities would help her magic work it out of her system faster. Fuck! Not this again! Jonah shouted. The winds increased from his fury. Only seconds had passed. The earth was still rumbling and the winds were still swirling, but Noxite darts were flying everywhere. My nostrils flared and my whole body became alive with rage. I gathered all the fire I could in my hands, then aimed them at the nearest task force member, who was laughing in joy as our friends collapsed on the ground. Fire shot out of my palms like a flame torch, lighting the task force member up from his head to his toes. His laughter quickly turned to high-pitched shrieks. He dropped his gun and raced as fast as he could toward the river to extinguish the flames. He splashed around in the water frantically as the fire sizzled out. A split second later, a sharp pain shot across my belly. It felt like someone had pierced a needle through my guts. I felt my legs go numb, and the world began to blur. All I saw was Liam's face contorted in fury, 
before he let out a primal yell, and I fell to the ground. I heard Essis scream and the patter of his feet across the dirt. And then that was it. One second I saw everything, heard everything, and the next, utter blackness. It felt like I was only out a second before the world started to come back into focus again. The first thing I saw was Essis's white fur close to my face. I felt his warm paw on my cheek as he worked his healing magic to get the noxide out of my system. And then I saw Liam. He'd totally lost his shit. He stood at the front of our group, his hands held in the air as he controlled the river beside us. But it wasn't a river anymore. The entire riverbed was exposed, and all the water within it swirled around the task force members, trapping them inside. Liam threw his hands higher, and the water followed his command. It shot upward like a reverse waterfall, corkscrewing high into the sky. Against the moonlight, I could see the shadows of the task force members inside the water. The massive water tower reached its peak, then started twisting downward again. Just before it reached the riverbed, the entire river let go in an instant. Water rushed by so fast that it was like a flood coming down from the mountains. Task force members screamed as they were carried downstream at record speeds until we could no longer hear them anymore. All I heard was my ragged breathing as feeling returned to my extremities. Liam collapsed to his knees. Liam, I cried. I tried to push myself to my feet, but the noxite was still wearing off. Imogen, Jonah, and Ezra rushed to his side. Dude, Ezra exclaimed, laughing in a mix of exhilaration and disbelief. I can't believe you did that, Jonah said, clapping Liam on the back and helping him to his feet. That was so badass. Liam shrugged him off and stumbled back onto his hands and knees. I've got this. Give me a minute. He was a liar. His limbs were shaking, and there was almost no color left in his lips. What he'd just done took all his energy. It'd be weeks before he recovered. Liam! I finally got to my feet, though my knees shook. Liam's head snapped up at the sound of my voice. He looked in my direction, but it was like he was looking through me. That magic had taken more out of him than I'd thought. He could hardly see straight. Let us help you, I insisted. Essis hurried over and jumped on his back. He placed a paw at the exposed skin on Liam's neck. I could see Liam's entire body relax. His eyes finally focused on me as I knelt down beside him. He sighed and collapsed into my lap, enjoying the feel of Essis's powers rushing over him. Thanks, buddy. Now's not time for a nap, show off, Ezra teased. Liam kept his eyes closed and jabbed back. I saved your ass, didn't I? Ezra chuckled, then quickly said, No, but I'm serious. There could be other task force members out here. We can't wait around. He's right. Jonah stepped up and helped Ezra hoist Liam onto Diami's back. Liam barely had control of his limbs like they were made of dough. Guys, stop, Liam insisted. I'm fine. Even though he said it, he made no move to get off Diami. In fact, he settled in and closed his eyes, stroking Diami's soft feathers. Essis jumped down from Liam's shoulders and into my arms. Lindsay was still passed out, since Essis hadn't had enough time to heal her, and Bran was out cold in Vanessa's lap. Miranda stroked Lindsay's hair, but gave me a confused look. How, how did you do that? Are you immune to Noxite? I glanced around the road for signs of incoming task force members, but we were alone, for now. Let's get everyone to safety. I'll explain later. I set Essis down and reached for Bren's legs. Let's get him on Kingston's back. No, Vanessa said, grabbing my wrist to stop me. Miranda's right. How did you do that? Her eyes filled with tears. 
I could sense the feeling of betrayal in her eyes. I glanced to Miranda, who wore the same expression. My heart pounded at the thought of sharing my secret, but I couldn't keep it from them any longer. I wasn't going to let Lindsay and Bren lie here the rest of the night when I could help them. They'd know by the end of the night anyway. So I made a quick decision. My friends or my secret? The answer was obvious. I had to tell them the truth, just as I'd told Cade and Ezra when Imogen was in the hospital. Essis can heal, I said, dropping my head. Vanessa blinked back tears. Why didn't you tell me? Fuck, now I was going to cry. Vanessa sounded seriously hurt. I was protecting him, I said. My throat closed up. He could have helped Aisha, she accused. She glanced to her familiar with the twisted wing. I want him to, I sniffled. But I thought people would notice. I didn't want anyone to suspect. So we make something up, Vanessa insisted. Say she got surgery or something. Do you know how much that could have helped us in the tournament, Sophia? We can talk about this later, Jonah butted in. We need to get up to the castle now. Jonah and Ezra didn't wait for our permission. They hoisted Bren onto Kingston's back, then rounded the chimera to put Lindsay on Squeak's back. I'm really sorry, I said to Vanessa as she climbed on to ride Aisha to the castle. I'll explain everything. Vanessa pressed her lips together and didn't meet my gaze. Let's go. We started up the trail to the castle, keeping watch for task force members the entire way. Somehow, amidst all the chaos, we made it to the castle without any further hiccups. We entered through a back door Ezra said he used to sneak out. Task force members would for sure be swarming the Great Hall, and we had to get past them to get to Maddie. We climbed the stairs to the third floor and found Maddie, Drew, and Arakari sitting against the wall near the southern tower. Maddie shot to her feet and rushed over to us. Ez, she cried, throwing her arms around her brother. She quickly turned to Liam. What happened? Liam shrugged from where he lay on Diami's back. Used up all my magic in one go. I'll be fine. Liam, Maddie scolded. Come on, Jonah hissed. He unlocked the doors to the Anachi dorms and gestured for us all to follow him into the tower. I thought this tower was off limits, Miranda said as we stepped inside and started climbing the twisted stairs. Are you sure this is safe? Jonah waited until everyone was inside, then closed the door and locked it behind us. Safest place in the castle. No one knows about it. The school board lied to keep us out, Imogen explained from the front of the group. The truth is, it's been abandoned so long because it's really... We reached the top, and Ezra gasped, cutting her off. The Anachi dorms, he said in shock as the room came into view. The Anachi dorms? Vanessa exclaimed. We all entered the vast common room. Miranda, Vanessa, and Ezra couldn't rip their eyes away as they took in the Anachi carvings along the walls and the high, ornate ceiling. Maddie's jaw dropped as she spun in circles, admiring it all. Drew's eyes locked on the huge fireplace, and a light smile spread over his face at the beautiful architecture. No one will find us here, Imogen said, sounding the most like herself all night. Please, just don't tell anyone. We won't, Miranda promised. Let's get Lindsay and Bren to the couches, Imogen suggested. Jonah and Ezra laid the two of them over the couches, and I stepped up with Essis in my shaking arms. Across the room, Diami lay down with Liam still on his back. Liam stayed there with his eyes closed, looking comfortable, though I could tell he was still awake and alert. He was just waiting to get his strength back. I placed Essis on Bren's stomach, and he got to work. I quickly untied my blanket from my waist and draped it over Lindsay's legs, it was covered in dirt and blood, but I didn't care right now. All I cared about was my friends. Now that things had calmed down, the weight of everything that had happened tonight finally sank in. 
I closed my eyes and pressed a hand to my mouth, trying to push the images out of my mind, but it didn't work. All I saw were the bodies, the fires, and the crumbled buildings. I saw blood everywhere I looked. Ben and Marcy's lifeless stares would forever be seared into my memory. I turned away from the group momentarily as tears streamed down my face. A heavy weight settled on my chest, and it took all I had to not let a sob bubble up and over the edge. My friends still needed me, and I had to be strong for them. I quickly dashed the tears away and took a deep breath. It felt like an elephant was sitting on my chest, but I resolved not to let it show. I'd cry it out later, when I was alone. I turned to Vanessa, who stood at the head of the couch to watch over her husband. Tears fell down her cheeks as she stared down at him, rubbing her swollen belly. Vanessa, I said softly, my voice cracking. I'm so sorry I never told you. But you have to understand, if the elders found out, they'd use Essis for their own personal gain. She sniffled and wiped at her nose. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have gotten so mad back there. It's just these hormones. They make me crazy. She forced a chuckle, but it sounded pained. I just, I can't believe you've had this healing power all this time and didn't. Vanessa, we will, I promised. Now that you know, we'll make sure Aisha gets her flight back. I won't tell anyone, she assured me. I swear it. I know. I said in a small voice. I'm really sorry. About everything. She seemed to completely forget about me as Bren's eyes shot open. Vanessa threw herself at him. Oh, Bren! He ran a hand over her back, looking confused. Where are we? The Anity Dorms! Vanessa cried into his shoulder. Essis hopped over to the next couch to help Lindsay while Vanessa continued to explain to Bren what happened. Miranda looked up from where she was crouched at Lindsay's side. Thank you for your help, Sophia. I shook my head. I'm not the one with healing magic. Essis is. Yeah, but you didn't have to tell us, Miranda pointed out. You could have just let them ride it out. I can't do that, I told her. You guys are my friends. Exactly she said, which means your secret's safe with us. I forced a smile. Thank you. Across the room, Liam coughed and pushed himself to a sitting position, stealing my attention. Give me a minute, I said to Miranda. Liam slid off Diami's back, but he wasn't standing for more than two seconds. He leaned against Diami and slid to the floor, taking in deep breaths. Are you going to be okay? I asked as I sat beside him. Being close to him helped ease some of the suffocating weight on my chest, but it was still unbearable. He nodded. It just took a lot out of me. You'd be useless, too, if you used that kind of magic. I frowned. You're not useless. I didn't mean that, he said, raking his fingers through his hair. So you told everyone? About Essis? I had to, I said. Even if we hadn't been knocked out, everyone still has scrapes and bruises Essis can help with. I don't want to hide him forever if he can help them. I only want to hide him from the people who would abuse his power. Liam nodded in agreement. Soph? What? I asked. I... I have to tell you something, he admitted. His voice sounded weird. It took on a quality I'd never heard before. My heart sped up. It didn't sound good at all. What? Liam rested his elbows on his knees and nodded his hands together. I don't know how to say this, but it's kind of huge and I can't keep it from you. What, Liam? Ancestors, he was worrying me. He took a deep breath, stalling. Across the room, Lindsay had woken, and Miranda was explaining to her what had happened. Essis moved on to Aisha. 
and her wing healed right before our eyes, straightening until it looked as if it was never broken in the first place. It was like the first time I'd seen it, when he'd healed her birth defect in Dragonology, right before the fall that had broken it and left it twisted again. Vanessa sank to her knees and cried in joy as Bren wrapped her in his arms. Aisha flapped her wings and hopped around, rejoicing. I love you, Essis, Vanessa exclaimed, scooping him up and giving him a kiss. Essis reached his paws out and hugged her back. I turned my attention back to Liam. He swallowed hard. What did you want to tell me? I asked. Water brimmed his lower lids, and his eyes burned red. I... I killed Professor Fawn. I gaped at him for a moment before forcing out, What? It had to be some sort of a joke. I'd been there. Those assholes had killed Fawn, right? He shook his head in regret, and the truth hit me hard like a punch to the gut. He was serious. She was suffocating, and I couldn't watch it. Liam's voice wavered. I couldn't let her suffer like that, so I used my magic to, to stop her heart. My blood ran cold. I could hardly wrap my head around what he was saying. Liam had killed someone tonight. It was in mercy, but still, he'd taken a life and I could see on his face just how much it bothered him. He'd never be able to overcome the guilt. Liam, I whispered. I reached toward him and wrapped him in my arms. He rested his head on my shoulder, but he didn't move. He didn't make a sound. Across the room, the group looked okay, as okay as they could be after a night like tonight. We were safe and everyone was healed, but over in our corner, just Liam, Diami, and me, it felt dark and depressing, beyond anything I'd ever felt before, even worse than the cup. Yeah, we'd made it, but at what cost? So many people had lost their lives tonight. Jonah and Imogen were still on edge. Imogen sat near the window, looking out toward the empty forest. It was like she was keeping watch, waiting for the task force or the elders to swoop in for an attack. Maddie kept throwing glances our way, like she was worried about Liam. It was nearing midnight, and everyone was exhausted. I'm going to scope things out downstairs, Jonah announced as he and Squeaks started for the doors. We'll make sure it's safe out there. I'll come. Bren started toward him, but Jonah held a hand up. The fewer who go, the better, he said. I don't want anyone spotting us. Fair enough. Come back safe, man, Bren said, clapping Jonah on the shoulder. He nodded. I will. Jonah started down the stairs, and I turned back to Liam. Liam, do we still want to keep doing this? Hunting down the pieces to the prophecy and everything? I asked, so quietly that I wasn't sure Liam had heard me. I could barely speak past the lump in my throat. I don't know if we can still save this society, or if it's too far gone. Liam lifted his head to look at me. His face had fallen, but other than that, I couldn't read his expression. That's exactly why we need to stick with it. We need to save the Hawkeye. People are going to die in our name, I pointed out. Is it worth it? Liam nodded. With Oleander on the council, more people will die if we don't do anything. We need to stick this out. I took a deep breath. Liam made a damn good point. We couldn't abandon the Hawkeye when they needed us most. The prophecy was already coming true, and we had to find some way to reverse it. Okay, I said. I agree. But if we keep doing this... We have to go forward knowing that after tonight, Arenda Academy will never be the same. Kinpago will never be the same. There's no coming back from what happened tonight. 
Liam's expression was heartbroken. I know. He reached out to wrap me in his arms. I knew this was only the beginning. The houses were turning against each other, and tonight had marked the beginning of even worse things to come. More people would die because of the prophecy, because of us. Navita and Yapluma would soon choose their side, and we would have to find some way to change the future. If we didn't, we were all fucked. Footsteps on the stairs caught our attention. Jonah rushed back into the room, looking relieved. Guys, it's safe to come out now. Head Dean Alric is in the Great Hall, calling everyone down. Let's go. Chapter 25 I felt numb all over as we headed down to the Great Hall in a collective group. My eyes couldn't focus on anything in front of me. I put one foot in front of the other, like I was compelled to do so. I didn't feel like I had any control over my body. All I could see replaying in my head was the sight of Professor Fawn collapsing on the ground over and over. Is this what it felt like to be a murderer? Sophia caught my zombified gaze and slipped her hand into mine. She gave it a tight squeeze as she said, Try not to think about it. My mouth was dry. I can't think about anything else, I whispered back quietly so the others wouldn't hear. I just killed somebody. You didn't have a choice. You spared Professor Fawn a horrible death, Sophia said. It wasn't like it was murder. It was a mercy killing. How do you live with yourself after doing something like that, I asked. Sophia stared at me. I don't know. You just go forward. But I don't know how, I said hoarsely. How can I go on knowing what I did? Professor Fawn would thank you, Sophia whispered. There was no other way. That much was true. Fawn's eyes were crying out for someone to save her as she'd gasped for air. She'd just watched her familiar die. There was no greater suffering than that. I knew. I'd done the right thing tonight, even though it had come at a grave cost to my conscience. Sophia wrapped her arm around mine and leaned against me. Not a lot of people would be strong enough to do what you did, you're willing to make tough decisions. That's one of the reasons why I love you. She didn't say anything more about it. Essis hopped from her shoulder to mine and settled in, wrapping his tail around the back of my neck. There was a large group of people in the Great Hall, and not all of them were students. They looked like a collection of adults and children pressed against the walls with their familiars. Many people were injured or bleeding. Dad, Ezra shouted. Relief flooded through me as I saw my father standing in the corner of the great hall. He was no longer wearing his headdress, and his regalia was stained with blood and dirt. But at least he was alive, though he looked terribly worried. Tatum stood at his side and let out loud rumbles, as if calling for us. Ezra shoved his way through the crowd with the help of Diami's big wings. We followed him. Ezra flung his arms around Dad the minute he was within range. Dad hugged him tightly before embracing me. Maddie was crying. Dad wrapped her in his arms and kissed her head. The worry on his face was replaced with ease. Thank the ancestors you're all safe, Dad said. I've been looking for you for hours. Is everyone else okay? Ezra asked. Your mother and the rest of your siblings made it home before the riot started, Dad said. It's a miracle all of us made it out alive. Dad, how many people are dead? Maddie asked. Dad's expression hardened. Maddie, you don't need to know. Dad, please, Maddie begged. Dad looked to everyone's inquiring faces gathered around the group. He sighed and said, Right now, the body count is somewhere around 500. A thousand, if you count familiars. Most people died when the buildings collapsed around the square. Maddie started sobbing. Dad wrapped her in another hug. The rest of us stared at the carpet. I knew that hearing numbers of the dead made Maddie upset, but I was honestly a little relieved. I figured the death toll would have been higher than that. There were 10,000 people in Kinpago at any given time, probably more than that tonight since it was New Year's Eve and people were out celebrating. 
that the slaughter had been mostly confined to the square was a blessing. I should have been able to stop this, Maddie sniffed. I could have prevented it. Maddie, you couldn't have done anything. What are you talking about? Drew asked. The rest of the group looked confused, but Dad, Ezra, and I shared helpless glances. Maddie was a natterai. Of course, she took it upon herself to feel guilty if she couldn't predict the future all the time, even if her visions didn't work like that. There's nothing you could have done. There was nothing that I could do, Dad confessed. This has been coming for quite some time. Maddie let go of Dad, and he looked at me. He seemed apologetic. For the first time, I noticed a trunk beside him, sitting between Tatum's big paws. Ezra, I managed to save your regalia, Dad started. But Liam, I'm sorry, son. Tatum pushed the trunk that carried my regalia toward me with his head. I kneeled down and opened it up. My heart dropped when I saw the mess of feathers, broken strings and beads smeared with a collection of dirt and blood. My regalia, it was trashed. It was ruined after the plank houses were raided and torn down. Some of Jamin Risk's rebels started destroying anything related to Hawkeye lore. I'm sorry to say your regalia was part of it, Dad said heavily. This had taken me years to make. I didn't even know how to fix it. I couldn't. It was completely ruined. I swallowed the lump in my throat and shut the trunk. It's okay. What matters is that we're all safe. I said finally, though I don't know what I'm going to do with it. It was beyond repair, but it meant too much to me to throw away. I'll take it for now, Imogen offered. I passed the trunk off to her, and she set it down beside Sassy. I caught sight of Elder Oleander standing twenty feet away. He jerked his head, and Dad's face became stoic. I have to go. There's an announcement to be made. Things are going to be all right. I promise. Dad walked away. Sophia took Maddie in her arms instead and tried to calm her down. I observed as Dad and Tatum sullenly followed Elder Oleander like a dog on a leash. When Dad said things were going to be okay, I heard the father in him, not the chief. Something was definitely wrong. As time passed, more and more people kept pressing into the Great Hall. Our group was forced to span out in order to make room. I managed to stick with Sophia, Imogen, Jonah, and their familiars in the corner, while Maddie, Drew, Lindsay, Miranda, Vanessa, Ezra, and Bren lined the wall on the other side with their magical creatures. There was muted conversation around the Great Hall as we waited for Head Dean Ulrich to make his announcement. Jonah leaned over Squeaks' back and stared at the carpet. Guys, he started. Was this our fault? No one answered right away. Imogen clung to Sassy, who was bundled up in her arms, and put her nose against the fox's ears. I don't know. We're supposed to stop the war and reverse the prophecy, Jonah said, and I don't even think we're close. It was dangerous talking out in the open like this, but nobody was paying attention to us. The conversation around the room gave us an opportunity to speak without being overheard. How could we have prevented this? I asked. I don't even think the prophecy saw this coming. Your dad did, Sophia pointed out. He made it seem like the elders were waiting for an opportunity like this. We were quiet for a moment. Then Imogen said, The fire piece was a promise of what would come true if we fail. The water piece was a warning of what would come before that happened. And the earth piece is a turning point we still can't figure out how to stop. So what's the air piece going to be? I asked. None of us had any ideas. I don't know, but we need to find it as soon as possible, Jonah said, before things get any worse. It was hard to imagine that happening. After everything we'd been through tonight, how could this society possibly get any worse? I'm the prophesied one, Sophia whispered. This is my responsibility. It's all of ours. We're in this together. Imogen piped up, and Sassy yipped in agreement. But we're running out of time. We have one more piece left to find. If we fail to stop whatever, it's warning. Nobody wanted to finish the thought she'd left out in the open. 
All of us wanted to stop the prophecy, but we had no clues on where to begin searching for the next piece or any idea on how to stop the events in motion. It's like we were completely helpless. It was quiet between us for a few minutes or so. This semester sucked, I said, abruptly and out loud. Jonah, Imogen, and Sophia all nodded solemnly. We'd all been through hell in the past four months. Breakups, court cases, lost friends. The list went on and on. We need to take a break, I suggested. Go on vacation. We can't go on vacation. The new semester is starting soon, Imogen said glumly. We don't have to be back until classes start on the 13th, I said. We deserve this. Let's take a little trip. Yeah, Jonah was slowly brightening. The Ho's Ho is taking its yearly voyage to Europe. It'd be fun to go. Liam, the court fine and paying our lawyer ate up all our money, Sophia reminded me. Y'all know I'm broke, Jonah said glumly. He didn't need to add his parents had taken it all. I'll pay for you guys. Imogen said. I've got more than enough left in my winnings. Liam's right. We need to step back from all this prophecy stuff and refocus. Maybe a bit of relaxation will help us find the next piece faster. The chatter died down in the great hall. People looked upward as Head Dean Ulrich, along with Elder Oleander and Dad, took the balcony above the hall. Madam Doya was with them, along with Bane. I didn't see any other elders among them. Ulrich raised his hands and the room quieted. May I have your attention, please, Ulrich said firmly. I would like to announce that the stolen familiars have all been located and will be returned to their rightful elementi within the coming days. A sigh of relief went up around the room. Ulrich grimaced, as if what was about to come next was nothing to celebrate. I ask for everyone's uh, cooperation, what the elders are about to say is very important. Ulrich turned toward Oleander and stepped aside. Oleander proceeded to the center of the balcony. His voice was commanding and firm as it rang out overhead. What happened tonight can never happen again, he began. We lost many of our own after justice was served to hideous traitors. Vile rebels who wished to overthrow the ways of our ancestors took to the streets with the intent to kill and destroy. Every person was silent as they stared up at Oleander with a mixture of reverence, respect, and fear. There are those within the tribe that seek to destroy our way of life, he went on. Our heritage has been threatened. Who we are as a people is at risk. It is essential that the majority of us give up our personal rights and privacy in order to secure our future. A growing horror began to overcome me as Oleander continued. Our tribal security must come first and foremost, before any individual. It is essential for our children and for our race. The law of our religion and of our ancestors must be followed without question, or we cannot survive. Fealty to our tribal government, to our elders, must come before all else, before our family and friends, before blood. It is the only way to preserve our survival. There can be no greater sacrifice for an elementi to make than to be a loyal patriot to his tribe. At a distance, Professor Bain stood behind Madame Doya, hands clasped and looking guilty. Had he regretted giving up his council position? He might have had a chance to stop this. There are those among us who are not like us, Oleander bellowed. We need to root out those who are threatening our nation. We are a superior race, but our livelihood is being threatened by certain individuals who pose a great threat to our people. They live beside us, pretending to be equals, yet they are surely the cause of so much division. We must unify against these dissenters and wipe them out. All around us there were shouts of agreement and rage. So many people were buying into this. They were angry at what had happened tonight and needed someone to blame. How can this be happening? Imogen whispered. Jonah had his hands on her shoulders and was gazing up at Oleander with a grim expression, as if he'd expected this day would come. 
Sophia looked up at me with a terrified gaze, and Essis shivered on my shoulder. I put my arm around her and tried to remain calm. That is why, Oleander said, the elders have collectively voted to replace the four tribes with a better way. My mouth dropped open in shock. They were abolishing the four tribes system? We'd lived this way for hundreds of years. Similar cries of surprise went up around the room. Oleander only raised his voice louder. No longer will you be known as Coigni, Toaqua, Nevita, or your pluma, Oleander shouted. From now on, our people will be sorted into two tribes, the Diforti, the strong, and the Bayami, the weak. Some gasps went up, but among them were notes of approval. For a long time, the tribe wanted to change the four tribes system to make it more fair and less divided, but this wasn't the right way. My insides curled at the use of the Hawkeye words to name the new tribes. A DeForti was practically a hero, someone chosen by the Great Spirit for greatness. A Bayami? A curse. Over the next coming months, every individual within Kinpago will be sorted into one of these two tribes, Oleander said. Those who exemplify traits of loyalty to the elders, of magical superiority of clean heritage and of an allegiance to our master race, shall be sorted into deforti, the authoritarian elementi, the true leaders of our people. His tone held a warning. No, worse than that, a promise. And those who show questioning toward the elders, those who refuse to put our tribe first, those who cling to artistic expression instead of scientific proof, those who prove themselves to be weaker, magically or otherwise, than the pure bloodline of our ancestors, will be sorted into Bayami. My stomach plummeted to the floor. The elders needed a scapegoat, a group of people to blame for all of the problems going on in our society. The Bayami would provide that easily. I didn't need to guess what house I'd be sorted into. I already knew. Intertribal relationships are now legal, Oleander began. There is no need to draw lines between elements. The only line that must be drawn is the one crucial to our world. There are only two sides now, those on the right side of history and those who are doomed to destroy our tribe if we allow them to do so. Oleander lifted his head high. He was working the crowd into a frenzy now, shouting into it like a wild man and raising his hands in an attempt to get the people to rise up. Let our tribe rise to defeat the great threat against us, for if we do not stamp out and eliminate this threat, the blood of our infants will run through the streets, and massacres such as we experience tonight will be held again, Oleander shouted. We must stick together and conquer over the weak. We must bind together and avoid destruction. The strong must survive. Many of the people and familiars in the great hall were roaring with triumph, shaking their fists and screaming victory. Some people were starting to slip away quietly. Others seemed nervous or disapproving, shaking their heads. But no one dared to raise a voice against Oleander's tyrannical speech. Dad stood behind Oleander and said nothing, looking every part the broken man. I hated what Oleander had done to my father, and on my life I vowed to make him pay for it. Oleander raised his hands to the ceiling. Let the great awakening of our tribe begin, and may we move forward as a nation of peace. Several task force members behind Oleander stepped forward and raised their hands. Air magic blasted from their palms and carried toward the top of the great hall. Sophia gasped in horror as the large banners hanging from the ceiling of the great hall depicting the four houses were torn in two and wrenched from their golden hangers. They crumpled onto the floor and over the crowd where they were ripped off of shoulders and trampled underfoot, forgotten and fallen. New banners unraveled from the golden hangers, in the place of the four houses hung long, black banners with the depiction of two arrows crossing, the arrows stitched into the dark fabric with red thread the color of blood. With the arrival of the banners, the crowd chanted the same word over and over, De Forti! De Forti! 
Those banners had already been made long before the riots began. Oleander had been plotting to usurp the elders, probably for months. He had planned this all along. The school bell then tolled, signaling the arrival of midnight and the passage of the new year. It was an ominous, harsh ringing that signified we were too late. The four of us thought we still had time. We figured there was a chance we could turn things around before the tribe dissolved into chaos. We'd screwed up. Nevida had already chosen their side. We had failed to stop the prophecy the Earth legend forewarned would come true. We didn't think war would come so soon. We were wrong. War was already here. This story will continue in The Air Omen, Academy of Magical Creatures, Book 4. A note from the authors. This book contains characters with the following medical conditions. The information included is meant to educate readers on disabilities featured within the Academy of Magical Creatures series. Depression. Depression is one of the most common mental disorders in America and affects over 264 million people worldwide. Symptoms may include fatigue, insomnia, and suicidal thoughts or actions. Suicide is the tenth leading cause of death in the United States and affects people across race, age, and gender identity. The Academy of Magical Creatures series is part of the Hidden Legends universe, a paranormal fantasy world created by authors Megan Linsky and Alicia Radis. Included in this universe are the following series. The University of Sorcery series, the College of Witchcraft series, and the Prison for Supernatural Offenders series, with more to come. Each Hidden Legends novel features magical romances with disabled characters fighting for a better world. You can find out more about the Hidden Legends universe by going to www.hiddenlegendsbooks.com. This has been The Earth Legend. Hidden Legends, Academy of Magical Creatures, Book 3. Written by Megan Linsky and Alicia Radis. Narrated by Jennifer Jill Araya and Graham Halstead. Copyright 2019 by Megan Linsky and Alicia Radis. Production copyright 2019 by Tantor Media, a division of Recorded Books. Recording copyright 2021 by Megan Linsky and Alicia Radis.